Beyond the Door by Philip K. Dick. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Lindsay Sabelsky. Beyond the Door by Philip K. Dick. That night at the dinner table, he brought it out and set it down beside her plate. Doris stared at it, her hand to her mouth. My God, what is it? She looked up at him, bright-eyed. Well, open it. Doris tore the ribbon and paper from the square package with her sharp nails, her bosom rising and falling. Larry stood watching her as she lifted the lid. He lit a cigarette and leaned against the wall. A cuckoo clock, Doris cried. A real old cuckoo clock like my mother had. She turned the clock over and over. Just like my mother had, when Pete was still alive. Her eyes sparkled with tears. It's made in Germany, Larry said. After a moment, he added, Carl got it for me wholesale. He knows some guy in the clock business, otherwise I wouldn't have... He stopped. Doris made a funny little sound. I mean, otherwise I wouldn't have been able to afford it. He scowled. What's the matter with you? You've got your clock, haven't you? Isn't that what you want? Doris sat holding onto the clock, her fingers pressed against the brown wood. Well, Larry said, what's the matter? He watched in amazement as she leaped up and ran from the room, still clutching the clock. He shook his head. Never satisfied. They're all that way. Never get enough. He sat down at the table and finished his meal. The cuckoo clock was not very large. It was handmade, however, and there were countless frets on it, little indentations and ornaments scored in the soft wood. Dor sat on the bed, drying her eyes and winding the clock. She set the hands by her wristwatch. Presently, she carefully moved the hands to two minutes of ten. She carried the clock over to the dresser and propped it up. Then she sat waiting, her hands twisted together in her lap, waiting for the cuckoo to come out, for the hour to strike. As she sat, she thought about Larry and what he had said. And what she had said, too, for that matter. Not that she could be blamed for any of it. After all, she couldn't keep listening to him forever without defending herself. You had to blow your own trumpet in the world. She touched her handkerchief to her eyes suddenly. Why did he have to say that, about getting it wholesale? Why did he have to spoil it all? If he felt that way, he needn't have got it in the first place. She clenched her fists. You're so mean, so damn mean. But she was glad of the little clock sitting there ticking to itself, with its funny grilled edges in the door. Inside the door was the cuckoo, waiting to come out. Was he listening, his head cocked on one side, listening to hear the clock strike so that he would know to come out? Did he sleep between hours? Well... She would soon see him. She could ask him. And she would show the clock to Bob. He would love it. Bob loved old things, even old stamps and buttons. He liked to go with her to the stores. Of course, it was a little awkward, but Larry had been staying at the office so much, and that helped. If only Larry didn't call up sometimes, too. There was a whir. The clock shuddered, and all at once the door opened. The cuckoo came out, sliding swiftly. He paused and looked around solemnly scrutinizing her, the room, the furniture. It was the first time he had seen her, she realized, smiling to herself in pleasure. She stood up, coming toward him shyly. Go on, she said. I'm waiting. The cuckoo opened his bill. He whirred and chirped, quickly, rhythmically. Then, after a moment of contemplation, he retired, and the door snapped shut. She was delighted. She clapped her hands and spun in a little circle. He was marvelous, perfect. And the way he had looked around, studying her, sizing her up, he liked her. She was certain of it. And she, of course, loved him at once, completely. He was just what she had hoped would come out of the little door. Doris went to the clock. She bent over the little door, her lips close to the wood. Do you hear me? She whispered. I think you're the most wonderful cuckoo in the world. She paused, embarrassed. I hope you'll like it here. Then she went downstairs again, slowly, her head high. Larry and the cuckoo clock really never got along well from the start. Dora said it was because he didn't wind it right, and it didn't like being only half wound all the time. Larry turned the job of winding over to her. The cuckoo came out every quarter hour and ran the spring down without remorse, and someone had to be ever after it, winding it up again. Dora did her best, but she forgot a good deal of the time. Then Larry would throw his newspaper down with an elaborate, weary motion and stand up. He would go into the dining room where the clock was mounted on the wall over the fireplace. He would take the clock down, and making sure that he had his thumb over the little door, he would wind it up. Why do you put your thumb over the door? Doris asked once. You're supposed to. 
She raised an eyebrow. Are you sure? I wonder if it isn't that you don't want him to come out while you're standing so close. Why not? Maybe you're afraid of him. Larry laughed. He put the clock back on the wall and gingerly removed his thumb. When Doris wasn't looking, he examined his thumb. There was still a trace of the nick cut out of the soft part of it. Who, or what, had pecked at him? One Saturday morning, when Larry was down at the office working over some important special accounts, Bob Chambers came to the front porch and rang the bell. Doris was taking a quick shower. She dried herself and slipped into her robe. When she opened the door, Bob stepped inside, grinning. Hi, he said, looking around. It's all right. Larry's at the office. Fine. Bob gazed at her slim legs below the hem of the robe. How nice you look today. She laughed. Be careful. Maybe I shouldn't let you in after all. They looked at one another, half amused, half frightened. Presently, Bob said, If you want, I'll... No, for God's sake. She caught hold of his sleeve. Just get out of the doorway so I can close it. Mrs. Peter's across the street, you know. She closed the door. And I want to show you something, she said. You haven't seen it. He was interested. An antique? Or what? She took his arm, leading him toward the dining room. You'll love it, Bobby. She stopped, wide-eyed. I hope you will. You must. You must love it. It means so much to me. He means so much. He? Bob frowned. Who is he? Doris laughed. You're jealous. Come on. A moment later, they stood before the clock, looking up at it. He'll come out in a few minutes. Wait until you see him. I know you two will get along just fine. What does Larry think of him? They don't like each other. Sometimes when Larry's here, he won't come out. Larry gets mad if he doesn't come out on time. He says... Says what? Doris looked down. He always says he's been robbed, even if he did get it wholesale. She brightened. But I know he won't come out because he doesn't like Larry. When I'm here alone, he comes right out for me, every fifteen minutes, even though he really only has to come out on the hour. She gazed up at the clock. He comes out for me because he wants to. We talk. I tell him things. Of course, I'd like to have him upstairs in my room, but it wouldn't be right. There was the sound of footsteps on the front porch. They looked at each other, horrified. Larry pushed the front door open, grunting. He set his briefcase down and took off his hat. Then he saw Bob for the first time. Chambers, I'll be damned. His eyes narrowed. <laughs> what are you doing here? He came into the dining room. Doris drew her robe about her helplessly, backing away. I... Bob began. That is, we... He broke off, glancing at Doris. Suddenly the clock began to whir. The cuckoo came rushing out, bursting into sound. Larry moved toward him. Shut that din thing off, he said. He raised his fist toward the clock. The cuckoo snapped into silence and retreated. The door closed. That's better. Larry studied Doris and Bob, standing mutely together. I came over to look at the clock, Bob said. Doris told me that it's a rare antique and that... Nuts. I bought it myself. Larry walked up to him. Get out of here. He turned to Doris. You too, and take that damn clock with you. He paused, rubbing his chin. No, leave the clock here. It's mine. I bought it and paid for it. In the weeks that followed after Doris left, Larry and the cuckoo clock got along even worse than before. For one thing, the cuckoo stayed inside most of the time, sometimes even at twelve o'clock when he should have been busiest. And if he did come out at all, he usually spoke only once or twice, never the correct number of times. And there was a sullen, uncooperative note in his voice, a jarring sound that made Larry uneasy and a little angry. But he kept the clock wound because the house was very still and quiet, and it got on his nerves not to hear someone running around talking and dropping things. And even the whirring of a clock sounded good to him. But he didn't like the cuckoo at all. And sometimes he spoke to him. Listen, he said late one night to the closed little door. I know you can hear me. I ought to give you back to the Germans, back to the Black Forest. He paced back and forth. I wonder what they're doing now, the two of them. That young punk with his books and his antiques. A man shouldn't be interested in antiques. That's for women. He set his jaw. Isn't that right? The clock said nothing. Larry walked up in front of it. Isn't that right? He demanded. Don't you have anything to say? He looked at the face of the clock. It was almost eleven, just a few seconds before the hour. All right, I'll wait until eleven. Then I want to hear what you have to say. You've been pretty quiet the last few weeks since she left. He grinned wryly. Maybe you don't like it here since she's gone. He scowled. 
Well, I paid for you, and you're coming out whether you'd like it or not. You hear me? Eleven o'clock came. Far off, at the end of town, the great tower clock boomed sleepily to itself. But the little door remained shut. Nothing moved. The minute hand passed on, and the cuckoo did not stir. He was someplace inside the clock, beyond the door, silent and remote. All right, if that's the way you feel, Larry murmured, his lips twisting. But it isn't fair. It's your job to come out. We all have to do things we don't like. He went unhappily into the kitchen and opened the great gleaming refrigerator. As he poured himself a drink, he thought about the clock. There was no doubt about it. The cuckoo should come out, Doris or no Doris. He had always liked her from the very start. They had got along well, the two of them. Probably he liked Bob, too. Probably he had seen enough of Bob to get to know him. They would be quite happy together, Bob and Doris and the cuckoo. Larry finished his drink. He opened the drawer at the sink and took out the hammer. He carried it carefully into the dining room. The clock was sticking gently to itself on the wall. Look, he said, waving the hammer. You know what I have here? You know what I'm going to do with it? I'm going to start on you, first. He smiled. Birds of a feather, that's what you are, the three of you. The room was silent. Are you coming out, or do I have to come in and get you? The clock whirred a little. I hear you in there. You've got a lot of talking to do, enough for the last three weeks. As I figure it, you owe me. The door opened. The cuckoo came out fast, straight at him. Larry was looking down, his brow wrinkled in thought. He glanced up, and the cuckoo caught him squarely in the eye. Down he went, hammer and chair and everything, hitting the floor with a tremendous crash. For a moment the cuckoo paused, its small body poised rigidly. Then it went back inside its house. The door snapped tight shut after it. The man lay on the floor, stretched out grotesquely, his head bent over to one side. Nothing moved or stirred. The room was completely silent, except, of course, for the ticking of the clock. I see, Doris said, her face tight. Bob put his arm around her, steadying her. Doctor, Bob said, can I ask you something? Of course, the doctor said. Is it very easy to break your neck, falling from so low a chair? It wasn't very far to fall. I wonder if it might not have been an accident. Is there any chance it might have been suicide? The doctor rubbed his jaw. I've never heard of anyone committing suicide that way. It was an accident. I'm positive. I don't mean suicide, Bob murmured under his breath, looking up at the clock on the wall. I meant something else. But no one heard him. End of Beyond the Door by Philip K. Dick by Richard O. Lewis. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Karina Schultz. A Bottle of Old Wine by Richard O. Lewis. Herbert Hyrell settled himself more comfortably in his easy chair, extended his short legs further toward the fireplace, and let his eyes travel cautiously in the general direction of his wife. She was in her chair as usual, her long legs curled up beneath her, the upper half of her face hidden in the bulk of her personalized three-dimensional televis. The televis, of a stereoscopic nature, seemingly brought the performers with all their tinsel and color directly into the room of the watcher. Hyrel had no way of seeing into the plastic affair she wore, but he guessed from the expression on the lower half of her face that she was watching one of the newer black market sex operas. In any event, there would be no sound, movement, or sign of life from her for the next three hours. To break the thread of the play for even a moment would ruin all the previous emotional build-up. There had been a time when he hated her for those long and silent evenings, lonely hours during which he was completely ignored. It was different now, however, for those hours furnished him with time for an escape of his own. His lips curled into a tight smile, and his right hand fondled the unobtrusive switch beneath his trouser leg. He did not press the switch. He would wait a few minutes longer. But it was comforting to know that it was there, exhilarating to know that he could escape for a few hours by a mere flick of his finger. He let his eyes stray to the dim light of the artificial flames in the fireplace. His hate for her was not bounded merely by those lonely hours she had forced upon him. No, it was far more encompassing. 
He hated her with a deep, burning savagery that was deadly in its passion. He hated her for her money, the money she kept securely from him. He hated her for the paltry allowance she doled out to him, as if he were an irresponsible child. It was as if she were constantly reminding him in every glance and gesture, I made a bad bargain when I married you. You wanted me, my money, everything, and had nothing to give in return except your own doltish self. You set a trap for me, baited with lies and a false front. Now you are caught in your own trap, and will remain there like a mouse to eat from my hand, whatever crumbs I stoop to give you. But some day his hate would be appeased. Yes, some day soon he would kill her. He shot a sideways glance at her, wondering if by chance she suspected. She hadn't moved. Her lips were pouted into a half-smile. The sex opera had probably reached one of its more pleasurable moments. Hyrule let his eyes shift back to the fireplace again. Yes, he would kill her. Then he would claim a rightful share of her money, be rid of her debasing dominance. He let the thought run around through his head, savoring it with mental taste buds. He would not kill her tonight. No, nor the next night. He would wait. Wait until he had sucked the last measure of pleasure from the thought. It was like having a bottle of rare old wine on a shelf, where it could be viewed daily. It was like being able to pause again and again before the bottle, hold it up to the light, and say to it, Some day, when my desire for you has reached the ultimate, I shall unstopper you quietly and sip you slowly to the last soul-satisfying drop. As long as the bottle remained there upon the shelf, it was symbolic of that pleasurable moment. He snapped out of his reverie and realized he had been wasting precious moments. There would be time enough tomorrow for gloating. Tonight there were other things to do, pleasurable things. He remembered the girl he had met the night before and smiled smugly. Perhaps she would be awaiting him even now. If not, there would be another one. He settled himself deeper into the chair, glanced once more at his wife, then let his head lean comfortably back against the chair's headrest. His hand upon his thigh felt the thin mesh that cloaked his body beneath his clothing like a sheer stocking. His fingers went again to the tiny switch. Again he hesitated. Herbert Hyro knew no more about the teleporter suit he wore than he did about the radio in the corner, the TV set against the wall, or the personalized televis his wife was wearing. You pressed one of the buttons on the radio, music came out. You pressed a button and clicked a dial on the TV, music and pictures came out. You pressed a button and made an adjustment on the televis. Three-dimensional, emotion-colored pictures leaped into the room. You pressed a tiny switch on the teleporter suit. You were whisked away to a receiving set you had previously set up in secret. He knew that the music and the images of the performers on the TV and televis were brought to his room by some form of electrical impulse or wave, while the actual musicians and performers remained in the studio. He knew that when he pressed the switch on his thigh, something within him, his ectoplasm, higher self, the thing spirits use for materialization, whatever its real name, streamed out of him along an invisible channel, leaving his body behind in the chair in a conscious but dreamlike state. His other self materialized in a small cabin in a hidden nook between a highway and a river where he had installed the receiving set a month ago. He thought once more of the girl who might be waiting for him, smiled, and pressed the switch. The dank air of the cabin was chill to Herbert Hyrule's naked flesh. He fumbled through the darkness for the clothing he kept there, found his shorts and trousers, got hurriedly into them, then flicked on a pocket lighter and ignited a stub of candle upon the table. By the wavering light he finished dressing in the black satin clothing, the white shirt, the flowing necktie, and tam. He invoiced the contents of his billfold, not much, and his monthly pittance was still two weeks away. He had skimped for six months to salvage enough money from his allowance to make a down payment on the teleporter suit. Since then, his expenses, monthly payments for the suit, cabin rent, costly liquor, had forced him to place his nights of escape on strict ration. He could not go on this way, he realized. Not now. Not since he had met the girl. He had to have more money. Perhaps he could not afford the luxury of leaving the wine bottle longer upon the shelf. Riverside Club, where Hyrule arrived by bus and a hundred yards of walking, was exclusive. It catered to a clientele that had but three things in common—money, a desire for utter self-abandonment, 
and a sales slip indicating ownership of a teleporter unit. The club was of necessity expensive, for self-teleportation was strictly illegal, and police protection came high. Herbert Hyrell adjusted his white, silken mask carefully at the door, and shoved his sales slip through a small aperture, where it was thoroughly scanned by unseen eyes. A buzzer sounded an instant later, the lock on the door clicked, and Hyrell pushed through into the exhilarating warmth of music and laughter. The main room was large. Hidden lights along the walls sent slow beams of red, blue, vermilion, green, yellow, and pink trailing across the domed ceiling in a heterogeneous pattern. The colored beams mingled, diffused, spread, were caught up by mirrors of various tints, which diffused and mingled the lights once more, until the whole effect was an ever-changing panorama of softly melting shades. The gay and bizarre costumes of the masked revelers on the dance floor and at the tables, unearthly in themselves, were made even more so by the altering light. Music flooded the room from unseen sources. Laughter, hysterical, drunken, filled with utter abandonment, came from the dance floor, the tables, and the private booths and rooms hidden cleverly within the walls. Hyrel pushed himself to an unoccupied table, sat down, and ordered a bottle of cheap whiskey. He would have preferred champagne, but his depleted finances forbade the more discriminate taste. When his order arrived, he poured a glass tumbler half full, and consumed it eagerly while his eyes scanned the room, in search of the girl. He couldn't see her in the dim swirl of color. Had she arrived? Perhaps she was wearing a different costume than she had the night before. If so, recognition might prove difficult. He poured himself another drink, promising himself he would go in search of her when the liquor began to take effect. A woman clad in the revealing garb of a Persian dancer threw an arm about him from behind and kissed him on the cheek through the veil which covered the lower part of her face. "'Hi, honey,' she giggled into his ear. "'Having a time?' He reached for the white arm to pull her to him, but she eluded his grasp and reeled away into the waiting arms of a tall Toreador. Hyrel gulped his whiskey and watched her nestle into the arms of her partner and began with him a sinuous, suggestive dance. The whiskey had begun its warming effect, and he laughed. This was the land of the lotus eaters, the sanctuary of the escapists, the haven of all who wished to cast off their shell of inhibition and become the thing they dreamed themselves to be. Here one could be among his own kind, an actor upon a gay stage, a gaudy butterfly, metamorphosed from the slug, a knight of old. The Persian dancing girl was probably the wife of a boorish oaf, whose idea of romance was spending an evening telling his wife how he came to be a successful bank president. But she had found her means of escape. Perhaps she had pleaded a sick headache and had retired to her room, and there upon the bed now reposed her shell of reality, while her inner self, the shadowy one, completely materialized, became an exotic thing from the East in this never-never land. The man, the Toreador, had probably closeted himself within his library, with a set of account books, and had left strict orders not to be disturbed, until he had finished with them. Both would have terrific hangovers in the morning. But that, of course, would be fully compensated for by the memories of the evening. Hyrule chuckled. The situation struck him as being funny. The shadowy self got drunk and had a good time, and the outer husk suffered the hangover in the morning. Strange, strange how a device such as the teleporter suit could cause the shadow of each bodily cell to leave the body, materialize, and become a reality in its own right. And yet... He looked at the heel of his left hand. There was a long, irregular scar there. It was the result of a cut he had received nearly three weeks ago when he had fallen over this very table and had rammed his hand into a sliver of broken champagne glass. Later that evening, upon re-teleporting back home, the pain of the cut had remained in his hand, but there was no sign of the cut itself on the hand of his outer self. The scar was peculiar to the shadowy body only. There was something about the shadowy body that carried the hurts to the outer body, but not the scars. Sudden laughter broke out near him, and he turned quickly in that direction. A group of gaily costumed revelers was standing in a semicircle about a small mound of clothing upon the floor. It was the costume of the Toreador. Hiro laughed, too. It had happened many times before. A costume suddenly left empty as its owner, due to a threat of discovery at home, had had to press the switch in haste to bring his shadowy self and complete consciousness back to his outer self in a hurry. A waiter picked up the clothing. 
he would put it safely away so that the owner could claim it upon his next visit to the club. Another waiter placed a fresh bottle of whiskey on the table before Hyrule, and Hyrule paid him for it. The whiskey, reaching his head now in surges of warm cheerfulness, was filling him with abandonment, courage, and a desire for merriment. He pushed himself up from the table, joined the merry throng, threw his arm about the Persian dancer, drew her close. They began dancing slowly to the throbbing rhythm, dancing and holding on to each other tightly. Hyrel could feel her hot breath through her veil upon his neck, adding to the headiness of the liquor. His feeling of depression and inferiority flowed suddenly from him. Once again he was the all-conquering male. His arm trembled as it drew her still closer to him, and he began dancing directly and purposefully toward the shadows of a clump of artificial palms near one corner of the room. There was an exit to the garden behind the palms. Halfway there they passed a secluded booth from which protruded a long leg clad in black mesh stocking. Hyrule paused as he recognized that part of the costume. It was she, the girl, the one he had met so briefly the night before. His arm slid away from the Persian dancer, took hold of the mesh-clad leg, and pulled. A female form followed the leg from the booth and fell into his arms. He held her tightly, kissed her white neck, let her perfume send his thoughts reeling. "'Been looking for me, honey?' she whispered, her voice deep and throaty. "'You know it,' he began whisking her away toward the palms. The Persian girl was pulled into the booth. Yes, she was wearing the same costume she had worn the night before, that of a can-can dancer of the nineties. The mesh hose that encased her shapely legs were held up by flowered supporters in such a manner as to leave four inches of white leg exposed between hose-top and lacy panties. Her skirt, frilled to suggest innumerable petticoats, fell away at each hip, leaving the front open to expose the full length of legs. She wore a wig of platinum hair encrusted with jewels that sparkled in the lights. Her jewel-studded mask was as white as her hair and covered the upper half of her face, except for the large almond slits for her eyes. A white purse, jewel-crusted, dangled from one arm. He stopped once before reaching the palms, drew her closer, kissed her long and ardently. Then he began pulling her on again. She drew back when they reached the shelter of the fronds. "'Champagne first, she whispered huskily into his ear. His heart sank. He had very little money left. Well, it might buy a cheap brand. She sipped her champagne slowly and provocatively across the table from him. Her eyes sparkled behind the almond slits of her mask, caught the color changes and cast them back. She was wearing contact lenses of a garish green. He wished she would hurry with her drink. He had horrible visions of his wife at home taking off her televis and coming to his chair. He would then have to press the switch that would jerk his shadowy self back along its invisible connecting cord jerk him back, and leave but a small mound of clothes upon the chair at the table. Deep depression laid hold of him. He would not be able to see her after tonight, until he received his monthly dole two weeks hence. She wouldn't wait that long. Someone else would have her. Unless— Yes, he knew now that he was going to kill his wife, as soon as the opportunity presented itself. It would be a simple matter. With the aid of the teleporter suit, he could establish an iron-clad alibi— he took a long drink of whiskey and looked at the dancers about him. Sight of their gay costumes heightened his depression. He was wearing a cheap suit of satin, all he could afford, but some day soon he would show them. Sometime soon he would be dressed as gaily. Something troubling you, honey? His gaze shot back to her and she blurred slightly before his eyes. No, nothing at all. He summoned a sickly smile and clutched her hand in his. Come on, let's dance. He drew her from the chair and into his arms. She melted toward him as if desiring to become a part of him. A tremor of excitement surged through him and threatened to turn his knees into quivering jelly. He could not make his feet conform to the flooding rhythm of the music. He half stumbled, half pushed her along past the booths. In the shelter of the palms, he drew her savagely to him. Let's, let's go outside. His voice was little more than a croak. But, honey... She pushed herself away, her low voice maddening him. Don't you have a private room? A girl doesn't like to be taken outside. Her words bit into his brain like the blade of a hot knife. No, he didn't have a private room at the club like the others. A private room for his teleporter receiver, 
a private room where he could take a willing guest. No, he couldn't afford it. No, no, no. His lot was a cheap suit of satin, cheap whiskey, cheap champagne, a cheap shack by the river. An inarticulate cry escaped his twisted lips. He clutched her roughly to him and dragged her through the door and into the moonlight, whiskey and anger lending him brutal strength. He pulled her through the deserted garden. All the others had private rooms. He pulled her to the far end, behind a clump of squatty firs. His hands clawed at her. He tried to smother her mouth with kisses. She eluded him deftly. But, honey, her voice had gone deeper into her throat, I just want to be sure about things. If you can't afford one of the private rooms, if you can't afford to show me a good time, if you can't come here real often. The whiskey pounded and throbbed at his brain like blows from an unseen club. His ego curled and twisted within him like a headless serpent. I'll have money, he shouted, struggling to hold her. I'll have plenty of money after tonight. Then we'll wait, she said. We'll wait until tomorrow night. No, he screamed. You don't believe me. You're like the others. You think I'm no good. But I'll show you. I'll show all of you. She had gone coldly rigid in his arms, unyielding. Madness added to the pounding in his brain. Tears welled into his eyes. I'll show you. I'll kill her. Then I'll have money. The hands clutching her shoulders shook her drunkenly. You wait here. I'll go home and kill her now. Then I'll be back. Silly boy. Her low laughter rang hollowly in his ears. And just who is it you are going to kill? My wife, he cried. My wife, I'll... A sudden sobering thought struck him. He was talking too much. And he wasn't making sense. He shouldn't be telling her this. Anyway, he couldn't get the money tonight even if he did kill his wife. And so you are going to kill your wife? He blinked the tears from his eyes. His chest was heaving, his heart pounding. He looked at her shimmering form. Yes, he whispered. Her eyes glinted strangely in the light of the moon. Her handbag glinted as she opened it, and something she took from it glittered coldly in her hand. Fool! The first shot tore squarely through his heart. And while he stood staring at her, mouth agape, a second shot burned its way through his bewildered brain. Mrs. Herbert Hyrel removed the televis from her head and laid it carefully aside. She uncoiled her long legs from beneath her, walked to her husband's chair, and stood for a long moment looking down at him, her lips drawn back in contempt. Then she bent over him and reached down his thigh until her fingers contacted the small switch. Seconds later a slight tremor shook Hyrel's body. His eyes snapped open, air escaped his lungs, his lower jaw sagged inanely and his head lolled to one side. She stood a moment longer, watching his eyes become glazed and sightless. Then she walked to the telephone. Police, she said. This is Mrs. Herbert Hyrel. Something horrible has happened to my husband. Please come over immediately. Bring a doctor. She hung up, went to her bathroom, stripped off her clothing, and slid carefully out of her teleporter suit. This she folded neatly and tucked away into the false back of the medicine cabinet. She found a fresh pair of blue plastifur pajamas and got into them. She was just arriving back into the living room, tying the cord of her dressing gown about her slim waist, when she heard the sound of the police siren out front. End of A Bottle of Old Wine by Richard O. Lewis The Cuckoo Clock by Wesley Barefoot. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Frank Malanga. The Cuckoo Clock by Wesley Barefoot. The child's scream and the screech of rubber on concrete knifed through two seconds of time before snapping like a celery stalk of sound into aching silence. The silence of limbo called into being for the space of a slow heartbeat. Then the thud of running feet, the rising hubbub of many voices. Give her air. Keep back. Don't try to move her. 
Somebody call an ambulance. Yeah, and somebody call a cop, too. I couldn't help it. It was the driver of the ramshackle Chevy. She fell off the curb right in front of me. Honest to God, it wasn't my fault. Got to report these things right away, said the gray-haired man beside him. No cause to worry if you ain't to blame. Probably no brakes, said a heavily accented voice, and another spoke as if on cue. Probably no insurance, either. Let me through. Oh, please. The woman's voice was on the edge of hysteria. She came through the crowd like an automaton, not seeing the people she shoved and elbowed aside. D.O.A., said the woman heavily. Her face was no longer twisted with shock, and she was almost pretty again. D.O.A., dead on arrival, it means. Oh, Jim, I never knew they said that. Suddenly there were tears in her blue eyes. There had been many tears now. Take it easy, Jean, honey. Jim Blair hoisted his lank six feet out of the old rocker and crossed the room, running a nervous hand through his corn shuck hair. She's only thirty, he thought, and I'm three years older. That's awfully young to have bred three kids and lost them. He took her in his arms. I know how tough it is. It's bad enough for me and probably worse for you. But at least we're sure they'll never be bomb fodder. And we still have Joanna. She twisted away from him, her voice suddenly bitter. Don't give me that Pollyanna stuff, Jim. Goody, goody, only a broken leg. It might have been your back. There's no use trying to whitewash it. Our kids, our own kids, all gone, dead. She began to sob. I wish I were, too. Jean. Jean, I don't care. I mean it. Everything bad has happened since Joanna came to live with us. Darling, you can't blame the child for a series of accidents. I know. She raised her tear-stained face. But after all, Michael drowned. Then Steve falling off the water tower. Now it's Marion. Her fingers gripped his arm tightly. Jim, each of them was playing alone with Joanna when it happened. Accidents, just accidents, he said. It wasn't like Jean, this talk. Almost, his mind shied away from the word and then circled back. Almost paranoid. But Jean was stable, rational, always had been. Still, maybe a little chat with Dr. Holland would be a good idea. Breakdowns do happen. They both turned at the slamming of the screen door. Then came the patter of childish feet on the kitchen linoleum, and Joanna burst into the room. Mommy, I want to play with Marion. Why can't I play with Marion? Jean put her arm around the girl's thin shoulder. Darling, you won't be able to play with Marion for quite a while. You mustn't worry about it now. Mommy, she looked just like she was asleep. Then they came and took her away. Her lips trembled. I'm frightened, Mommy. Jim looked down at the dark eyes, misted now, the straight brown hair and the little snub nose with its dusting of freckles. She's all we have left, poor kid, and not even ours, really. Helen's baby. He looked up as the battered cuckoo clock on the mantel clicked warningly. Time for little girls to be in bed, Joanna. Run along now like a good girl, and get washed. Even as he spoke, the miniature doors flew open, and the caricature of a bird popped out, shrilly announcing the hour. It cuckooed eight times, then bounced back inside. Joanna watched entranced. Bedtime, darling, said Jean gently. School tomorrow, remember. And don't forget to brush your teeth. I won't. Good night, Mommy. Good night, Daddy. She turned up her face to be kissed, smiled at them, and was gone. They listened to her footsteps on the stairs. Jim, I'm sorry about the things I said. Jean's voice was hesitant, a little ashamed. It is hard, though. You know it is. Jim, aren't you listening? After all, you don't have to watch the clock now. Her smile was as labored as the joke. He smiled back. I think I'll take a walk, honey. Some fresh air would do me good. 
Jim, don't go. I'd rather not be alone just now. Well, he looked at her, keeping his expression blank. All right, dear. How about some coffee? I could stand another cup. And he thought, tomorrow I'll go. I'll talk to Holland tomorrow. Let me get this straight, Jim. Holland's pudgy face was sober, his eyes serious. You started out by thinking Jean was showing paranoid tendencies, and offhand I'm inclined to agree with you. Overnight you changed your mind and began thinking that maybe, just maybe, she might be right? Honestly, don't you suspect your own reasons for such a quick switch? Sure I do, Bob, Blair said worriedly. Do you think I haven't beaten out my brains over it? I know the idea is monstrous. But just suppose there was a branch of humanity, if you could call it human, living off us unsuspected. A branch that knows how to eliminate competition, almost by instinct. Now hold on a minute, Jim. You've taken Jean's reaction to this last death, plus a random association with a cuckoo clock, and here you are with a perfectly wild hypothesis. You've always been rational and analytical, old man. Surely you can realize that a perfectly normal urge to rationalize Jean's conclusions is making you concur with them against your better judgment. Bob, I'm not through, Jim. Just consider how fantastic the whole idea is. Because of a series of accidents, you can't accuse a child of planned murder. Nor can you further hypothesize that all orphans are changelings, imbued with an instinct to polish off their foster siblings. Not all orphans, Bob. Not planned murder, either. Take it easy. Just some of them. A few of them. Different. Growing up, placing their young with well-to-do families somehow, and then dropping unobtrusively out of the picture. And the young growing up, and always the natural children dying off in one way or another. The changeling inherits, and the process is repeated step by step. Can you say it's impossible? Do you know it's impossible? I wouldn't say impossible, Jim, but I would say that your thesis has a remarkably low index of probability. Why don't others suspect besides you? Jim spread his hands hopelessly. I don't know. Maybe they do. Maybe these creatures, if they do exist, have some means of protection we don't know about. You need more than maybes, Jim. What about Joanna Simmons's mother? According to your theory, she should have been well off, was she? No, she wasn't, Jim admitted reluctantly. She came here and took a job with my outfit. Said she was divorced and had lived in New York. Then she quit to take a position in California, and we agreed to board Joanna until she got settled. Warrenburg was the town. She was killed there, quite horribly, in a terrible auto accident. Have you any reason for suspecting skullduggery? Honestly, Jim? Or for labeling her one of your human, uh, cuckoos? Only my hunch. We had a newspaper clipping and a letter from the coroner. We even sent the money for her funeral. But those things could be faked, Bob. Give me some evidence that they were faked, and I'll be happy to reinspect your views. Holland levered his avoir de poids out of his chair. In the meantime, relax. Take a trip if you can. Try not to worry. Jim grinned humorously. Mustn't let myself get excited, eh? Okay, Bob. But if I get hold of any evidence that I think you might accept, I'll be back. The last laugh and all that. Pending developments, you take it easy, too. Don't let yourself get overworked. Stay out of the sun. So long now. So long, Jim. It was cool in the Warrenburg City Hall, though outside the streets were sizzling. Sorry, Mr. Blair, said the stout, motherly woman with the horn-rimmed glasses. We've no record of a Helen Simmons. Nothing whatever. She closed the file with resolute finality. Jim stared at her. Are you sure? There must be something. Mightn't there be a special file for accident cases? 
She was here in Warrenburg. She died here. The woman thinned her lips, shook her head. If we had any information, it'd be right where I looked. There isn't a thing. Have you tried her last address? Maybe they could tell you something. We can't. I'll try that next. Thanks a lot. Sorry we couldn't help you. He went out slowly. A-72 Maple was a rambling frame house nosing on a wide, flower-bordered lot. There was nothing sleepy about the diminutive woman who opened the door to Jim's knock. Snapping black eyes peered at him from a maze of wrinkles. A veined hand moved swiftly to smooth down the white hair that framed her face. Looking for someone, young man? Just information, Mrs. Collins, and it's Miss. Don't give out information about guests. You a bill collector? No, Miss Collins. As a matter of fact, I'm trying to check up on an old friend I lost track of. Helen Simmons. She lived at this address for a while. Sure did. Well, come on in. Mind you, I don't usually do this, Mr. Blair. Without any fanfare, a bill changed hands. Mr. Blair, while I can't tell you much, try that green chair for size. What do you want to know? Jim studied the toe of his right shoe. His eyes were veiled. I heard she was hurt and hard up, and I was worried. My wife and I were friends of hers back east. Hurt? Hard up? Huh. Not likely. Spending all her time driving that English car around. Taking trips. I'm not saying she didn't mind her manners, though. Did she have any close friends? She was chummy with Edith Walton, the girl that works for Doc Mendel. He's county coroner in his spare time. No men. Didn't fool around at all. I'd have known. Behind Jim's stony eyes, the pattern took clearer form, as if a mosaic approached completion. A mosaic of carefully planned events that totaled horror. He shivered as the outlines of his hunch filled in. Helen, what creatures were these? Helen, not dead, not poor, carefully planting ostensible proof of her death and going on to a new role, a new life, in London or Paris or Rome, a free, untrammeled life, and her child, if child was the word, in his home, repeating the pattern. Eliminating competition, as her mother undoubtedly had done. The competition. His and Jean's children. Changeling. Changeling. No, not that. Incubus. He shivered again. Rabbits on your grave, Mr. Blair? He looked up slowly. Sorry, I was just wondering. Did Miss Simmons have a job while she was here? No, she didn't. One thing she did do was rent a place. Used to be Bland's Hardware. Paid a month's rent, too. Said some friends of hers were planning to open a mortuary. Seemed like a funny way for people to do business, but then, no affair of mine. Funny? No, not funny at all, but icily, eerily logical. There had to be an undertaking parlor where he could send the funeral expenses. He wondered if Helen had laughed when she opened the letter. Everyone his or her own undertaker, and the carefully cultivated friend in the coroner's office, for stationary. He got to his feet. Thanks a lot, Miss Collins. You've been a great deal of help. He almost smiled as he asked. I don't suppose she left the forwarding address. The old head shook decisively. Not a thing. Just packed and left one Monday morning. All the loose ends tied up tight on a Monday morning. Nothing to cause suspicion. Nothing to worry about. Only a woman's almost paranoid hysteria and a glance at a clock. Not very much to unmask Incubus. But what could he do? What could he do? Start talking and land at an institution? Well, there was one thing. Thanks again, Miss Collins. He went out. Swanson didn't look like the general conception of a small-town newspaper man. 
One knew instinctively that his beard wouldn't have been tobacco-stained even if he'd cared to grow one. And he didn't have a bottle of bourbon in the file marked miscellaneous, or if he did, he didn't bring it out. That never came from my paper, he said precisely. He handed the clipping back to Jim. We don't use that type, for one thing. For another, Miss Simmons, so far as I know, wasn't killed here or anywhere else. You knew her? I knew of her. I never met her. What about this report of her death? Swanson shrugged, tented, manicured fingers. It's a hoax. Any job printing shop with a linotype could do it. In all likelihood, it was someplace in San Francisco. That's closest. It would be very difficult to check. His curiosity was showing. I see. Well, thanks for your time and trouble, Mr. Swanson. Not at all. Sorry I couldn't be of more help. One thing to do. One thing that must be done. Motors over the mountains, and riding with them, the numb resolve. Motors over the salt pans, the wheat lands, the corn belt. The stewardess stops again. Coffee, sir? A sandwich, perhaps? I beg your... Oh, no, no thanks. She watches him covertly, uneasily, longing for the end of the run. Motors in the night. And the dull determination growing, strengthening. The airport. Baggage. The ancient taxi with the piston slap, and at last the dark familiar street. Jim, you're back. Oh, Jim, darling. Next time they send you west, I'm going too. I am. Okay, Jean, sure, why not? What's the matter, dear? Oh, you're tired, of course. I should have known. Sit down, Jim, let me get you a drink. In a minute, Jean. Do it now. 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 Where's Joanna? She's in bed, hours ago. Jim has something? Nothing, dear. I just want to look in on her. And freshen up a bit, of course. Jim? He smoothed away the worried frown with his forefinger. In a minute, dear. She smiled uncertainly. Hurry back, Jim. The stairs unwind irrevocably, slow motion in a nightmare. The bedroom door opens, the hall light dim on the bed and a child's face. Incubus in the half-dark. For a moment, Jim remembered wondering somewhere, sometime, what strange powers of protection might be implicit in such a creature. As the thought came into his mind, Joanna stirred. She opened her eyes and looked at him. He took one step toward the bed. The little girl eyes, over their dusting of freckles, slitted. Then they opened wide, became two glowing golden lakes that grew and grew. There was the feeling of a great soundless explosion in his mind. Waves of cool burning in his brain, churning and bubbling in every unknown corner, every cranny. Here and there a cell or a group of cells blanked out, the complex molecules reverting becoming new again, ready for fresh punch marks. Synapses shorted with soundless cold fire and waited in timeless stasis for rechanneling. The waves frothed, became ripples, were gone. He stood unmoving. What was it he was supposed to do? Let's see, tuck Joanna's blanket around her. But she was covered up snugly, sleeping soundly too, and for a few seconds he'd thought she was awake. And Jean was waiting downstairs, Jean and a cool drink. Oh, yes, stop in the bathroom. The stairs wind up again. It's good to be with one's family, relaxed in the well-known chair. Not a worry in the world. He sat there, his mind at ease, not caring much about anything. He didn't even look up when the clock on the mantel whirred and the ridiculous bird popped out of its nest to herald a new day. End of The Cuckoo Clock by Wesley Barefoot Recording by Frank Malanga, 
Mobile, Alabama. Right, 1973 by Mac Reynolds. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Winston Tharp. Dogfight, 1973, by Mac Reynolds. Flying at 1600 MPH, you act with split-second timing after you sight the enemy, and you're allowed only one mistake, your last. My radar picked him up when he was about 500 miles to my north-northeast and about 45 miles above me. I switched the velocity calculator on him as fast as I could reach it. The enemy ship was doing 16, possibly even 16 and a half. I took the chance that it was most likely an Ivar interceptor at that speed and punched out a temporary evasion pattern with my right hand, while with my left I snapped an Ivar K-12 card into my calculator along with his estimated speed, altitude, and distance. It wasn't much to go on as yet, but he couldn't have much more on me, if as much. Inwardly, I congratulated myself on the quick identification I'd managed. At least he was alone. That was something. My nearest squadron mate was a good minute and a half away. It might as well have been a century. Now this is what is always hard to get over to a civilian, the time element. Understand it will take me a while to tell this, but it all took less than sixty seconds to happen. He had guessed my evasion pattern already, either guessed it or had some new calculator that was far and beyond anything our techs were turning out. I could tell he'd anticipated me by the bong sonic roll he slipped into. I quickly punched up a new pattern based on the little material I had in the calculator. At least I'd caught the roll. I punched that up hurriedly, slipped it into the IBM, guessed that his next probability was a pass, took chance on that and punched it in. I was wrong there. He didn't take his opportunity for a front-on pass. He was either newly out of their academy or insultingly confident. My lips felt tight as I canceled the frontal pass card, punched up two more to take its place. The base supervisor cut in on the phone. It looks like old Dimitri himself, Jerry, and he's flying one of the new K-12A models. Go get him, boy. I felt like snapping back. He knew better than to break in on me at a time like this. I opened my mouth and shut it again. Did he say K-12A? Did he say K-12A? I squinted at the visor screen, the high tail, the canopy, the oddly shaped wing tanks. I'd gone off on the identification. I slapped another evasion pattern into the controls, a standard set. I had no time to punch up an improvisation. But he was on me like a wasp. I rejected it, threw in another set, reject, another. Even as I worked, I kicked the release on my own calculator, dumped it all, selected like a flash an Ivar K-12A card and what other estimations I could make while my mind was busy with a full-time job of evasion. My hands were still making the motions, my fingers were flicking here, there, my feet touching here, there, but my heart wasn't in it. He already had such an advantage that all I could do was to keep him on my visor screen. He was to the left, to the right. I got him for a full quarter second in the wires, but the auto gunner was too far behind, much too far. His own guns flicked red. I punched half a dozen buttons, slapped levers, tried to scoop for home. To the left of my cubicle, two lights went yellowish, and at the same time my visor screen went dead. I was blind. I sat back in my chair, helpless. The speed indicator wavered, went slowly, deliberately to zero. The altimeter died, the fuel gauge. Finally, even the dozen or so trouble indicators here, there, everywhere about the craft. Fifteen million dollars worth of warcraft was being shot into wreckage. I sat there for a long, long minute and took it. Then I got to my feet and wearily opened the door of my cubicle. Sergeant Walters and the rest of the maintenance crew were standing there. They could read in my face what had happened. The sergeant began, Captain, I... I grunted at him. Never mind, sergeant. It had nothing to do with the ship's condition. I turned to head for the operations office. Bill Dixon strolled over from the direction of his own cubicle. Somebody said you just had a scramble with old Dimitri himself. I don't know, I said. I don't know if it was him or not. Maybe some of you guys can tell a man's flying, but I can't. He grinned at me. Shut you down, eh? I didn't answer. He said, what happened? I thought it was an Ivar K-12 and put that card in my calculator. Turned out it was one of those new models, K-12A. That was enough, of course. Bill grinned at me again. That's two this week. That flak got you near that bridge, and now you get... Shut up, I told him. 
He counted up on his fingers elaborately. The way I figure it, you lose one more ship, and you're an enemy ace. He was irrepressible. Damn it, I said. Will you cut it out? I've got enough to worry about without you working me over. This means I'll have to spend another half an hour in operations going over the fight. And that means I'll be late for dinner again. And you know Molly. Bill sobered. Gee, he said. I'm sorry. War is hell, isn't it? End of Dogfight, 1973, by Mac Reynolds Men Bearing Gifts by Frederick Brown This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Michael Navratil Earthmen Bearing Gifts by Frederick Brown Dar Ree sat alone in his room, meditating. From outside the door, he caught a thought wave equivalent to a knock, and glancing at the door, he willed it to slide open. It opened. Enter, my friend, he said. He could have projected the idea telepathically, but with only two persons present, speech was more polite. Ejon Key entered. You are up late tonight, my leader, he said. Yes, Key. Within an hour the Earth rocket is due to land, and I wish to see it. Yes, I know it will land a thousand miles away, if their calculations are correct, beyond the horizon. But if it lands even twice that far, the flash of the atomic explosion should be visible. And I have waited long for first contact. For even though no Earthman will be on that rocket, it will still be first contact. For them. Of course, our telepath teams have been reading their thoughts for many centuries. But this will be the first physical contact between Mars and Earth. Key made himself comfortable on one of the low chairs. True, he said. I have not followed recent reports too closely, though. Why are they using an atomic warhead? I know they suppose our planet is uninhabited, but still. They will watch the flash through their lunar telescopes and get a, what do they call it? A spectroscopic analysis. That will tell them more than they know now, or think they know. Much of it is erroneous. About the atmosphere of our planet and the composition of its surface. It is, call it a sighting shot, Key. They'll be here in person within a few oppositions, and then... Mars was holding out, waiting for Earth to come. What was left of Mars, that is. This one small city of about 900 beings. The civilization of Mars was older than that of Earth, but it was a dying one. This is what remained of it. One city, 900 people. They were waiting for Earth to make contact, for a selfish reason, and for an unselfish one. Martian civilization had developed in a quite different direction from that of Earth. It had developed no important knowledge of the physical sciences, no technology. But it had developed social sciences to the point where there had not been a single crime, let alone a war on Mars, for 50,000 years. And it had developed fully the parapsychological sciences of the mind, which Earth was just beginning to discover. Mars could teach Earth much. How to avoid crime and war to begin with. Beyond those simple things lay telepathy, telekinesis, empathy. And Earth would, Mars hoped, teach them something even more valuable to Mars. How, by science and technology, which it was too late for Mars to develop now, even if they had the type of minds which would enable them to develop these things, to restore and rehabilitate a dying planet, so that an otherwise dying race might live and multiply again. Each planet would gain greatly, and neither would lose. And tonight was the night when Earth would make its first sighting shot. Its next shot, a rocket containing Earthmen, or at least an Earthman, would be at the next opposition, two Earth years, or roughly four Martian years hence. The Martians knew this because their teams of telepaths were able to catch at least some of the thoughts of Earthmen. Enough to know their plans. Unfortunately, 
At that distance, the connection was one way. Mars could not ask Earth to hurry its program, or tell Earth scientists the facts about Mars' composition and atmosphere, which would have made this preliminary shot unnecessary. Tonight, Re, the leader, as nearly as a Martian word can be translated, and Ki, his administrative assistant and closest friend, sat and meditated together until the time was near. Then they drank a toast to the future, in a beverage based on menthol, which had the same effect on Martians as alcohol on Earthmen, and climbed to the roof of the building in which they had been sitting. They watched toward the north, where the rocket should land. The stars shone brilliantly and unwinkingly through the atmosphere. In Ur Observatory Number 1 on Earth's moon, Raj Everett, his eye at the eyepiece of the spotter scope, said triumphantly, "Mars, you blew, Willie! And now, as soon as the films are developed, we'll know the score on that old planet Mars. He straightened up. There'd be no more to see now. And he and Willie Sanger shook hands solemnly. It was an historic occasion. Hope it didn't kill anybody. Any Martians, that is. Raj, did it hit dead center in Sirtis Major? Nearest matters. I'd say it's maybe a thousand miles off to the south. And that's damn close on a 50 million mile shot. Willie, do you really think there are any Martians? Willie thought a second and then said, no. He was right. End of Earthmen Bearing Gifts by Frederick Brown. Recording by Michael Navratil. Tomorrow by Staten A. Koblenz. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reading by Bologna Times. Flight Through Tomorrow by Staten A. Koblenz. Super warfare has destroyed the old race of man, but elsewhere a new civilization is dawning. Nothing was further from my mind when I discovered the release drug, Relin, than the realization that it would lead me through as strange and ghastly and revealing a series of adventures as any man has ever experienced. I encountered it, in a way, as a mere by-product of my experiments. I am a chemist by profession, and as one of the staff of the Morgenstern Foundation have access to some of the best equipped laboratories in America. The startling new invention, I must call it that, though I did not create it deliberately, came to me in the course of my investigations into the obscure depths of the human personality. It has long been my theory that there is in man a psychic entity which can exist for at least brief periods apart from the body, and have perceptions which are not those of the physical senses. In accordance with these views, I had been developing various drugs compounded of morphine and adrenaline, whose object was to shock the psychic entity loose for limited periods, and so to widen the range and powers of the personality. I shall not go into the details of my researches, nor tell by what accident I succeeded better than I had hoped. The all-important fact a fact so overwhelming that I shudder and gasp and marvel even as I tell of it, is that I did obtain a minute quantity of a drug which, by putting the body virtually in a state of suspended animation, could release the mind to travel almost at will across time and space. Yes, across time and space, for the drag of the physical having been stricken off, I could enter literally into a infinity and eternity. But let me tell precisely what happened that night, when at precisely 10.08, in the solitude of my apartment room, I swallowed half an ounce of relin and stretched myself out on the bed, well knowing that I was taking incalculable risks, and that insanity and even death were by no means remote possibilities of the road ahead. But let that be as it may. In my opinion, there is no coward more despicable than he 
who will not face danger for the sake of knowledge. My head reeled, and something seemed to buzz inside it as soon as the bitter half-ounce of fluid slipped down my throat. I was barely able to reach the bed and throw myself upon it when there came a snapping as of something inside my brain. Then, for a period, blankness. Then a gradual awakening with that feeling of exhilaration one experiences only after the most blissful sleep. I opened my eyes, feeling strong and light of limb and charged with a marvelous vital energy. But, as I peered about me, my lips drew far apart in astonishment, and I am sure that I gaped like one who has seen a ghost. Where were the familiar walls of my two-by-four room, the bureau, the book-rack, the ancient portrait of Pasteur that hung in its glass frame just above the foot of the bed? Gone, vanished as utterly as though they had never been. I was standing on a wide and windy plain, with a gale beating in my ears, and with rapid sunset-colored clouds scudding across the blood-stained west. Mingled with the wailing of the blast, there was a deep sobbing sound that struck me in successive waves, like the ululations of great multitudes of far-off mourners. And while I was wondering what this might mean, and felt a prickling of horror along my spine, the first of the portents swept across the sky. I say portents, for I do not know by what other term to describe the apparitions. High in the heavens, certainly at an altitude of many miles, the flaming thing swept across my view, comet-shaped and stretching over at least ten degrees of arc, swift as a meteor, brilliantly flesh-red, sputtering sparks like an anvil, and leaving behind it a long, ruddy tail that only slowly faded out amid the darkening skies. It must have been a full minute after its disappearance before the hissing of its flight came to my ears, a hissing so sharp, so nastily insistent, that it reached me even above the noise of the wind. And more than another minute had passed before the earth beneath me was wrenched and jarred as if by an earthquake, and the most thunderous detonations I had ever heard burst over me in a prolonged series. Let me emphasize that none of this had the quality of a dream. It was clear-cut, as vivid as anything I had ever experienced. My mind worked with an unusual precision and clarity, and not even a fleeting doubt came to me of the reality of my observations. This is some sort of bombing attack. I remember reflecting, some assault of super-monsters of the skies, perfected by a super-science. And I did not have to be told the fact. I knew, as by an all-illuminating inner knowledge, that I had voyaged into the future. Even as this realization came to me, I made another flight, and one that was in space more than in time. It did not surprise me. But I took it as the most natural thing in the world when I seemed to rise and go floating away through the air. It was still sunset time, but I could see clearly enough as I went drifting at a height of several hundred yards above a vast, desolated space near the junction of two rivers. Perhaps, however, desolated is not the word I should use. I should say, rather, shattered, pulverized obliterated, for a scene of more utter and hopeless ruin I have never seen nor imagined. Over an area of many square miles there was nothing but heaps and mounds of broken stone, charred and crumbling brick, fire-scarred timbers, and huge contorted masses of rusting steel like the decaying bones of superhuman monsters. From the great height and extent of the piles of debris, and from the occasional sight of the splintered cornice of a roof, or of some battered window frame or door, I knew that this had once been a city, one of the world's greatest, but no other recognizable features remained amid the gray masses of ruins, and the very streets and avenues had been erased. But here and there a tremendous crater, three hundred feet across, and a hundred to a hundred and fifty feet deep, indicated the source of the destruction. As if to reinforce the dread idea that had taken possession of my brain, one of the comet-like red prodigies went streaking across the sky even as I gazed down at the dead city, and I knew, 
as clearly as if I had seen the whole spectacle with my own eyes, that the missile had sprung from a source hundreds or thousands of miles away, possibly across the ocean, and that, laden with scores of tons of explosives, it had been hurled with unerring mechanical accuracy upon its mission of annihilation. Then I seemed to float over vast distances of that sunset-tinted land, and saw great craters in the fields, and villages shot to ribbons, and farms abandoned, and the wild dogs fought for the wild cattle, and thistles grew deep on acres where wheat had been planted, and weeds sprouted thickly in the orchards, and blight and mildew competed for the crops. But though here and there I could see a dugout with traces of fire and abandoned tools flung about at random, nowhere in all that dismal world did I observe a living man. After a time I returned to a place near the ruined city by the two rivers, and in the rocky palisades above one of the streams I made out some small circular holes barely large enough to admit a man, and, borne onward by some impulse of curiosity and despair, I entered one of these holes and went downward, far downward, into the dim recesses. And now for the first time, at a depth of hundreds of yards, I did at last encounter living men. My first thought was that I had gone back to the day of the caveman, for a cave-like hollow had been scooped out in the solid rock. It was true that the few hundreds of people huddled together there had the dress and looks of moderns. It was true, also, that the gloom was lighted for them by electric bulbs, and that electric radiators kept them warm. Yet Dante himself, in painting the ninth circle of his inferno, could not have imagined a drearier and more despondent group than these that slouched and drooped and muttered in that cavernous recess, seated with their hands fallen low upon their knees, or moodily pacing back and forth, like captives who can hope for no escape. Here at least we will be safe from the sky marauders, I heard one of them muttering. Yet I could not help wondering what the mere safety of the body could mean when all the glories of man's civilizations were annihilated. Part Two There came a whirring in my head, and another blank interval, and when I regained my senses I knew that another period of time had passed, possibly months or even years. I stood on the palisade above the river, near the entrance of the caves, and the sun was bright above me but there was no brightness in the men and women that trailed out of a small circular hole in the ground drab as dock rats and pasty pale of countenance as hospital inmates and with bent backs and dirty tattered clothes and a mouse-like nosing manner they emerged with the weariness of hunted refugees and they flung up their hands with low cries to shield them from the brilliance of the sun to which they were evidently unaccustomed. From the packs on their backs and the bundles in their hands, I knew that they were emerging from their subterranean refuge to try to begin a new life in the ravaged world above, and my heart went out to them, for I saw that, few as they were, not more than fifty in all, they were the sole survivors of a once populous region, and would have a bitter fight to wage in the man-made wilderness that had been a world metropolis. But as they roamed above through the waste of ash and rubble, and as they wandered abroad where the fields had been and saw how every brush and tree had been seared from the earth or poisoned by chemical bruise, I knew that their fight was not merely a bitter one, it was hopeless. And I heard them muttering among themselves, we have not even any tools, and again, we have no fuel left for the great machines. For they had lived in a highly mechanical world, and the technicians, who alone understood the workings of that world, had all been destroyed, and the sources of power had all been cut off, and power was the food without which they could not long survive. Unable to endure their haggard, hang-dog looks and grim, despondent eyes, I went wandering far away, over the length and breadth of many lands, and nowhere did I see a factory that had not been hammered to dust, nor a village that had not been 
unroofed or burnt, nor a farm where the workers went humming on their merry, toilsome way. Yet here and there I did observe little knots of survivors. Sometimes they were half-clad groups, lean and ferocious as famished wolves, who roamed the houseless countryside with stones and clubs, hunting the wild birds and hares, or making meager meals from bark and roots. Sometimes three or four men, with the frenzied eyes and hysterical shrieks and shouts of maniacs, would emerge from a brush hut by a river flat. Sometimes little bands of men and women, in a dazed, aimless way, would go wandering about a huge jagged hole in the ground, where their homes and their loved ones lay buried. I came upon solitary refugees, high up on the scarred mountain slopes, with nothing but a staff to lean on, and a deerskin to keep them warm. I saw more than one twisted form lying motionless at the foot of a precipice. I witnessed a battle between two half-crazed ravenous bands, with murder and cannibalism and horrors too grisly to report. I observed brave men resolutely training to till the soil, whose productive powers had been ruined by a poison spray from the sky, and I noted some who, though the fields remained fertile enough, had not the seed to plant, and others who had not the tools with which to plow and reap, and some who, with great labor, managed to produce enough for three or four mouths, had twenty or thirty to feed, and where the three or four might have lived, the twenty or thirty perished. Then, with a great sadness, I knew that man, having become civilized, cannot make himself into a savage again. He has come to depend upon science for his sustenance, and when he himself has destroyed the means of employing that science, he is as a babe without milk. And it is not necessary to destroy all men in order to exterminate mankind. One need only take from him the prop of his mechanical inventions." Part three. Again there came a blankness, and I passed over a stretch of time, perhaps over years or even decades, and I had wandered far in space, to an island somewhere on a sunny sea, and there once more I heard the sound of voices, and somehow, through some deeper sense, I knew that these were the voices of the only men left anywhere on the whole wide planet, and I looked down on them, and saw that they were but few no more than a dozen men and women in all with three or four children among them but their faces unlike those i had seen before were not haggard and seamed nor avid like those of hunting beasts nor distorted by fury or famine their brows were broad and noble and their eyes shone with the sweetness of great thoughts and their smiles were as unuttered music and when they glanced at me with their clear level gaze I knew that they were such beings as poets had pictured as dwellers in a far tomorrow, and I did not feel sad, though I could not forget that they were the only things in human form that no one could find on all earth's shores, and though I knew that they were too few to perpetuate their kind for long. Somehow I felt some vast benevolent spirit and control that these most perfect specimens of our race should endure when all the wreckers had vanished. As I watched, I saw the people all turning their eyes to an eastern mountain, whose summit still trailed the golden of the dawn clouds, and from above the peak a great illuminated sphere, like a chariot of light, miraculously came floating down, and the blaze was such that I could hardly bear to look at it and exclamations of wonder and joy came from the people's throats, and I too cried out in joy and wonder as the radiant globe descended, and as it alighted on the plain before us, casting a sun-like aura over everything in sight. Then through the sides of the enormous ball, I would not say through the door, for nothing of the kind was visible, a glorious being emerged, followed by several of his kind, he was shaped like a man and was no taller than a man and yet there was that about him which said that he was greater than a man for light seemed to pour from every cell of his body and a golden halo was about his head and his eyes shot forth golden beams so intense and so magnetic that once having observed them i could hardly take my gaze away with slow steps he advanced motioning the people to him 
and they drew near, and flung themselves before him on the ground, and cried out in adoration. And I too threw myself to earth, in worship of this superhuman creature, and I heard the words he spoke, and with some deeper sense I translated them, though they were not uttered in any language I knew. Out of the stars we come, O men, and back to the stars we shall go, that the best of your race may be transplanted there, and survive through means known to us, and again be populous and great. Through the immense evil within the breasts of your kind, you have been purged and all but annihilated, but the good within your race has also been mighty and can never be expunged, and that good has called through you, surviving few, to us, your guardians, that we may take you to another planet and replenish you there, and teach you that lore of love and truth and beauty which the blind members of your species have neglected here while they unfitted the earth for human habitation. So speaking, the Radiant One motioned to the people, who arose and followed him inside the great sphere of light, and when they had all entered, it slowly began to ascend, and slowly dwindled and disappeared against the morning skies. And now, I knew, there was no longer a man left anywhere on earth. Yet, as I gazed at the deserted shore, the empty beach, and the bare mountainside, a sense of supreme satisfaction came over me, as though I knew that in the end, after fire and agony and degradation, all was eternally well. That sense of supreme satisfaction remained with me when, after still another blank interval, I opened my eyes as from a deep slumber, and stared at the familiar book-rack, the bureau, the mottled paper walls of my own room. The clock on the little table at my side indicated the hour of 10.09. In other words, all that had happened had occupied the space of one minute. Yet I know as surely as I know that I write these words, that the release drug had freed my spirit to range over thousands of miles of space, and that I have looked on people and events which no other eye will view for scores, hundreds, or even thousands of years to come. End of Flight Through Tomorrow by Stanton Arthur Koblenz By Roger Arcutt this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Frank Malanga. Grr by Roger Arcot. Grr! There he goes again. Brother Ambrose could scarce restrain the hatred that seethed and churned in his breast. As his smallish eyes followed Brother Lorenzo headed once more for his beloved geraniums, the inevitable watering pot gripped in both hands, the inevitable devotions rising in a whispered stream from his saintly lips. The very fact the man lived was a mockery to human justice. God's blood, but if thoughts could only kill. Ave Virgo. The thousand and one injuries of Fray Lorenzo he had borne as a Christian monk should, with humility and charity. But the insults, ay, the insults to faith and reason, they were more than a generous father could expect his most adoring servant to suffer, weren't they? To have to sit next to the man, for instance, at evening meal and hear his silly prattle of the weather, next year's crop of cork, we can scarcely expect oak galls, he says. Isn't petrocellinum the name for parsley? No, it's Greek, you swine, and what's the Greek name for swine snout? I could hurl it at you like the Pope hurling anathema. Salve Tibi. It sticks in one's craw to bless him with the rest. Would God our cloister numbered thirty and nine instead of forty. For days now, for weeks, Brother Ambrose had witnessed and endured the false piety of the man. How he'd ever got admitted to the order in the first place beat all supposition. It must have been his sanctimonious apple cheeks. Or, heaven forbid such simony, some rich relative greased the palm of the prior. Saint forsooth. Brother Ambrose recalled just a week previous. They had been outside the walls, a round dozen of the brothers, gathering the first few bushels of grapes to make the good Benedictine wine. 
and all men tended to their duty in the vineyard, save who? Save lecherous Lorenzo, whose job was to attend the press. Picked the assignment himself, most likely, so he could ogle the brown thighs and browner ankles of Dolores, squatting on the convent bank, Gitana slut, with her flashing eyes and hint of sweet light in those cherry-red lips and coquettish tossing shoulders. A man could see she was child of the devil, flesh to tempt to eternal hellfire. But how skillful Brother Lorenzo had been in keeping the glow in his dead eye from being seen by the others. Only Ambrose had known it was there, invisible to even the world, perhaps, but lurking just the same in Lorenzo's feverishly disguised brain. See, there, and lusting beyond a doubt. By one's faith, the blue-black hair of Dolores would make any weak man itch, and the stories that had floated on the breeze that day, livelily exchanged between her and that roguish San Chicha, the Lavandera, Lorenzo must surely have lapped them all up like a hungry spaniel, though he cleverly turned his head away so you would not guess. After all, Ambrose, scarcely a step closer, could recall clearly every word of the bawdy tales. Back to the table again. And Brother Ambrose once more noticed how Fray Lorenzo never let his fork and knife lie crosswise, an obvious tribute he himself always made in our Signor's praise. Nor did Lorenzo honor the Trinity by drinking his orange pulp in three quiet sips. Rather, the Arian heretic, he drained it at a gulp. Now he was out trimming his myrtle bush and touching up his roses. Grrr, again. Watching his enemy putter away in the deepening twilight that followed the decline of the Andalusian sun, Brother Ambrose recalled the other traps he had lain to trip the hypocrite. Traps set and failed. But oh, so delicious anyhow, these attempts to send him flying off to hell where he belonged, a cather or a manichee. That last one involving the pornographic French novel Scrofulous and Wicked. How could it fail to have snared its prey? especially when Fray Ambrose had spent such sleepless nights working out his plot in great detail. Brother Ambrose allowed himself an inward chortle, as he paced along the portico, recollecting how close to success the scheme had come. The book had had to be read first, or re-read, rather, by Ambrose to determine just which chapter would be most apt to damn a soul with concupiscent suggestion. Gray paper with blunt type. The whole book had been easy enough to grasp, for that matter, what with the words so badly spelled out? The cuckoldry tales of Boccaccio and that gay old archpriest Juan Ruiz de Hita. What dry reading they seemed by comparison. Almost like decretals. As if by misadventure, Brother Ambrose had left the book in Lorenzo's cell. The pages doubled down at the woeful sixteenth print. Ah, there had been a passage. Simply glancing at it, you groveled hand and foot in Belial's grip. But that twice-cursed Lorenzo must have had the devil's luck that day. A breeze sprang up to flip the volume closed, and the monk, not knowing the book's owner and espying only its name, had handed it over to the prior, who had promptly turned a monastery upside down in search of further such adulterous contraband. Worse fortune followed. The next day Brother Lorenzo had come down with a temporary stroke of blindness. It lasted only a week. But even so, for seven days, Ambrose had been forced to labor in his stead in the drafty library, copying boresome scrolls in a light scarcely less dim than moonlight. Worse still, the prior had found mistakes. Letters dropped, transposed. Latin was so bothersomely regular compared to the vulgar tongue. For what he called such inexcusable slovenliness, the prior had imposed a penance of bread and water and extra toil. Slovenliness? Why didn't the prior, was he blind too, notice the deadly sins that were each day so neatly practiced by Brother Lorenzo? They went unpunished. Probably God's angel would even be found to have been asleep when Judgment Day came around, and Lorenzo would slip into heaven by a wink, as one might say. Obviously there was no justice except such as a man would make himself, Brother Ambrose had at last decided. Ave Maria, plena gratia. Now at last he was alone in his cell, free finally from the unendurable, sometimes it seemed everlasting, 
torment of Brother Lorenzo's presence. Twenty-nine distinct damnations listed in Galatians, if you care to look up the text, and not one of them could the enemy be made to trip on, a dying. In fact, of late, so bad had the situation grown, that Brother Ambrose had even once considered pledging his soul to Satan. Oh, not for keeps. No enmity was worth that dread sacrifice. But as a trick, sort of, with a flaw in the indenture that proud Lucifer would miss until it was too late to wriggle out of the bargain. But that had been two days ago. Now a better scheme presented itself to Brother Ambrose, engendered by that forced labor within the dreary precincts of the convent library. For that was where and when he had made his delightful discovery, the one that would now redeem him from all his irritations and travail, the discovery that would rid him of Brother Lorenzo for always. It had happened like this. Inasmuch as the monastery was over eight hundred years old, many ancient books and moldy scrolls lay forgotten in the cobwebby corners of the great library, especially where the light was gloomy. One afternoon, during his week of enforced toil, Brother Ambrose had sought the shelter of one of these ill-lighted and seldom-visited nooks of the building to recover certain lost hours of sleep, hours that had gone astray the night before as he sat up in his lonely cell and brooded over his wrongs. But before his drowsy head could nod off into dreams completely, his eye had chanced to notice a faded scroll that jutted forth from its fellows on the shelves. Starting to push the offender back in place, Ambrose's fingers had hesitated when he noticed the title. De Necromanciae. Surely, thought the monk, such a book belonged on the index. Then it occurred to him that possibly the copy in front of him was the only one of its kind in the world, in which case not even the Holy Father could be expected to know it existed. Then how could it be on the index, or be forbidden? Taking advantage of this personal achievement in casuistry, Brother Ambrose promptly untied the scroll and began reading. What he discovered there interested him very much. We do not intend to describe all of the marvels unfolded for him in that venerable mildewed manuscript, for some of the more gruesome mysteries of the supernatural world are better left unrevealed. But let it be said at least that one chapter intrigued Brother Ambrose immensely, so much so that he shamelessly whipped out his scissors and, nipping that section, stuck it inside his rough wool robes so he might peruse it at greater leisure within the privacy of his cell. The chapter that evoked such delight and interest within Brother Ambrose's complicated brain was one that had been penned in the early ages of the church by a lay brother who had concerned himself with pagan magic. In it he had described the fiendish habits and activities of werewolves and had actually even presented a formula. Ut fiat homo lupinus, it was entitled, which purported to give the secret words and ritual necessary to achieve the transformation from man to beast. At last the opportunity had arrived Ambrose's way to achieve his long-desired revenge on Brother Lorenzo. Twenty-four hours had passed since the momentous discovery. The moment was at hand. Night again had settled upon the Spanish cloisters, the last bell had tolled, and all the good and hardy men were supposed to be sound asleep on their rough iron cots. But in Brother Ambrose's chilly cell, a small candle burned, casting sickly light that produced huge flickering shadows against the whitewashed walls. Brother Ambrose held the treasured piece of manuscript between his hands. It was difficult to make out the faded Latin. The writing was cramped and crude and Ambrose was no scholar to boot. But like all persons of his times, he was quite well aware of the existence of werewolves, werefoxes, and other such monsters. And he held no doubt but what the spell would work. It was the scheming brother's plan to creep in the stealth of night down the corridor to the barred oak door of Lorenzo's own simple cell. There he would knock, lightly enough to disturb no other sleepers, yet loud enough that the rapping would summon Brother Lorenzo from whatever wicked dreams might be festering in his own sleeping mind. As Fray Lorenzo's naked footsteps were heard pattering across the bare floor, Ambrose would drink the bat's blood he had collected, sniff the wolfbane he had ground to ash, 
and pronounced the obscure Celtic words that would alter the very atoms of his flesh, transforming them into an obscene travesty of life. Brother Lorenzo, when he opened the door, would be met not by a fellow human being, but by a snarling, fanged wolf that would hurl its hairy bulk at the drowsy monk's own throat. The next day the entire monastery would be awakened, of course, by shouts of the news that foul murder had been discovered. But no amount of detection would ever manifest the bestial murderer. Brother Ambrose would hug to his soul the secret of his crime until the day of his shriving. At length the hour had grown so late that it was certain even the prior himself must have long since retired. Brother Ambrose made ready to carry out his deed. He rose from his cot, removed the coarse brown robe that normally he wore to bed as well as in his daily rounds, so that his long unwashed body stood naked. There must be no chance for tell-tale blood to stain his clothes when his fierce talons and wolfish teeth tore and rended at human flesh. Carrying his precious piece of scroll, he departed from his cell and groped his way down the stone corridor until the light improved enough for him to see his way. Luckily, a patch of moonlight illuminated the very space in front of the accursed Brother Lorenzo's door. What fortune! Brother Ambrose halted and stared at the door as though his eyes could see through it at the sleeping form within. He sucked in a deep breath. His palms were sweaty, his heartbeat rapid. For a moment he was almost ready to back out. Then suddenly the memory of all the hundreds of grudges he bore against Lorenzo surged through him. Hatred built up a massive reservoir that broke out over his crumbling conscience and flooded his body with anger and wild resentment. His teeth gritted. What had he been thinking of? To retreat now, with revenge so nearly at hand? He rapped. A moment later, he heard a creaking sound like Brother Lorenzo slipping out of bed. Trembling, he lifted the phial of bat's blood, drank it down. It tasted salty. He chewed on the wolfbane powder until it mixed with the saliva of his mouth. Then he swallowed. Holding the ancient scroll segment before him, he began to repeat the badly written incantation. Ut fiat homo lupinus. Pulvis arnicae facenda est et dum. A thousand jolts assailed his body as if he had been struck by all the lightnings in heaven. Then came a rushing paralysis, a distortion of time and space, a dread feeling of disintegration and death. The door to Brother Lorenzo's cell began to recede, swelling in volume as it did. The ceiling of the corridor likewise retreated at ever increasing pace. Staring down at his own dwindling frame, Ambrose saw that the slug-white flesh was now covered with thick fur, even as the limbs were gnarling. Then suddenly the door opened. Brother Lorenzo stepped out, his kindly, pious face wrinkled with sleep, but otherwise showing no irritation or displeasure at being summoned from his rest. At first the monk seemed not to have noticed Ambrose's form, for he gazed above him in a way. Ambrose kept on shrinking. Finally, Brother Lorenzo's gaze chanced to glance downward. But still his features mirrored no recognition or alarm, only puzzlement. Now, thought Ambrose, now is the time for me to snarl. But no snarl nor semblance of a snarl emerged from his lips. Rather, his lips had elongated into long-sucking proboscises, while already a third pair of limbs had commenced growing from his furred over abdomen. This was not a wolf-like form he was assuming, Ambrose suddenly realized in terror. But if it was not Lupine, what was it? Had he misread the incantation? Had he mispronounced a simple word? The weird crawling form into which he had metamorphosed was now hardly an inch higher than the surface of the floor. But Ambrose's eyes had bulged into great many faceted orbs capable of seeing objects with greater clarity than ever. Inches away from him, he made out the segment of scroll he had discarded after reading aloud from it. Crawling over to it, he perused the beginning words of the spell. And it suddenly dawned on him, while what passed for a heart and ventricles within his pulpy form began simulating horror, that the ancient monk of centuries ago who had first copied the incantation must have been as careless of spelling as he. 
for the charm obviously did not convert its user into a werewolf, but rather some other animal. Dredging up all the miserable Latin he knew, Ambrose fished for some word similar to Lupinus. And suddenly he had it. Pulisus. That was the word the sloppy copyist of yesteryear had wrongly transcribed. From the word pulex, meaning flea. Now not to become a wolf-like man, but a flea-like man. That was what the formula had described. Ambrose the flea braced himself. Gathering his powerful legs under him, he leaped in soaring flight to land upon the object of hatred, the giant Brother Lorenzo, who towered so high above him. But the gentle and considerate Brother Lorenzo, who probably would not have hurt hair nor hide of any other creature on earth, even he knew full well that there is only one thing you can do to discourage a flea. Swat! End of Gur by Roger Arcott Recording by Frank Malanga, Pembroke Pines, Florida By Horace Brown Fife. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Frank Malanga. Irresistible Weapon by Horace Brown Fife. In the special observation dome of the colossal command ship just beyond Pluto, Every nervous clearing of a throat rasped through the silence. Telescopes were available, but most of the scientists and high officials preferred the view on the huge telescreen. This showed, from a distance of several million miles, one of the small moons of the frigid planet, so insignificant that it had not been discovered until man had pushed the boundaries of space exploration past the asteroids. The satellite was about to become spectacularly significant, however as the first target of man's newest, most destructive weapon. I need not remind you, gentlemen, white-haired coordinator, Evora of Mars, had said, that if we have actually succeeded in this race against our former centurion colonies, it may well prevent the imminent conflict entirely. In a few moments we shall know whether our scientists have developed a truly irresistible weapon. Of all the official soldiers and scientists present, Arnold Gibson was perhaps the least excited. For one thing, he had labored hard to make the new horror succeed and felt reasonably confident that it would. The project had been given the attention of every first-class scientific mind in the solar system, for the great fear was that the new states on the Centurion planets might win the race of discovery and... and bring a little order into this old-fashioned, inefficient fumbling toward progress, Gibson thought contemptuously. Look at them. Fools for all their degrees and titles. They've stumbled on something with possibilities beyond their confused powers of application. A gasp rustled through the chamber, followed by an even more awed silence than had preceded the unbelievable, ultra-rapid action on the telescreen. Gibson permitted himself a tight smile of satisfaction. Now my work really begins, he reflected. A few quick steps brought him to Dr. Haas, director of the project, just before the less stunned observers surrounded that gentleman, babbling questions. I'll start collecting the number three string of recorders, he reported. All right, Arnold, agreed Haas. Tell the others to get their ships out, too. I'll be busy here. Not half as busy as you will be in about a day, thought Gibson, heading for the spaceship berths. He had arranged to be assigned the recording machines drifting in space at the greatest distance from the command ship. The others would assume that he needed more time to locate and retrieve the apparatus, which would give him a head start toward Alpha Centauri. His ship was not large, but it was powerful and versatile to cope with any emergency that may have been encountered during the dangerous tests. Gibson watched his instruments carefully for signs of pursuit until he had put a few million miles between himself and the command ship. Then he eased his craft into subspace drive and relaxed his vigilance. He returned to normal space many days later in the vicinity of Alpha Centauri. They may have attempted to follow him for all he knew, but it hardly mattered by then. 
He broadcast the recognition signal he had been given to memorize long ago, when he had volunteered his services to the new states. Then he headed for the capital planet, Nisus. Long before reaching it, he acquired a lowering escort of warcraft, but he was permitted to land. Well, well, it's young Gibson, the chairman of Nisus greeted him, after the newcomer had passed through the exhaustive screening designed to protect the elaborate underground headquarters. I trust you have news for us, my boy. Watch outside the door, Colonel. One of the ostentatiously armed guards stepped outside and closed the door as Gibson greeted the obese man sitting across the button-studded expanse of desk. The scientist was under no illusion as to the vagueness of the title chairman. He was facing the absolute power of the Centaurian planets, which, in a few months' time, would be the same as saying, the ruler of all the human race in both systems. Gibson's file must have been available on the chairman's desk telescreen within minutes of the reception of his recognition signal. He felt the thrill of admiration for the efficiency of the new states and their system of government. He made it his business to report briefly and accurately trusting that the plain facts of his feet would attract suitable recognition. They did. Chairman Diamond's sharp blue eyes glinted out of the fat mask of his features. Well done, my boy, he grunted, with a joviality he did not bother trying to make sound overly sincere. So they have it. You must see our men immediately and point out where they have gone wrong. You may leave it to me to decide who has gone wrong. Arnold Gibson shivered involuntarily before reminding himself that he had seen the correct answer proved before his eyes. He had stood there and watched. More, he had worked with them all his adult life, and he was the last whom the muddled fools would have suspected. The officer outside the door, Colonel Corman, was recalled and given orders to escort Gibson to the secret state laboratories. He glanced briefly at the scientists when they had been let out through the complicated system of safeguards. We have to go to the second moon, he said expressionlessly. Better sleep all you can on the way. Once you're there, the chairman will be impatient for results. Gibson was glad, after they had landed on the satellite, that he had taken the advice. He was led from one underground lab to another to compare Centaurian developments with Solarian. Finally, Colonel Corman appeared to extricate him, giving curt answers to such researchers as still had questions. Phew! Glad you got me out, Gibson thanked him. They've been picking my brain for two days straight. I hope you can stay awake, retorted Corman with no outward sign of sympathy. If you think you can't, say so now. I'll have them give you another shot. The chairman is calling on the telescreen. Gibson straightened. Jealous snob, he thought. Typical military fathead. And he knows I amount to more than any little colonel now. I was smart enough to fool all the so-called brains of the solar system. I'll stay awake, he said shortly. Chairman Diamond's shiny features appeared on the screen soon after Corman reported his charge ready. Speak freely, he ordered Gibson. This beam is so tight and scrambled that no prying jackass could even tell that it is communication. Have you set us straight? Yes, Your Excellency, replied Gibson. I merely pointed out which of several methods the Solarians got to yield results. Your, our scientists were working on all possibilities, so it would have been only a matter of time. Which you saved us, said Chairman Diamond. His ice-blue eyes glinted again. I wish I could have seen the faces of Haas and Coordinator Evora and the rest. You fooled them completely. Gibson glowed at the rare praise. I dislike bragging, Your Excellency, he said, but they are fools. I might very well have found the answer without them once they had collected the data. My success shows what intelligence, well directed after the manner of the new states of Centauri, can accomplish against inefficiency. The chairman's expression, masked by the fat of his face, nevertheless approached a smile. So you would say that you... One of our sympathizers were actually the most intelligent worker they had? He'll have his little joke, thought Gibson, and I'll let him put it over. Then even that sour colonel will laugh with us, and the chairman will hint about what post I'll get as a reward. I wouldn't mind being in charge. Old Hass's opposite number at this end. 
I think I might indeed be permitted to boast of that much ability, Your Excellency, he answered, putting on what he hoped was an expectant smile. Although, considering the Solarians, that is not saying much. The little joke did not develop precisely as anticipated. Unfortunately, Chairman Diamond said, maintaining his smile throughout, wisdom should never be confused with intelligence. Gibson waited, feeling his own smile stiffen as he wondered what could be going wrong. Surely they could not doubt his loyalty. A hasty glance at Colonel Corman revealed no expression on the military facade affected by that gentleman. For if wisdom were completely synonymous with intelligence, the obese chairman continued, relishing his exposition, you would be a rival to myself, and consequently would be disposed of, anyway. Such a tingle shot up Gibson's spine that he was sure he must have jumped. Anyway, he repeated huskily, his mouth suddenly seemed dry. Chairman Diamond smiled out of the telescreen, so broadly that Gibson was unpleasantly affected by the sight of his small, gleaming white teeth. Put it this way, he suggested suavely. Your highly trained mind observed, correlated, and memorized the most intricate data in mathematics, meanwhile guiding your social relations with your former colleagues so as to remain unsuspected while stealing their most cherished secret. Such a feat demonstrates ability and intelligence. Gibson tried to lick his lips and could not, despite the seeming fairness of the words. He sensed a pulsing undercurrent of cruelty and cynicism. On the other hand, the mellow voice flowed on, having received the information, being able to use it effectively now without you, and knowing that you betrayed once, I shall simply discard you like an old message blank. That is an act of wisdom. Had you chosen your course more wisely, he added, your position might be stronger. By the time Arnold Gibson regained his voice, the Centurion autocrat was already giving instructions to Colonel Corman. The scientist strove to interrupt, to attract the ruler's attention, even momentarily. Neither paid him any heed, until he shouted and tried frenziedly to shove the soldier from in front of the telescreen. Corman backhanded him across the throat without even looking around, with such force that Gibson staggered back and fell. He lay, half-choking, grasping his throat with both hands until he could breathe. The colonel continued discussing his extinction without emotion. So if Your Excellency agrees, I would prefer taking him back to Nisus first, for the sake of the morale factor here. Some of them are so addled now at having been caught chasing up wrong alleys that they can hardly work. Apparently the chairman agreed, for the screen was blank when the colonel reached down and hauled Gibson to his feet. Now listen to me carefully, he said, emphasizing his order with a ringing slap across Gibson's face. I shall walk behind you with my blaster drawn. If you make a false move, I shall not kill you. Gibson stared at him, holding his bleeding mouth. It will be much worse, Corman went on woodenly. Imagine what it will be like to have both feet charred to the bone. You would have to crawl the rest of the way to the ship. I certainly would not consider carrying you. In a nightmarish daze, Gibson obeyed the cold directions and walked slowly along the underground corridors of the Centaurian Research Laboratories. He prayed desperately that someone, anyone, might come along. Anybody who could possibly be used to create a diversion or to be pushed into Corman and his deadly blaster. The halls remained deserted, possibly by arrangement. Maybe I'd better wait till we reach his ship, Gibson thought. I ought to be able to figure a way before we reach Nisus. I had the brains to fool Hass and... He winced, recalling Chairman Diamond's theory of the difference between intelligence and wisdom. The obscene swine, he screamed silently. Colonel Corman grunted warningly, and Gibson took the indicated turn. They entered the spaceship from an underground chamber, and Gibson learned the reason for his executioner's assurance when the latter chained him to one of the pneumatic acceleration seats. The chain was fragile in appearance, but he knew he would not be free to move until Corman so desired. More of their insane brand of cleverness, he reflected. That's the sort of thing they do succeed in thinking of. They're all crazy. Why did I ever... But he shrank from the question he feared to answer. To drag out into the open his petty, selfish reasons, 
shorn of the tinsel glamour of so-called service and progress, would be too painful. After the first series of accelerations, he roused himself from his beaten stupor enough to note that Corman was taking a strange course for reaching Nisus. Then entirely too close to the planet and its satellites to ensure accuracy, the colonel put the ship into subspace drive. Corman leaned back at the conclusion of the brief activity on his control board and met Gibson's pop-eyed stare. Interesting the things worth knowing, he commented. How to make a weapon, for instance, or whether your enemy has it yet. He almost smiled at his prisoner's expression. Or even better, knowing exactly how far your enemy has progressed and how fast he can continue, whether to stop him immediately or whether you can remain a step ahead. But if both sides are irresistible, Gibson stammered. Corman examined him contemptuously. No irresistible weapon exists, or ever will, he declared. Only an irresistible process, the transmission of secrets. You are living proof that no safeguards can defend against that. He savored Gibson's silent discomfort. I am sure you know how far and how fast the Centaurian scientist will go, Gibson, since I guided you to every laboratory in that plant. Your memory may require some painful jogging when we reach the solar system, but remember you shall. But, but you were ordered to... You didn't think I was a Centaurian, did you? sneered Corman. After I just explained to you what is really irresistible. End of Irresistible Weapon by Horace Brown Fife. Recording by Frank Malanga the Bronx, New York. To Lose by Larry M. Harris. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Gabriel Glenn. The Man Who Played To Lose by Larry M. Harris. Sometimes the very best thing you can do is to lose. The cholera germ, for instance, asks nothing better than it be swallowed alive. When I came into the control room, the captain looked up from a set of charts at me. He stood up and gave me a salute, and I returned it, not making a ceremony out of it. Half an hour to landing, sir, he said. That irritated me. It always irritates me. I'm not an officer, I said. I'm not even an enlisted man. He nodded too quickly. Yes, Mr. Cowboy, he said. Sorry. I sighed. If you want to salute, I told him, if it makes you happier to salute, you go right ahead. But don't call me, sir. That would make me an officer, and I wouldn't like being an officer. I have met too many of them. It didn't make him angry. He wasn't anything except subservient and awed and anxious to please. Yes, Mr. Cowboy, he said. I searched in my pockets for a cigarette and found a cup of them and stuck one into my mouth. The captain was right there with the light, so I took it from him. Then I offered him a cigarette. He thanked me as if it had been a full set of crown jewels. What difference did it make whether or not he called me sir? I was still God to him, and there wasn't much I could do about it. Did you want something, Mr. Cowboy? he asked me, puffing on the cigarette. I nodded. Now that we're getting close, I told him. I want to know as much about the place as possible. I've had a full hypno, but a hypno's only as good as the facts in it, and the facts that reach Earth may be exaggerated, modified, distorted, or even out of date. Yes, Mr. Cowboy, he said eagerly. I wondered if when he was through with that cigarette he would keep the butt as a souvenir. He might even frame it, I told myself. After all, I'd given it to him, hadn't I? The magnificent Mr. Cowboy who almost acts like an ordinary human being, had actually given a poor, respectful spaceship captain a cigarette. It made me want to butt holes in the bulkheads. Not that I hadn't had time to get used to the treatment. Every man in my corps gets a full dose of awe and respect from the services, from government officials, and even from the United Cabinets. The only reason we don't get it from the man in the street is that the man in the street, unless he happens to be a very special man, in a very unusual street, doesn't know the core exists. Which is a definite relief, by the way. At least, off the job, 
I'm no more than Ephraim Carboy citizen. I took a puff on my cigarette, and the captain followed suit very respectfully. I felt like screaming at him, but I kept my voice polite. The war's definitely over, isn't it? I said. He shrugged. That depends, Mr. Carboy, he said. The armies have surrendered, and the treaty's been signed. That happened even before we left Earth three or four weeks ago. But whether you could say the war was over? Well, Mr. Carboy, that depends. Guerrillas, I said. He nodded. Wallen's a jungle world mostly, he said. Sixty percent water, of course. But outside of that, there are a few cities, two spaceports, and the rest, eighty or ninety percent of the land area, nothing but jungle. A few roads running from city to city, but that's all. Of course, I said. He was being careful and accurate. I wondered what he thought I'd do if I caught him in a mistake. Make a magic pass and explode him like a bomb, probably. I took in some more smoke, wondering whether the captain thought I had psi powers. Which, of course, I didn't. No need for them in my work. And musing sourly on how long it would take before the job was done and I was on my way back home. Then again, I told myself there was always the chance of getting killed. And in the mood I found myself, the idea of a peaceful, unrespectful death was very pleasant. For a second or two, anyhow. The government holds the cities, the captain was saying, and essential trade services, spaceports, that sort of thing, but a small band of men can last for a long time out there in the wilds. Living off the country, I said. He nodded again. Wolin's nine nines earth normals, he said, but you know that already. I know all of this, I said. I'm just trying to update it a little, if I can. Oh, he said. Oh, suddenly, sir. Uh, Mr. Carboy. I sighed and puffed on the cigarette and waited for him to go on. After all, what else was there to do? For a wonder, the hypno had been just about accurate. That was helpful. If I had heard some new and surprising facts from the captain, it would have thrown all the other information I had into doubt. Now I could be pretty sure of what I was getting into. By the time we landed, the captain was through and I was running over the main points in my head for a last minute check. Wolin, settled in the 85th year of the explosion, had established a parliamentary form of government set up generally along the usual model, bicameral, elective and pretty slow. Trade relations with Earth and with the six other inhabited planets had been set up as rapidly as possible, and Wolin had become a full member of the committee within thirty years. Matters had then rolled along with comparative smoothness for some time, but some sort of explosion was inevitable, it always happens, and very recently that nice parliamentary government had blown up in everybody's face. The setup seemed to be reminiscent of something, but it was a little while before I got it. The ancient South American states in the pre-space days, before the United Cabinets managed to unify Earth once and for all. There'd been an election on Wolin, and the loser hadn't bowed gracefully out of the picture to set up a loyal opposition. Instead, he'd gone back on his hind legs, accused the winner of all sorts of horrible things, some of which, for all I knew, might even be true, and had declared Wolin's independence of the comedy, which meant, in effect, independence from all forms of interplanetary law. Of course, he had no right to make a proclamation of any sort, but he'd made it, and he was going to get the right to enforce it. That was how William F. Sargent's army was formed. Sargent, still making proclamations, gathered a good-sized group of men and marched on the capital, New Didymus. The established government counted with an army of its own, and for eight months neither side could gain a really decisive advantage. Then the government forces, rallying after a minor defeat near a place known as Andrew's Farm, defeated an attacking force, captured Sargent and two of his top generals, and just kept going from there. The treaty was signed within eight days. Unfortunately, some of Sargent's supporters had been hunters and woodsmen. Ordinarily, a guerrilla movement, if it doesn't grind to a halt of its own accord, can be stopped within a few weeks. Where a world is mostly cities, small towns and so forth, and only a little jungle, the bands can be bottled up and destroyed. And most guerrillas aren't very experienced in their work. A small band of men lost in the woods can't do much damage. But a small group of woodsmen on a planet that consists mostly of jungle is another matter. These men knew the ground, were capable of living off the country with a minimum of effort, 
and knew just where to strike to tie up roads and transportation, halt essential on-planet services, and in general, raise merry hell with the planet's economy. So the Wolin government called Earth, and the United Cabinets started hunting. Of course, they came up with our core, the troubleshooters, the unorthodox boys, the holy idols, and the core fished around and came up with me. I didn't really mind. A vacation tends to get boring after a week or two anyhow. I've got no family ties I care to keep up, and a few enough close friends. Most of us are like that, I imagine. It's the nature of the job. It was a relief to get back into action, even if it meant putting up with the kowtowing I always got. When I stepped out onto the spaceport grounds, as a matter of fact, I was feeling pretty good. It took just ten seconds for that to change. The president himself was waiting, as close to the pits as he could get. He was a chubby, red-faced little man, and he beamed at me as if he were Santa Claus. Mr. Cowboy, he said in a voice that needed roughage badly. I'm so glad you're here. I'm sure you'll be able to do something about the situation. I'll try, I said, feeling foolish. This was no place for a conversation, especially not with the head of the government. Oh, I'm sure you'll succeed, he told me brightly. After all, Mr. Cowboy, we've heard of your uh, group. Oh, yes, your fame is a uh, universal. Sure, I said, I'll do my best. But the less I'm seen talking to you, the better. Nevertheless, he said, if we need to meet, if we do, I said, there's a set of signals in the daily papers. Your intelligence should know all about that, Mr. President. Ah, he said, of course, certainly. Well, Mr. Cowboy, I do want to tell you how glad I am. So am I, I said. Goodbye. The trouble with the democratic process is that a group of people picked at random can elect some silly leaders. That's been happening ever since ancient Greece, I imagine, and it'll go on happening. It may not be fatal, but it's annoying. My job, for instance, was to prop up this foolish little man. I had to work against a group of guerrillas who were even more democratic from all I'd heard, and who seemed to have a great deal of common, ordinary brains. Of course, I wasn't doing it for the president. It was for the committee as a whole, and it needed to be done. But I can't honestly say that that made me feel any better about the job. I was driven out of the city right after I'd packed up my supplies. Two days food and water in a rude knapsack, a call radio, and some other special devices I didn't think I was going to need. But, I told myself, you never know. There was even a suicide device just in case. I packed it away and forgot about it. The city was an oasis in the middle of jungle, with white clean buildings and static clean streets and walks. It didn't seem to have a park, but then it didn't need one. There was plenty of park outside. The beautiful street became a poor one half a mile out of the city and degenerated into a rough trail for ground vehicles soon after that. How many people are there on this planet? I asked my driver. He never took his eyes from the road. Two and a half million last census he said with great respect. That explained things, of course. As the population grew, the cities would expand and the forests would go under. It had happened on Earth and on every settled planet. As recently as 1850, for instance, large tracts of New York City, where I made my home, were farm and forest. Why, in 1960, the population was only about 8 million, and they thought the place had reached its height. Wolin had only begun its drive to citify the planet. Give it another hundred and fifty years and the guerrillas couldn't exist for simple lack of any place to hide and to live independently. Unfortunately, the government didn't have a hundred and fifty years. Judging from what I'd seen, the government didn't have a hundred and fifty days. Rationing was in force at all the markets we'd passed on the way out, and there seemed to be a lot of cops. That's always a bad sign. It means normal processes are beginning to break down and anarchy is creeping in. I thought about it. Three months was an outside limit. If I couldn't finish the job in three months, it might as well never be finished. It's always nice to have a deadline, I told myself. The car stopped at a place in the road that looked like any other place in the road. I got out, adjusted my knapsack and started away from the road into the jungle that bordered it. The hypno I'd taken had told me there were farms scattered through the jungle, but I didn't know exactly where and I didn't even want to find out. The knapsack was heavy, but I decided I could stand the weight. 
In five minutes I was surrounded by jungle, without any quick way to tell me where the road had been. There was a trail, and maybe human beings had used it, but it was no more than a scratch in the vegetation. That was green like earth's, and mostly spiny. I managed to scratch myself twice, and then I learned to duck. After that, the time went by slowly. I just kept walking without much of an idea of where I was going. After a couple of hours, I was good and lost, which was just what I wanted. It was starting to get dark, so I took the opportunity of building a fire. I dug in my knapsack and found some food and started to cook it. I was still watching it heat up when I heard the noise behind me. Those boys were good. He'd sneaked up through the jungle and come within a foot of me without my hearing him. I jumped up just as if I hadn't expected him and whirled around to face him. He had his heater out and was covering me with it. I didn't reach for anything, I just watched him. He was a big man, almost as tall as I was, and solidly built, with a jaw like a bulldog's and tiny, sparkling eyes. His voice was like rusted iron. Relax, he told me. I'm not burning you down, mister. Not yet. I made myself stare him down. Who are you? I said. Name don't matter, he said, without moving the heater an inch. What's important is, who are you, and what are you doing here? James Carson's my name, I said. I'm from Ankata. It was a small city halfway around the planet, a nice, anonymous place to be from. And I'm minding my own business. Sure, the big man said. He jerked his head and whistled, one sudden sharp note. The clearing was full of men. They were all sorts, big and small, thin and fat, dressed in uniforms, cast-offs, suits, rags, anything at all. Half of them were carrying heaters. The rest had knives, some good and some homemade. They watched me and they watched the big man. Nobody moved. Maybe you're a government man, the big man said, and have come out to catch some of Bill Sargent's boys. No, I said. He grinned at me as if he hadn't heard me. Well, he said, this ought to be a big enough catch for you, mister. Want to capture us all right now and take us back to New Didymus with you? You've got me wrong, I said. Another man spoke up. He was older, in his late forties, I thought. His hair was thin and grey, but his face was hard. He had a heater strapped to his side, and he wore a good uniform. Government men don't come out one at a time, do they, Huey? he said. The big man shrugged. No way to tell, he said. Maybe Mr. Carson here's got a call radio for the rest of his boys. Maybe they're all just waiting for us someplace nearby. If they're waiting, the other man said, they'd be here by now. Besides, Huey, he don't look like a government man. Think they all got tails? Huey asked him. I judged it was about time to put in a word. I'm not government, I said. I'm from Ankata. I'm here to help you, if you're the men I think you are. That started some more discussion. Huey was all for labeling my offer a trick and getting rid of me then and there, after which, I suppose, he was going to clear out my mythical followers in the nearby jungle. But he was pretty well all alone. There's got to be a rotten apple in the best pecked barrel, and these boys were smart. The only sensible thing to do was staring them in the face, and it didn't take them long to see it. We'll take you back with us, Huey's friend told me. When we get to a safe place, we can sit down and talk this out. I wanted to insist on finishing my supper right where I was. But there's such a thing as playing a little too much for the grandstand. Instead, I was herded into the center of the group, and we marched off into the jungle. Only it wasn't a march. There was no attempt at order. For a while we used the trail, and then straggled off it and went single file through masses of trees and bushes and leaves. Being in the center of the line helped a little, but not enough. The spines kept coming through, and I got a few more nice scratches. The trip took about half an hour, and when we stopped, we were in front of a cave mouth. The band went inside, and I went with them. There was light, battery-powered, and what seemed to be all the comforts of a small, ill-kept town jail. But it was better than the naked jungle. I was still porting my knapsack, and when we got into the cave, I unstrapped it and sat down and opened it. The men watched me without making any attempt to hide the fact. The first thing I took out was an instant heat food can. It didn't look like a bomb, so nobody did anything. They just kept watching while I came up with my call radio. 
Huey said, what the hell, and came for me. I stood up, spilling the knapsack, and got ready to stand him off. But I didn't need to, not then. Three of the others piled on him, like dogs on a bear, and held him down. Huey's friend was at my side when I turned. How come, he said, who are you planning on calling? I said I wanted to help you, I told him. I meant it. Of course, he said smoothly. Why should I believe it? I know the spot you're in, and I he didn't give me a chance to finish. Now you wait a minute, he said, and don't touch that box. We've got some talking to do. Such as? Such as how you managed to get here from Ankata and why, he said. Such as what all this talk about helping us means and what the radio's for. Lots of talking. I decided it was time to show some more independence. I don't talk to people I don't know, I said. He looked me up and down, taking his time about it. Huey had quietened down some, and our conversation was the main attraction. In the end, he shrugged. I suppose you can't do any harm, not so long as we keep an eye on that box of yours, he said. He gave me his name as if it didn't matter. I'm Hollerith, he said. General Rawlinson Hollerith. I gave him the prepared story automatically. It rolled out, but I wasn't thinking about it. He'd given me my first real surprise. I thought Hollerith had been killed at Andrew's farm, and as far as I knew, so did the government. Instead, here he was, alive and kicking, doing a pretty good job of working with a guerrilla gang. I wondered who Huey would turn out to be, but it didn't seem like the time to ask. The story, of course, was a good one. Naturally, it wasn't proof of anything, or even susceptible of proof right then and there. It wasn't meant to be. I didn't expect them to buy it sight unseen, but I'd planned it to give me some time until I could start the next step. James Carson, I told Hollerith, was a reasonably big wheel around Ankata. He wasn't in sympathy with the government, but he hadn't fought in the revolutionary armies or been active in any overt way. Why not? He snapped at me. I was more valuable where I stood, I said. There's a lot that can be done with paperwork in the way of sabotage. He nodded. I see, he said. I see what you mean. I worked in one of the government departments, I said. That enabled me to pass information on to sergeant's men in the vicinity. It also gave me a good spot for mixing up orders and shipments. He nodded again. That's one of the advantages of a guerrilla outfit, he said. The administration end doesn't really exist. We can live off the country. I should think that over an area as large as we can range on Wolin, we can't be wiped out. Of course, that was only his opinion, but I wasn't easy about it. The sight of him had shaken me quite a bit, and I began to think I'd have to get rid of him. That would be unpleasant and dangerous, I told myself, but there didn't seem to be any help for it at the moment. About information, he said, you were closely watched. Anyone working for the government would have had to have been. How did he get your information out? I nodded towards the radio. It's not a normal call radio, I said with perfect truth. Its operation is indetectable by the normal methods. I'm not an expert, so I won't go into technical details. It's enough that the radio works. Then why come to us? Hallrith said. Aren't there guerrillas in the Ankata vicinity for you to work with? I shook my head. Only a few more or less uh, disaffected minorities, I said. That was true too. They raised hell for a day or so and then walked in and surrendered. The guerrilla network on the entire planet, sir, is under your command. He shook his head. It's not my command, he said. This is a democracy. You met Huey, my orderly in the old days, but now he has as much voice as I have, except for expert matters. Crackpots. But I listened. Democracy was the basis of their group. Every move was voted on by the entire band wherever possible. We're not a dictatorship, Hallred said. We don't intend to become one. It was nice to hear that. It meant that maybe I wouldn't have to get rid of him after all. Anyway, I said, your men appear to be the only ones active on Sergeant's behalf. He took it without flinching. Then we need help, he said. Can you provide it? I can get you guns, I said, volunteers, supplies. There was a little pause. Who do you think you are? Hollerith said, God? I didn't tell him that from his point of view, I was inhabiting the other half of the theological universe. Somehow, it didn't seem necessary. The men started to arrive in a week, some of them carrying supplies and armaments for all the rest. Hollerith was beside himself with joy, and even Huey stopped looking at me with suspicion. In the meantime, 
I'd been living with the gorillas, eating and sleeping with them, but I hadn't been exactly trusted. There'd been a picked group of men set to watch over me at all times, and I managed to get a little friendly with them, but not very. In case I turned out to be a louse, nobody wanted to have to shed tears over my unmarked grave. Until the men arrived, there weren't any raids. Hollerith very sensibly wanted to wait for my reinforcements, and he carried most of the group with him. Huey was all for killing me and for getting on with normal operations. I don't think he had any real faith in me, even after the reinforcements began to arrive. I'd made the call on my radio in Hollerith's hearing. I'd asked for 150 men, a force just a bit larger than the entire band Hollerith had commanded until then, 300 heaters with ammunition and supplies to match, a couple of large guns throwing explosive shells, and some dynamite. I added the dynamite because it sounded like the sort of thing gorillas ought to have, and Hollerith didn't seem to mind. On his instructions, I gave them a safe route to come by, assuming they started near New Didymus. Actually, of course, some of my co-brothers were recruiting on other parts of the planet, and the government had been fully instructed not to hold any of them up. I won't say that President Santa Claus understood what I was doing, but he trusted me. He had faith, which was handy. Hollerith was overjoyed when the reinforcements did arrive. Now we can really begin to work, he told me. Now we can begin to fight back in a big way. No more of the sneaking around, doing fiddling little jobs. He wanted to start at once. I nearly laughed in his face. It was now established that I didn't have to get rid of the man. If he decided to delay on the big attack, but he hadn't. So, of course, I helped him draw up some plans. Good ones, too. The best I could come up with. The very best. The trouble, Hollerith told me sadly a day or so later, is going to be convincing the others. They want to do something dramatic, blowing up the planet, most likely. I said I didn't think they had planned to go that far, and anyhow, I had an idea that might help. You want to take the Army Armaments Depot near New Didymus, I said. That would serve as a good show of strength and weaken any reprisals while we get ready to move again. Of course, he said. Then think of all the fireworks you'll get, I said. Bombs going off, heaters exploding, stacks of arms all going off at once, the 4th of July, the 14th and Guy Fawkes Day, all at once, with a small touch of Armageddon for flavor, not to mention the Chinese New Year. But sell it that way, I said, the drama, the great picture, the excitement, that, believe me, they'll buy. He frowned while he thought it over. Then the frown turned into a grin. By God, he said, they might. And they did. The conference and the election were both pretty stormy. All the new patriots were off to blow up the government buildings one after another, even more enthusiastic than the original members. It was only natural. My instructions to the recruiters had been to pick the most violent, frothing, anti-government men they could find to send out, and that was what we got. But Hollerith gave them a talk, and the vote when it came was overwhelmingly in favor of his plan. Even Huey was enthusiastic. He came up to me after the meeting and pounded me on the back. I suppose it was meant for friendship, though it felt more like sabotage. Hey, I thought you were no good, he said. I thought you were, oh, you know, some kind of spy. I know, I said. Well, mister, he said, believe me, I was wrong. He pounded some more. I tried to look as if I liked it, or anyway, as if I could put up with it. You're okay, mister, he said. You're okay. Some day, I told myself, I was going to get Huey all to myself away in a dark alley somewhere. There didn't seem to be much chance of keeping the promise, but I made it to myself anyway and moved away. The meeting had set the attack for three days ahead, which was a moral victory for Hollerith, and the men were all for making it in the next five minutes. But he said we needed time. It's a good thing I told myself he didn't say what he needed it for. Because in a few hours, right after sunrise the next morning, training started, and Hollerith had his hands full of trouble. The new men didn't see the sense in it. Hell, one of them complained. All we gotta do is go up and toss a bomb into the place. We don't like all this fooling around first. The fooling around involved jungle training, how to walk quietly, how to avoid getting slashed by a wine, and so forth. It also involved forming two separate attack groups for Hollerith's plans. That meant drilling the groups to move separately and drilling each group to stay together. 
and there were other details, how to fire a heater from the third rank without incinerating a comrade in the first rank, signal spotting in case of emergency and sudden changes of plans, the use of dynamite, its care and feeding, picking targets, and so forth and so forth. Hollerith's three days seemed pretty short when he thought about what they had to cover. But the new men didn't like it. They wanted action. That's what we signed on for, they said. Not all this drill. Hell, we ain't an army. We are guerrillas. The older hands and the most sensible members of the band tried their best to talk the new men into line. Some of the officers tried ordering them into line, but the talk was ignored, and as for the officers, well, the old United States Civil War tried a democratic army for a while on both sides. Unfortunately, electing your officers is not an efficient way to run things. The most popular man makes the best officer about as often as the most popular man makes the best criminal law judge or engineer for that matter. War's not a democratic business. This one, however, seemed to be. Mass election of officers was one of the rules, along with the voting on staff decisions. The new men outnumbered the older hands. New officers were elected, and that stopped the orders. Hollerith was about two-thirds of the way out of his mind when the three days were up and the attack time came around. When night fell, the atmosphere around the cave was as tense as it could get without turning into actual lightning. It was a warm, still night. The single moon was quarter full, but it shed a lot more light than Earth's moon. We blacked ourselves and Hollerith went over the plan. We were still divided into two groups, ragged groups, but groups. The first wave was to come around on the depot from the left, attacking in full force with all armaments and some of that dynamite. When things were getting towards a peak in that direction, the second group was to come in from the right and set off its own fireworks. Result? Hallrith hoped. Demolition, confusion, catastrophe. It was a good plan. Hallrith obviously wasn't sure of his own men anymore, and neither would I have been in his spot. But he had the advantage of surprise and superior arms. He was clearly hoping that would overbalance the lack of discipline, training and order in his force. Besides, there was nothing else he could do. He was outvoted all the way down the line. I set out with hardly a qualm along with the second attack group. We were under the command of a shy, tall man with spectacles who didn't look like much. He'd been a trapper before the war though and was one of the original guerrillas for a wonder and that meant he was probably a hell of a lot tougher and more knowledgeable than he seemed. Setting traps for Wolin's animals, for instance, was emphatically not a job for the puny or the frightened. The first group was under Huey's command. Hollerith stayed with a small group of his own as a reserve. Actually, he wanted to oversee the battle and the men were perfectly willing to let him, having gotten one idea into their democratic heads. Hollerith was too valuable a man for the guerrillas to lose. But I wasn't, of course. I'd done my bit. I'd gotten the volunteers. Now I could go and die for glory like the rest of them. The trouble was I couldn't see any way out. I marched in the dimness with the rest and we managed to make surprisingly little noise. Wolin's animals were active and stirring anyhow, and that helped. At last the depot showed up in the moonlight with the city some distance behind it. There was a wire fence and a sentry. Immediately in view behind him were square blocky buildings in a clearing. Beyond that, there was another fence, then some more jungle, and then the city. Fifty yards from the fence, in the last screen of trees, we stopped and waited. The first group was off to the other side of the fence, and I couldn't see or hear them. The wait seemed to go on for hours. Perhaps a minute and a half passed, then the first heater went off. The sentry whirled and fired without really thinking. There wasn't any way for him to tell what he was shooting at. Mojitas went off from the jungle, and then they started to come in. There was a lot of noise. The boys were yelling, swarming over the wire fence and through it, firing heaters wildly. There were lights in the building now, and a picked group of men came out of one of them, swinging in single file. The heaters chopped them to pieces before they had much of a chance. A tower light went on, and then the really big guns got going. The guerrillas started to get it then. The big boys from the armament tower charred holes in their line and the noise got worse. Men were screaming and cursing and dying and the heaters were still going off. I tore my eyes away and looked at the leader of our group. 
He was poised on the balls of his feet, leaning forward. He stayed that way, his head nodding very slowly up and down for a full second. Then he shouted and lifted an arm, and we followed him, a screaming mob down into hell. The big guns were swiveled the other way, and for a couple of seconds we had no trouble. Our boys weren't playing with heaters too much. Instead, the dynamite started to fly. Light the fuse, pick it up and heave. Then stand back and watch. Fireworks! Excitement! Well, it was what they wanted, wasn't it? There was an explosion as a small bundle landed inside the fence in a courtyard. Then another one, the flashes lighting up faces and bodies in motion. I found myself screaming with the rest of them. Then the big one went off. One of the dynamite bundles had hit the right spot. Ammunition went off with a dull boom that shook the ground, and the light was too bright to look into. I went flat, and so did the others. I wondered about solid shells exploding and going wild, but there weren't any. The light faded, and then it began to grow again. I put my head up and saw flames. Then I got up and saw the others rising too. I turned tail for the jungle. Some of them followed me along with some of the first group. Order was lost entirely, and we were no more than pieces of a shrieking, delirious, victorious mob. I headed back for the base. Behind me, the ammunition depot burnt brightly. The raid was over. It had been an unqualified success, of course. The guerrillas had done the best job of their careers, so far. Holrith was back in the cave before me. Put it down to a shortcut or just more practice in the jungle. When I came in, he looked terrible, about a hundred and twelve years old and shrunken. But my appearance seemed to rouse him a little. He gestured, and the others in the cave, three or four of them, went out. One stood at the entrance. There was a silence. Holrith grimaced at me. You're working for the government, he said. It wasn't a question. I shook my head. I keep it, he said. James Carson from Ankata is a cover identity, that's all. I tell you, I know. He didn't look ready to pull a heater. I waited a second. The silence got louder. Then I said, All right, how do you know? The grimace again, twisted and half humorous. Why? Because you got me recruits, he said. Because you got me armaments. Because you helped me. Doesn't make sense, I said. Doesn't it? He turned away from me for a second. When he turned back, he looked more like General Rawlinson Holrith and less like a corpse. You got me fanatics, men who hated the government. Well? They don't think straight, he said. There isn't room in their minds for any more than that hatred. And they're democratic, just like the rest of us. They vote. You set that up, I said. I had nothing to do with it. He nodded. I know, he said. There are places where democracy just doesn't work, like an armed force. As long as most of the members think alike, you're all right. But when a new factor comes into the picture, why, nobody knows what he's voting for. It becomes a matter of personal preference, which is no way to run a war. All right, I said, but I got you the men and their arms. Sure you did, he said. You got me everything I needed to hang myself with. He raised a hand. I'm not saying you worked against me. You didn't have to. I got you everything you wanted, I said. Sure, he said. Did you ever hear of jujutsu? I... You used my strength against me, he said. You got me what I wanted and did it in such a way that it would ruin me. But the attack was a success, I said. He shook his head. How many men are going to come back? He said. Fifty? Sixty? How many of them are going to get lost out there, return to the city, try to go up against new Didymus with a heater and nothing else? How many of them have had all the excitement they want? Those are going to head for home. A success? He paused. I waited. There was a general in Greece in the ancient days, he said, a general named Pyrrhus. He won a battle once and lost most of his men doing it. For my part, he said, another victory like this and we are undone. That's the kind of success we had. Hollerith had brains. A Pyrrhic victory, I said. And you know all about it, he said. You planned it this way. I shrugged. By doing what you wanted done, I said. He nodded very slowly. What now? I said quietly. He acted for a second as if he didn't hear me. Then he spoke. Now, he said, we go back. Democracy, it's a limited tool like anything else. No tool is so good that it can be used in every case on every problem. We were wrong. We'd better admit it and go back. But your men? The good ones know the truth now, he said, just as I do. 
The others, there's nothing else they can do without me and without the rest of the force. I took a deep breath. It was all over. And now, he said suddenly, I want you to tell me just who you are. I, not James Carson, he said, and not from Ankata, not even from Wolin. How do you know, I said. Nobody on this planet, he said, would do this job in just this way. I'm familiar enough with the top men to be sure of that. You're from the committee. That's right, I said. But who are you? What force? What army? No army, I said. You might call me a teacher. My corps is made up of teachers. We give lessons where lessons are needed. A teacher, he said quietly. A long time passed. Well, he asked, do I pass the course? You pass, I told him. You pass with high marks, General. I was off planet within 24 hours. Not that Santa Claus didn't want me to stay longer when I told him what had happened. Hell, he wanted to throw a banquet and 16 speeches in my honor. I was a holy idol all over again. I was superhuman. I was glad to get away. What makes them think a man special just because he uses his brain once in a while? The End End of The Man Who Played to Lose by Larry M. Harris Recording by Gabriel Glenn in San Francisco by John Michael Sharkey. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Frank Malanga. Minor Detail by John Michael Sharkey. The Secretary of Defense, flown in by special plane from the new Capitol building in Denver, trotted down the ramp with his right hand outstretched before him. At the base of the ramp, his hand was touched, clutched, and hidden by the right hand of General Smiley Webb in a hearty parody of a casual handshake. General Webb did everything in a big way, and that included even little things like handshakes. Retrieving his hand once more, James Whitlow, the Secretary of Defense, smiled nervously with his tiny mouth and said, Well, here I am. This statement was taken down by a hovering circle of news reporters, dispatched by wireless and telephone to every town in the 49 states, expanded, contracted, quoted and misquoted, ignored and misconstrued, and then forgotten. All this in a matter of hours. The nation hearing it put aside its wanted trepidations, took an extra tranquilizer or two, and felt secure once more. The government was in good hands. Leaving the reporters in a disgruntled group beyond the cyclone fence and barbed wire barriers surrounding Project W, General Webb, seated beside Whitlow in the back of his private car, sighed and folded his arms. You'd be amazed, he chortled, nudging his companion with a bony elbow. I expect so, said Whitlow, clinging to his briefcase with both hands. It contained, among other things, a volume of mystery stories and a ham sandwich neatly packaged in aluminum foil. Whitlow didn't want a chance losing it, not at least until he'd eaten the sandwich. Of course you're wondering where I got the idea for my project, said Smiley Webb, adding, for the benefit of his driver, keep your eyes on the road, Sergeant. The whack barracks will still be there when you get off duty. Yes, sir, came a hollow grunt from the front seat. Weren't you? asked General Webb, gleaming a toothy smile in Whitlow's direction. Weren't I what? Whitlow asked miserably, having lost the thread of their conversation due to a surreptitious glance backward at the whack barracks in their wake. Wondering about the project, snapped the general. Yes, we all were, said the Secretary of Defense, appending somewhat tartly. That's why they sent me here. To be sure, to be sure, General Webb muttered. He didn't much like tartness in responses. But the Secretary of Defense, unfortunately, was hardly a subordinate, and therefore not subject to the General's collar. Silly little ass, he said to himself. Rather liking the sound of the words, albeit in his mind, he repeated them over again, adding embellishments like pompous and mousy and squirrel-eyed. After three or four such thoughts, the General felt much better. I thought the whole thing up myself he said proudly. 
I wish you'd stop being so ambiguous, Whitlow protested in a small voice. Just what is this project? How does it work? Will it help us win the war? Shh, said the general, jerking a quivering forefinger perpendicular before pursed lips. Security. He closed one eye in a broad wink and wriggled a thumb in the direction of the driver. He's only cleared for confidential material, said the general, his tone casting aspersions on the sergeant's patriotism, ancestry, and personal hygiene. This project is, of course, top secret. He said the words reverently, his face going all noble and brave. Whitlow half expected him to remove his hat, but he did not. They drove onward then in silence, until they passed by a large field, in the center of which Whitlow could discern the outlines of an immense bull's eye in front of a tall, somewhat rickety, khaki-covered reviewing stand draped in tired bunting. What's that? asked Whitlow, relinquishing his grip on his briefcase long enough to point toward the field. Shh, said Smiley Webb. You'll find out in a matter of hours. Many hours? Whitlow asked, thinking of the ham sandwich. General Webb consulted a magnificent platinum timepiece anchored to his thick hairy wrist by a stout leather strap. In exactly one hour, thirty-seven minutes, and forty-three point oh oh nine seconds, he said proudly. Thank you, Whitlow sighed. You're certainly running this thing, whatever it is, in an efficient manner. Thank you, General Webb glowed. We like to think so, he added modestly. Password signs, countersigns, combination locks, and electronic recognition signals were negotiated one by one, until Whitlow was despairing of ever getting into the heart of Project W. He said as much to General Webb, who merely flashed the grin which gave him his nickname and opened the final door. For a moment, Whitlow thought he was going deaf. The shrill roar of screeching metal and throbbing dynamos that pounded at his eardrums began to fuddle his mind until General Webb handed him a small cardboard box, also stamped, like every door and wall in the place, top secret, in which his trembling fingers located two ordinary rubber earplugs, which he instantly put to good use. There she is, said General Webb proudly, gesturing over the railing of the small balcony upon which they stood. The Whirligig. What? called Secretary of Defense Whitlow, shaking his head to indicate he hadn't heard a word. Somewhat piqued, but resigned, General Webb leaned his wide mouth nearly up against Whitlow's small pink-plugged ear and roared the same information at the top of his lungs. Whitlow, a little stunned by the volume despite the plugs, nodded wearily to indicate that he'd heard, then asked in a high piping voice, What's it for? Webb's eyes bulged in their sockets. Great heavens, man, can't you see? He gestured down at his creation, his baby, his project, as though it were self-evident what its function was. Whitlow strained his eyes to define anything that might give a clue as to just what the government had been pouring money into for the past eight months. All he saw was what appeared to be a sort of Ferris wheel, except that it was revolving in a horizontal plane. The structure was completely enclosed in metal, and was whirling too fast for even the central shaft to be anything but a hazy, silver-blue blur. I see it, he shouted squeakily, but I don't understand it. Come with me, said General Webb, reopening the door at their backs. He was just about to step through when, with a quick blush of mortification, he remembered the top-secret earplugs. Hastily, averting his face lest the other man see his embarrassment, he returned his plugs to their box and did the same with Whitlow's. Whitlow was glad when the door closed behind them. My office is this way, said Webb, striding off in his stiff military manner. Whitlow, with a forlorn shrug, could do nothing but clutch his briefcase and follow. It's this way, General Webb began once they were seated uncomfortably in his office. From a pocket in his khaki jacket, Webb had produced a big, bold calabash pipe and was puffing its noxious gray fumes in all directions while he spoke. Up until the late fifties, war was a simple thing. Oh, not the march of science speech, said Whitlow to himself. He knew it by heart. It was the talk of the capital and the nightmare of military strategists. 
as the general's voice droned on and on, Whitlow barely listened. The general, top secret or no top secret, was divulging nothing that wasn't common knowledge from the ruins of Philadelphia to the great Hollywood crater. All at once, weapons had gotten too good. That was the whole problem. Wars, no matter what the abilities of death-dealing guns, cannon, rifles, rockets, or whatever, needed one thing on the battlefield that could not be turned out in a factory. Men. In order to win a war, a country must be vanquished. In order to vanquish a country, soldiers must be landed. And that was precisely wherein the difficulty lay, landing the soldiers. Ships were nearly obsolete in this respect. Landing barges could be blown out of the water as fast as they were let down into it. Paratroops were likewise hopeless. The slow-moving, troop-carrying planes daren't even peek above the enemy's horizon without chancing an onslaught of thinking rockets that would stay on their trail until they were molten cinders falling into the sea. So someone invented the supersonic carrier. That was pretty good, allowing the planes to come in high and fast over the enemy's territory, as fast as the land-to-air missiles themselves. The only drawback was that the first men to try parachuting at that speed were battered to confetti by the slipstream of their own carriers. That would not do. Next, someone thought of the capsules. Each man was packed into a breakproof, shockproof, waterproof, windproof plastic capsule and ejected safely beyond the slipstream area of the carriers, at which point each capsule sprouted a silken chute that lowered the enclosed man gently down into the range of the enemy's rocket fire. This plan was scrapped like the others. And so things were at a stalemate. There hadn't been a really good skirmish for nearly five years. War was hardly anything but a memory, what with both sides practically omnipotent. Unless troops could be landed, war was downright impossible. And no one could land troops. So there was no war. As a matter of fact, Whitlow liked the state of affairs. To be Secretary of Defense during a years-long peace was a soft job to top all soft jobs. And Whitlow didn't much like war. He'd rather live peacefully with his mystery stories and ham sandwiches. But the capital, under the relentless lobbying of the munitions interests, was trying to find a way to get a war started. They had tried simply bombing the other countries, but it hadn't worked out too well. The other countries had bombed back. This plan had been scrapped as too dangerous. And then, just when all seemed lost, when it looked as though mankind was doomed to eternal peace, along came General Smiley Webb. Land troops, he said confidently, nothing easier. With the government's cooperation, I can have our troops in any country in the world safely landed within the space of one year. Congress had voted him the money unanimously, and off he'd gone to work at Project W. No one knew quite what it was about, but the general had seemed so self-assured. Well, they'd almost forgotten about him, until some ambitious clerk, trying to balance at least part of the budget, had discovered a monthly expenditure to an obscure base in the Southwest totaling some millions of dollars. Perfunctory checking had brought out the fact that Smiley Webb had been drawing this money every month and hadn't as much as mailed in a single progress report. There had been swift phone calls from Denver to Project W, and General Webb informed them not only was all the money to be accounted for, but so was all the time and effort. The project was completed and about to be tested. Would someone like to come down and watch? Someone would. And thus it was that James Whitlow, with mystery stories and ham sandwich, had taken the first plane from the capital. When all at once I thought, speed, endurance, that is the problem, said Webb, breaking in on Whitlow's reverie. I beg your pardon, said the Secretary of Defense. Webb whacked the dottle out of his pipe into a meaty palm, tossed the smoking cinders rather carelessly into a wastebasket, and leaned forward to confront the other man face to face, their noses almost nudging. Why are parachutes out? he snapped. They go too slow, said Whitlow. Why do we use parachutes at all? 
to keep the men from getting killed by the fall. Why does a fall kill the men? It, it breaks their bones and stuff? Bah! Webb scoffed. Bah? reiterated Whitlow. Bah? Certainly bah, said the general. All it takes is a little training. All what takes? said Whitlow, helplessly. Falling, man, falling, the general boomed. If a man can fall safely from ten feet, why not from ten times ten feet? Because, said Whitlow, increasing height accelerates the rate of falling, and... Poppycock, the general roared. Yes, sir, said Whitlow, somewhat cowed. Muscle building, that's the secret. Endurance, stress, strain, tension. If you say so, said Whitlow, slumping lower and lower in his chair as the general's massive form leaned precariously over him. But... Of course you are puzzled, said the general, suddenly chummy. Anyone would be, until they realize the use to which I put the whirlyjig. Yes, yes, I suppose so, said Whitlow, thinking longingly of his ham sandwich and its crunchy, moist green smear of pickle relish. The first day, said General Webb, it revolved at one gravity. They withstood it. What did? Who withstood? When? asked Whitlow with much confusion. The men, said the general irritably. The men in the whirlyjig. Whitlow jerked Bolt upright. There are men in that thing? It's not possible, he thought. Of course, said Webb soothingly. But they're all right. They've been in there for thirty days, whirling around at one gravity more each day. We have constant telephone communication with them. They're all feeling fine, just fine. But, Whitlow said weakly, General Webb had him firmly by the arm and was leading him out of the office. We must get to the stands, man. Operation Human Bomb in ten minutes. Bomb? Whitlow squeaked, scurrying alongside Webb as the larger man strode down the echoing corridor. A euphemism, of course, said Webb. Because they fall much like a bomb does. But they will not explode. No, they will land, rifles in hand, ready to take over the enemy territory. Without parachutes? Whitlow marveled. Exactly, said the general, leading the way out into the blinding desert sunlight. You see, he remarked as they strolled toward the heat-shimmering outlines of the reviewing stand, its bunting hanging limp and faded in the dry, breezeless air. It's really so simple I'm astonished the enemy didn't think of it first. Though, of course, I'm glad they didn't. Ha ha! He oozed self-appreciation. Ha ha! repeated Whitlow with little enthusiasm. When one is whirled at one gravity, you see, the wall, the outside rim of the whirligig, becomes the floor for the men inside. Each day they have spent up to ten hours doing nothing but deep knee bends and eating high-protein foods. Their legs will be able to withstand any force of landing. If they can do deep knee bends at thirty gravities, during which, of course, each of them weighed nearly three tons, they can jump from any height and survive. Good, huh? Whitlow was worried as they clambered up into the stands. There seemed to be no one about but the two of them. Who else is coming? he asked. Just us, said Webb. I'm the only one with a clearance high enough to watch this. And you're only here because you're my guest. But, said Whitlow, observing the heat-baked, wide-open spaces extending on all sides of the reviewing stand and bullseye, the men on this base can surely watch from almost anywhere not beyond the horizon. They'd better not, was the general's only comment. Well, said Whitlow, what happens now? The men that were in that whirligig have, since you and I went to my office to chat, been transported to the airfield, from which point they were taken aloft, he consulted his watch. Five minutes and fifty-five point six seconds ago. And, asked Whitlow, casually unbuckling the straps of his briefcase and slipping out his sandwich. The plane will be within bomb vector of this target in just ten seconds, said Webb confidently. Whitlow listened for the next nine seconds, and then, right on schedule, he heard the muted droning of a plane high up. Webb joggled him with an elbow. They'll fall faster than any known enemy weapon can track them, he said smugly. That's fortunate, said Whitlow, munching delsatorily at his sandwich. But there's one thing bothers me. Hmm? 
asked the general. Whitlow swallowed hastily. I say, there's one thing bothers me. What's that? asked the general. Well, it's just that gravity is centripetal, you know, and the whirligig is centrifugal. I wondered if it might not make some sort of difference. Bah, said General Webb. Just a minor detail. If you say so, Whitlow shrugged. There they come, shouted the general, jumping to his feet. Whitlow, despite his misgivings, found that he too was on his feet, staring skyward at the tiny dots that were detaching themselves from the shining bulk of the carrier plane. As he watched, his heart beating madly, the dots grew bigger, and soon, awfully soon, they could be distinguished as man-shaped, too. There's, there's something wrong, said the general. What's that they're all shouting? It should be Geronimo. Whitlow listened. It sounds more like, yeah, he said. And it was. The sound grew from a distant mumble to a shrieking roar. And the next thing, each man had landed upon the concrete and paint bullseye before the reviewing stand. Whitlow sighed and rebuckled his briefcase. The general moaned and fainted. And the men of the Whirligig, all of whom had landed on the target, head first, did nothing. Their magnificently muscled legs waving idly in a sudden gentle gust of desert breeze. End of Minor Detail by John Michael Sharkey Recording by Frank Malanga, Waterbury, Connecticut by Forrest J. Ackerman. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Out of This World Convention by Forrest J. Ackerman I was a spy for the FBI, the Fantasy Bureau of Investigation. Learning of a monster meeting of science fiction, Fen in New York, I teleported myself 3,000 miles from the Pacific coast to check the facts on the monsters, and it was true. The 14th World Sci-Fi Con was tremonstrous. In all seriousness, the New York Con was one of the greatest aggregations of SF enthusiasts I have ever seen. A far cry from the Nikon the first World SF Con of 17 years before, when the turnout of 125 was considered colossal. Now more than 1,200 fans, authors, editors, artists, publishers, agents, anthologists, reviewers, and readers of science fiction and fantasy registered for the Labor Day weekend, gathering of the clans, a conclave of the slans. From 37 of the 48 states they came, and from Canada, Cuba, England, Germany, India, Israel, and the West Indies, the roll call of celebrities read like the who's who of SF Prodom. Theodore Sturgeon, Isaac Asimov, Fritz Leiber, Willie Lay, Nelson Bond, John W. Campbell Jr., El Sprague de Camp, James Blish, Judith Morrell, Ted Carnell, editor of The New Worlds, Kelly Freeze, Edmund Hamilton, Leigh Brackett, Anthony Boucher, William Ten, James E. Gunn, Frank Belknap Long Jr., and numerous others, including guests of honor Arthur C. Clarke. A standing ovation was given Arthur Clarke before and after his speech at the banquet, a serious address that lasted 45 minutes and covered many philosophical facets of the SF field. Especially rousing hands were given two of the real old-timers present artist Frank R. Rawl, guest of honor of the first convention. And out of the ark, the man who once was an assistant to Thomas Alva Edison, the pioneer novelist of scientific romances and the man who discovered the golden atom, Ray Cummings. World-famous cartoonist Al Cap gave a hilarious speech at the banquet Sunday night, other large laughs being garnered on the occasion by Isaac Asimov and Anthony Boucher, Robert Bloch, again proving that he has no peer as a master of ceremonies. The masquerade ball was filmed for televising, and was a sight for bugging eyes. Extraterrestrial glamour girls came in spectramic colors. One, Ruth Landis of Venus, formerly Nyoke, 
was of ardent beauty, fresh as a breath of chlorophyll, while tall Tam Otson, a recent import from England, had the judges agreeing that just looking at her was an education. Olga lay one for the most beautiful costume, and Joss Kristoff, a survivor from the first convention of them all, was another prize winner. Monsters, mutants, scientists, spacemen, aliens, assorted things, thronged the ballroom floor as the flashbulbs popped. John Campbell lectured on and demonstrated his controversial Pisonic Hieronismus machine, and famous fans sprang out from Nervwood workout. Sam Moskowitz, James Teresai, Bob Tucker, Julius Unger, Raymond Van Houten, Alan Glasser, David Kyle, E. E. Evans, James Terusai, myself, and two others were elected directors of the World Science Fiction Society. No account of the New Yorkon could be complete without a deep bow of appreciation to the altruistic trio of committeemen, including one comely woman, who all but destroyed themselves engineering the convention, David A. Kyle, Ruth Landis, and Dick Ellington. By a vote of three to one, London was selected as the site of the 15th con to be held in 57, for an unforgettable experience in the fantastic universe of science fiction, enthusiasts, plan now to attend the long con. End of Out of This World Convention Passenger by Kenneth Harmon. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reading by Bologna Times. The Passenger by Kenneth Harmon. The classic route to a man's heart is through his stomach, and she was just his dish. The transport swung past Centaurus on the last leg of her long journey to Seoul. There was no flash, no roar, as she swept across the darkness of space. As silent as a ghost, as quiet as a puff of moonlight, she moved, riding the gravitational fields that spread like tangled, invisible spider webs between the stars. Within the ship there was also silence, but the air was stirred by a faint, persistent vibration from the field generators. The noiseless pulse stole into every corner of the ship, through long, empty passageways lined with closed stateroom doors, up spiraling stairways to the bridge and navigational decks, and down into vast and echoing holds, filled with strange cargo from distant worlds. This vibration pulsed through Lenore's stateroom. As she relaxed on her couch, she bathed in it, letting it throw through her to tingle in her fingertips and whisper behind her closed eyelids. Home, it pulsed. You're going home. She repeated the word to herself, moving her lips softly, but making no sound. Home, she breathed. Back home, to Earth. Back to the proud old planet that was always home, no matter how far you wandered under alien suns back to the shining cities clustered along blue sea-coasts, back to the golden greenlands of the central states and the high blue grandeur of the western mountains, and back to the myriad tiny things that she remembered best, the little friendly things, a stretch of maple-shadowed streets, heavy and still with the heat of a summer noon, a flurry of pigeons in the courthouse square, yellow dandelions in a green lawn, the whir of a lawnmower, and the smell of the cut grass, ivy on old bricks, and the rough feel of oak bark under her hands, water lilies and watermelons and crepe papery dances, and picnics by the river in the summer dusk, and the library steps in the evening, with fireflies in the cool grass, and the school chimes sounding the slow hours through the friendly dark. She thought to herself, It's been such a long time since you were home. There will be a whole new flock of pigeons now. She smiled at the recollection of the eager, awkward girl of twenty that she had been when she had finished school, and had entered the government education service traveling while helping others had been the motto 
of the GES. She had traveled, all right, a long, long way inside a rusty freighter without a single porthole to a planet out on the rim of the galaxy that was as barren and dreary as a cosmic slag heap. Five years on the rock pile, five years of knocking yourself out trying to explain history and Shakespeare and geometry to a bunch of grubby little miners kids in a tin schoolhouse at the edge of a cluster of tin shacks that was supposed to be a town. Five years of trudging around with your nails worn and dirty and your hair chopped short, of wearing the latest thing in overalls. Five years of not talking with the young miners because they got in trouble with the foreman, and not talking with the crewmen from the ore freighters because they got in trouble with the first mate, and not talking with yourself because you got in trouble with the psychologist. They took care of you in the education service. They guarded your diet and your virtue, your body and your mind, everything but your happiness. There was lots to do, of course. You could prepare lessons and read papers and cheap novels in the miner's library, or nail some more tin on your quarters to keep out the wind and the dust and the little animals. You could go walking to the edge of town and look at all the pretty gray stones and the trees like squashed down barrel cactus, watch the larger sun sink behind the horizon with its little companion star circling around it, diving out of sight to the right and popping up again on the left. And Saturday night, yippee! Three-year-old movies in the tin hangar. And after five years, they come and say, Here's Miss So-and-so, your relief and here's your five thousand credits and wouldn't you like to sign up for another term ha so they give you your ticket back to earth you're on the transport at last and who can blame you if you act just a little crazy and eat like a pig and take baths three times a day and lie around your stateroom and just dream about getting home and waking up in your own room in the morning and getting a good cup of real coffee at the corner fountain and kissing some handsome young fellow on the library steps when the moon is full behind the bell tower? And will the young fellow like you? she asked herself, knowing the answer even as she asked the question. She whirled about in the middle of the stateroom, her robe swirling around her, and ended with a deep curtsy to the full-length mirror. Allow me to introduce myself, she murmured. Lenore Smithson, formerly of the government education service, just back from business out on the rim. What? Why, of course you may have this dance. Your name? Mr. Fairheart, of the billionaire Fairhearts? She waltzed with herself a moment. Halting before the mirror again, she surveyed herself critically. Well, she said aloud, the five years didn't completely ruin you, after all. Your nose still turns up, and your cheeks still dimple when you smile. You have a nice tan, and your hair's grown long again. Concentrated food hasn't hurt your figure, either. She turned this way and that before the mirror to observe herself. Then, suddenly, she gave a little gasp of surprise and fright, for a cascade of laughter had flooded soundlessly inside her head. She stood frozen before the mirror while the laughter continued. Then she slowly swung around. It ceased abruptly. She looked around the compartment, staring accusingly at each article of furniture in turn, then quickly spun around to look behind her, meeting her own startled gaze in the mirror. Opening the door slowly, she ventured to thrust her head out into the corridor. It was deserted the long rows of doors all closed during the afternoon rest period. As she stood there, a steward came along the corridor with a tray of glasses, nodded to her, and passed on out of sight. She turned back into the room and stood there, leaning against the door, listening. Suddenly the laughter came back again, bursting out as though it had been suppressed and could be held back no longer. Clear merry, ringing, and completely soundless, it poured through her mind. "'What is it?' 
she cried aloud. What's happening? My dear young lady, said a man's voice within her head, allow me to introduce myself. My name is Fairheart, of the billionaire Fairhearts. May I have the next dance? This is it, she thought. Five years on the rock pile would do it to anyone. You've gone mad. She laughed shakily. I can't dance with you if I can't see you. I really should explain, the voice replied, and apologize for my silly joke. It was frightfully rude to laugh at you, but when I saw you waltzing and preening yourself, I just couldn't help it. I'm a telepath, you see, from Decker's star out on the rim. That would explain, she thought, his slightly stilted phraseology. English was apparently not his native tongue, or rather his native thought. There was a mild mutation among the settlers there, and the third generation all have this ability. I shouldn't use it, I know, but I've been so lonely, confined here to my room, that I cast around to see if there were anyone that I could talk to. Then I came upon you, considering your own virtues, and you were so cute and funny that I couldn't resist. Then I laughed, and you caught me. I've heard of telepaths, she said doubtfully, though I've never heard of Decker's star. However, I don't think you have any right to go thinking around the ship spying on people. Shh, whispered the silent voice. You needn't shout. I'll go away if you wish and never spy on you again. But don't tell Captain Blake, or he'll have me sealed in a lead-lined cell or something. We're not supposed to telepath around others. But I've been sitting here with all sorts of interesting thoughts, just tickling the edges of my mind for so long that I had to go exploring. Why not go exploring on your own two feet like anyone else? Have you so much brains, your head's too heavy to carry? Unfortunately, the voice mourned, my trouble is in my foot and not in my head. On the second night out from Decker's star, I lost my footing on the stairs from the dining hall and plunged like a comet to the bottom. I would probably have been killed but for the person of a stout steward who, at that moment, started to ascend the stairs. He took the full impact of my descent on his chest and saved my life, I'm sure. However, I still received a broken ankle that has given me so much pain that I have been forced to remain in my cabin. I have had no one to talk to except the steward who brings me my meals, and as he is the one whom I met on the stairs, he has little to say. In the morning he frowns at me, at noon he glowers, and in the evening he remarks, hopefully, foot still pretty bad? Thus I'm starved for conversation. Lenore smiled at this earnest speech. I might talk with you a minute or two, but you must admit that you have one advantage over me. You can see me, or so you say, and know what I look like, but I can't see you. It isn't fair. I can show myself to you, he said, but you'll have to help me by closing your eyes and concentrating very hard. She closed her eyes and waited expectantly. There was a moment of darkness. Then there appeared in the middle of the darkness a point of light, a globe, a giant balloon of color. Suddenly she was looking into the corner of a stateroom, which appeared to hang in space. In the center of the area stood a handsome young man in a startling black and orange lounging robe, holding on to the back of a chair. She opened her eyes. For an instant the vision of the young telepath hung in the air over her couch like a ghostly double exposure. Then it faded, and the room was empty. That's a terrible effort, came his thought, particularly when I have to balance on one foot at the same time. Well now, are we even? Abandoning her post by the door, she moved to the couch and sat down. I'm really disappointed, she smiled. I was sure you'd have two heads. But I think you do have nice eyes and a terrible taste in bathrobes. She took a cigarette from her case and lit it carefully. Then she remembered 
her manners and extended the case to the empty air won't you have one i certainly would like to i'm all out of them until the steward brings my dinner but i'm afraid i'll have to wait unless you can blow the smoke through the ventilators to me or unless you bring me one lenore blushed and changed the subject tell me what do you do all day in your stateroom do you read do you play the flute do you telepath sweet nothings across the light years to your girlfriend on decker's star i'm afraid my telepathic powers are a bit short-ranged to reach decker's star he replied besides what girl would commune with me through the depths of space when some other young man is calling her from the dancing pavilion and my musical talents are limited however i do read i brought some books connected with the research i intend to do on earth for my degree and i have spent many hours poring over the thrilling pages of extraterrestrial entomology and galactic arachnida i came better prepared than you did she said perhaps i could lend you some of my books i have novels plays poetry and one very interesting volume called progressive education under rim star conditions but she lowered her voice to a whisper i must tell you a secret about that last one what is it i haven't even opened it they laughed together her merriment bubbling aloud in her cabin his echoing silently inside her mind i haven't had time to read a novel his thought came and drama always bored me but i must confess to a weakness for poetry i love to read it aloud to throw myself into a heroic ballad and rush along spouting grand phrases as though they were my own and feeling for a moment as though i were really striding the streets of ancient rome pushing west on the american frontier or venturing out into space in the first wild reckless heroic days of rocket travel but i soon found her i get swept away by the rhythm lost in the intricacies of cadence and rhyme and when the pace slows down when the poem becomes soft and delicate and the meaning is hidden behind a foliage of little gentle words i lose myself entirely she said softly perhaps i could help you interpret some verses then she waited clasping her hands to keep them from trembling with the tiny thrill of excitement she felt that would be kind of you he said after a pause you could read there and i could listen here and feel what you feel as you read or if you wished another pause would you care to come down she could not help smiling you're too good a mind reader a girl can't have any secrets any more now look here he burst out i wouldn't have said anything but i was so lonely and you're the only friendly person i've come in contact with and don't be silly she laughed of course i'll come down and read to you i'd love to what's your cabin number it hasn't got a number because actually i work on this ship so i'm away from the passengers quarters but i can direct you easily just start down the hall to your left and my dear sir she cried just wait a minute i can't come visiting in my robe you know i'll have to change but while i dress you must take your spying little thoughts away if i detect you peeking in here at the wrong moment i'll run straight to captain blake and have him prepare his special lead-lined cell for one unhappy telepath so you just run along when i'm ready i'll call you and you can lead me to your lair he thought only the one word hurry but in the silence after he was gone she fancied she heard her heart echoing him loud in the stillness she laughed gaily to herself oh now stop acting like a schoolgirl before the junior prom you've got to get busy and wash and dress and comb and brush and then to her reflection in the mirror 
aren't you a lucky girl you're still millions and billions of miles from earth and it's starting already and he's going to do research there for some time and maybe at the university in your home town if you tell him just how nice it is and he doesn't know any other girls you'd have an inside track now you'd better get it going or you'll never be ready for reading poetry don't you think this dress is just the thing this nice soft blue one that goes so well with your tan and shows your legs which are really quite pretty you know and your silver sandals and those silver pins just a touch of perfume that's right and now a little lipstick you do have a pretty smile there that's right now stop admiring yourself and let's go she moved to the bookshelf frowning now considered selected and rejected finally she settled on three slim books bound in russet leather in glossy plastic in faded cloth she took a little purse from the table put the cigarette case into it then with a laugh she took one cigarette and slipped it into a tiny pocket on her skirt i really mean to bring you one she whispered to the empty air but wasn't I mean to tease? In the corridor, she walked quickly past the rows of closed doors to the tiny refreshment stand at the foot of the dining room stairs. The attendant rose from his stool as she approached and came to the counter. I'd like two frosted starlights, please, she said, on a tray. Two, said the attendant, and nothing more, but his eyebrow climbed up his forehead hung for a second, then slowly drooped back to normal, as if to say that after all these years he no longer puzzled about a lovely young girl who came around in the middle of a Wednesday rest period, dressed like Saturday night and smelling of perfume, ordering two intoxicating drinks, when she was obviously traveling alone. Lenore felt a thrill of secret pleasure go through her, a feeling of possessing a delicious secret a delightful sensation of reckless gaiety, of life stirring throughout the sleepy ship, of a web of secrets and counter-secrets hidden from everyone but this unconcerned observer. She walked back down the corridor, balancing the tray. When a little splashed over the rim of the tall glasses, she took a sip from each, tasting the sweet, cold liquid in her throat. When she came to the head of the stairs, she realized that she did not even know her telepath's name. Closing her eyes, she said very slowly and distinctly inside her head, Mr. Fairheart? Instantly, his thought was with her, overpowering, as breathless as an embrace. Where are you? At the head of the central stairs. Down you go. She went down the stairs, through more corridors, down more stairs, while he guided her steps. Once she paused to sip again at each glass when the liquid splashed as she was going down. The ice tickled her nose and made her sneeze. You live a long way down, she said. I've got to be near my charges, he answered. I told you I work on the ship. I'm a zoologist, classifying any of the new specimens of extraterrestrial life they're always picking up. And I always get stuck with the worst quarters on the ship. Why, I can't even call all my suite my own. The whole front room is filled with some sort of ship's gear that my steward stumbles over every mealtime. She went on and on, down and down. How many flights? she wondered. Two or twelve or twenty? Now, why couldn't she remember? Only four little sips, and her mind felt so cloudy. Down another corridor, and what was that funny smell? These passages were poorly ventilated in the lower levels. Probably that was what made her feel so dizzy. Only one more flight, he whispered. Only one more. Down and along, and then the door. She paused, conscious of rising excitement, conscious of her beating heart. Dimly, she noticed the sign on the door. You, you mean whatever it is you're taking care of is in there with you? Don't be frightened, his persuasive thought came. 
It can't hurt you. It's locked in a cage. Then she slid the bolt and turned the handle. Her head hurt for an instant, and she was inside, a blue and silver shadow in the dim ante-room, with the tray in her hand and the books under her arm and her pulse hammering. She looked around the dim ante-room, at the spidery tangle of orange and black ropes against the left-hand wall, then at the doorway in the right-hand wall with a warm light streaming through. He was standing in the second room, one hand on the chair for support, the other extended toward her. For the first time he spoke aloud. Hello, butterfly, he said. Hello, she said. She smiled and walked forward into the light. She reached out for his hand. Then she stopped short, her hand pressed against an impenetrable wall. She could see him standing there, smiling, reaching for her hand, but there was an invisible barrier between them. Then, slowly, his room began to fade, the light dimmed, his figure grew watery, transparent, vanished. She was standing, staring at the riveted steel bulkhead of a compartment, which was lit only by the dim light filtering through the thick glass over the transom. She stood there, frozen, and the ice in the glasses tinkled nervously. Then the tray slipped from her fingers and clattered to the floor. Icy liquid splashed the silver sandals. In the silent gloom she stood immobile, her eyes wide in her white face, her fist pressed to her mouth, stifling a scream. Something touched her gently at head and wrist and ankle, all over her body. The web clung, delicate as lace, strong as steel. Even if she had been able to move, she could not have broken free as the thing against the wall began to clamber down the strands on eight furred legs. Hello, butterfly, he said again. End of The Passenger by Kenneth Harmon Problem on Balak by Roger D. Aycock. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reading by Lars Rolander. Problem on Balak by Roger D. Aycock. Side note. Sometimes you can solve your problem by running out on it. What I'm getting at is that you don't ever have to worry about being bored stiff in solar exploitation's fieldwork. It never gets dull, and in some pretty strange places at that. Take the SE-2100's discovery of Balak, which is a little planet circling seventy ophicui some twenty thousand light-years from Earth, for example. You'd never expect to run across the greatest race of surgeons in the galaxy, structural, neural, or what have you, on a little apple like that, any more than you'd expect a four-man complement like ours to be handed the sort of life and death problem they put to us. And if by some miracle of prophecy you anticipated both, it's a cinch you'd never expect that problem to be solved in the way ours was. Captain Corelli and Gibbons and I couldn't have gone more than a hundred yards from the SE 2100 before we met our first Balakian native, or to be more accurate, before he met us. Corelli and I were filling our little sterilized bottles with samples of soil and vegetation, and keeping a wary eye out for possible predators, when it happened. Gibbons, our ecologist, and the scientific mainspring of our crew, was watching a swarm of little twelve-legged bugs that were busily pollinating a dwarf shrub at the top and collecting payment in drops of white sap 
that oozed out at the bottom in return. His eyes were shining behind their spectacles, and he was swearing to himself in a pleased monotone. Signal the ship and tell the quack if you can pry that hypochondriac idiot away from his gargles and germicide sprays to bring out a live specimen container, he called to Captain Corelli. We've stumbled onto something really new here, a conscious symbiosis between entirely dissimilar life forms. If the rest of the flora and fauna cooperate like this. At the moment, Gibbon's discovery didn't register, because it was just then that the first Balakian showed himself. The native looked at first glance something like a wrinkled pink octopus, standing three feet high and nearly as broad, and he walked in a skip a step swing like a man on crutches, because his three short legs were set in a horizontal row. He had four arms to each side, the lower ones meant for grasping and holding, and the upper ones for manipulation. He didn't have a head, exactly, but there was a face of sorts up near the top of the body that looked like nothing so much as a politely grinning orientals. He wasn't armed, but I took no chances. I dropped my specimen kit and yanked out the heat gun that is a part of every SE field operative's gear. Captain Corelli, who was on the point of calling the quack at the ship, took his thumb off the mic button and grabbed for his own weapon. Gibbons, like a true scientist, stood by, with his mouth open, too interested to be scared. Then the Balakian spoke, and Corelli and I gaped wider than Gibbons. As I said before, Balak is some twenty thousand light-years from Earth and to our knowledge we were the first human beings ever to come within a hundred parsecs of the place. "'Please don't shoot, gentlemen,' he said to us in Terran. "'My name is Gaffa, and I assure you that I am quite friendly.' I had to give Gibbons credit for being fast on his mental feet. He had taken over before Corelli and I could get our mouths closed and was talking to the native as if this sort of thing happened every time we made planetfall. "'You speak Terran fluently,' Gibbon said. "'Or is this some sort of telepathic contact that creates the illusion of oral communication?' The native grinned delightedly. "'The contact is oral. We learned of your language from an independent planet hunter named Haslop who was wrecked here some years ago. In solar exploitations you learn to expect the unexpected, but to me this was stretching coincidence clear out of joint. We had the latest zero-interval transference drive made, and I couldn't believe that any independent planet stalker could have beaten us here with outmoded equipment. A Terran, I asked, where is he now? Coming up. Gaffa said, with my fellows. A couple of dozen other Balakians, looking exactly like him, bore down on us through the dwarf shrubbery, and with them were two lanky Terrans, dressed in loose shirt and drawers ensembles, which obviously had been made on Balak. Even at a distance the Terrans looked disturbingly alike, and when they got closer I could see that they were identical twins. "'You don't count so good, chum,' I said. "'I see two Terrans.' "'Only one,' Gaffa corrected, grinning wider. "'The other is one of us.' I didn't believe it, of course. Corelli didn't get it either. His eyes had a glazed look, and he was shaking his head like a man with a gnat in his ear. One of the Terrans rushed up to us with tears in his eyes, and his Adam's apple bobbing, so overcome with emotion that I was afraid he might kiss us. "'I'm Ira Herslop,' he said in a choked voice. "'I've been marooned here for twenty-two eternal years, and I never thought I'd see a Terran face again, and now—' He stopped, but not for breath. The other skinny Terran had grabbed his arm and swung him around. "'What the hell do you think you're doing, you masquerading nightmare?' the second one yelled. 
i'm ira haslop and you damn well know it if you think you're going to pass yourself off as me and go home to earth in my place the first haslop gaped at him for a moment then he slapped the other's hand off his arm and shook a bony fist in his face so that's your game that's why these grinning freaks made you look like me and threw us together all these years they've planned all along to ring in a switch and send you home instead of me well it won't work the second haslop swung on him then and the two of them went to the mat like a pair of loose-drawered tigers cursing and gooching the grinning natives separated them after a moment and examined them carefully for damage chattering away with great satisfaction in their own language corelli and gibbons and i stared at each other like three fools it was impossible to think that either of the two men could be anything but what he claimed to be a perfectly normal and thoroughly angry terran but when each of them swore that one of them the other one of course was an alien and the natives backed up the accusation what else could we believe gaffa who seemed to be a sort of headman took over and explained the situation which seemed to be an incredibly long-range gag cooked up by these octopod jokers without the original haslop's knowledge against the day when another terran ship might land on balak their real intent gaffa said was to present us with a problem that could be solved only by a species with a real understanding of its own kind if we could solve it his people stood ready to assist us in any way possible if not i didn't like the sound of it so i reached for my heat gun again so did captain corelli and gibbons but we were too slow a little stinging bug another link in the cooperative balakian ecology bit each of us on the back of the neck and we passed out cold when we woke up again we were guests of gaffa and his tribe in a sort of settlement miles from the se twenty one hundred and there wasn't so much as a nail file among us in the way of weapons the natives hadn't bothered to shackle us or lock us up we found ourselves lying instead in the middle of a circular court surrounded by mossy mounds that looked like flattened beehives but which were actually dwellings where the balakians lived we learned later that the buildings were constructed by swarms of tiny burrowing brutes like termites who built them up grain by grain according to specifications i can't begin to explain the principle behind the harmony existing between all living things on balak it just was and seemed to operate like a sort of hypersympathy or interlocking telepathy between species every creature on the planet performed some service for some other creature even the plants which grew edibles without pain nerves so it wouldn't hurt to be plucked and which sent up clouds of dust dry spores once a week to make it rain and the three-legged eight-armed natives were right at the top of this screwy utopia lords of it all not that any of us were interested at first in it as an ecological marvel of course from the moment we woke up we were too busy with plans for escaping the trap we'd fallen into the quack is our only hope captain corelli said and groaned at the thought if that hypochondriac idiot has brains enough to sit tight we may have a chance if they get him too we're lost the quack was a damn poor reed to lean on his name was alvin frick but no one ever used it he was twenty-nine and would never have rated a space berth as anything but a hydroponics attendant which is one step above manual labor he was short plump and scrubbed to the pink and he was the only hypochondriac i ever knew in this modern age of almost no sickness he grossed about the germs swarming in his reduction tanks and he was scared green in spite of his permanent immunization shots that he'd contract some nameless alien disease at every planetfall 
he dosed himself continuously with concoctions whipped up from an old medical book he had found somewhere and he spent most of his off-duty time spraying himself and his quarters with disinfectant his mania had only one good facet if he had been the careless sort hydroponics being what it is he'd have smelt like a barnyard instead of a dispensary we had never made any attempt to get rid of him since we might have drawn an even worse tank farmer but we began to wish now that we had we had hardly begun to figure ways and means of escaping when a bunch of grinning natives swung into our court and deposited the quack sleeping soundly in our midst he came to just before sundown and when we told him what had happened he promptly passed out again this time from fright a fine lot of help you are you super sterile slob i said when he woke up for the second time i probably have said worse but it was just then that the real squeeze began gaffa came back with the two scowling haslops in tow and handed us the problem his tribe had spent twenty-two years in working up we have learnt enough already from haslop gaffa said to know something of the pressures and complexities that follow the expansion of your terran realm through the galaxy and to assure us that in time we must either become a part of that realm or isolate ourselves completely we are a peaceful species and feel that we should probably benefit as much from your physical sciences as your people would from our biological skills but there is a question of compatibility that must be settled first before we may risk making ourselves known to terra so we have devised a test to determine what our course shall be we raised our brows at one another over that not guessing at the time just what the balakians really had on the ball for thousands of generations we have devoted our energies to knowing ourselves and our environment gaffa said because we know that no species can be truly balanced unless it understands itself the symbiosis between all life forms on our planet is the result of that knowledge we should like to assure ourselves that you are capable of understanding your own kind as well before we offer our services to your terran realm and therein lies the test we have arranged for you captain corelli drew himself up stiffly i think he said that the three of us should be able to unravel your little riddle if you'll condescend to tell us what it is gaffa sent a puzzled look at the quack and i could see that he was wondering why corelli hadn't included him in the boast but gaffa didn't know how simple the quack could be nor how preoccupied with his own physiology he was one of these two said gaffa pointing to the two haslops is the original ira haslop who was stranded here twenty-two terran years ago the other is a synthetic creation of ours an android if you like who is identical cell by cell with the original so far as exterior likeness is concerned we could not duplicate the interior without dissection which of course was out of the question so we were forced to make compromises that gibbons interrupted him incredulously you mean you've created a living creature brain and all only the body gaffa said creation of intelligence is still beyond us the brain of the duplicate haslop is one of our own transplanted and conditioned to haslop's knowledge memories and ideology he paused for a moment and the waiting circle of balakians grinned with him in anticipation your problem is this gaffa said if you know yourselves well enough to merit our help then you should be able to distinguish readily between the real and false haslops if you fail we shall have no alternative but to keep you here on balak for the rest of your lives since to release you would bring other terrans down on us in force 
and that was it all we had to do was to take these two identical twins who looked alike thought alike and cursed alike and determine which was real and which was bogus for a very pertinent reason which you may or may not discover gaffa said the test must be limited to a few hours you have until sunrise to-morrow morning gentlemen and with that he crutched away at his skipper step walk taking his grinning cohorts with him the two haslops remained behind glowering and grumbling at each other the situation didn't look too bad at first there are no two things captain corelli declared that are exactly and absolutely identical and that applies i should say especially to identities it had a heartening sound i've never been long on logic being a very ordinary se navigator whose automatic equipment is designed to do practically everything for him and corelli seemed to know what he was talking about gibbons being a scientist saw it differently that is not even good sophistry he said the concept of identity between two objects has no meaning whatever captain unless we have a prior identification of one or the other aristotle himself couldn't have told an apple from a coconut if he'd never seen or heard of either any fool of would know that one of the haslops grunted and the other added in the same tone hey if you guys are going at it like that we'll be here forever all right corelli said deflated we'll try another tack he thought for a minute or two how about screening them for background detail the real haslop was a bounty claimer which means that he must have made thousands of planet falls before crashing here the bogus one couldn't remember the details of all those worlds as well as the original no matter how many times he'd been told could he won't work one of the haslops said disgustedly hell after twenty-two years i can't remember those places myself and i was there the other haslop gave him a dirty look you were here fellow i was there and to the captain he said we're getting nowhere friend you're underestimating these Balakians. they look and act like screwballs but they're sharp in the twenty-two years i've lived with that carbon copy of myself he's learned everything i know he's right gibbons put in he blinked a couple of times and turned pink unless the real haslop happened to be married that is i'm a bachelor myself but i'd say there are some memories that a married man wouldn't discuss even when marooned captain corelli stared at him admiringly i never gave you enough credit gibbons he said you're right how about don't help any one of the haslops said morosely i never was married and now i never will be if i've got to depend on you jerks to get me out of this mess the sun went down just then and a soft drowsy darkness fell i thought at first that we'd have to finish our investigation in the dark but the natives had made provisions for that a swarm of fireflies as big as robins sailed in from somewhere and circled around over the court lighting it as bright as day the balakian houses made a dim row of flattened shadow moans at the outskirts of the circle a ring of natives sat tailor fashion on the ground in front of them a neat trick considering that they had three legs each to fold up and grinned at us they had waited twenty-two years for this show, and now that it had come, they were enjoying every minute of it. Our investigation was pretty rough going. The fireflies overhead all circled in one direction, which made you dizzy every time you looked up, and besides that the quack had remembered that he was a prisoner in an alien environment, and was at the mercy of any outlandish disease that might creep past his permanent immunization he muttered and grumbled to himself about the risk and his grousing got on our nerves even worse than usual i moved over to shut him up and blinked when i saw him pop something into his mouth 
My first guess was that he had managed to sneak some food concentrate out of the ship somehow, and the thought made me realize how hungry I was. What have you got there, Quack? I demanded. Come on, give. What are you hiding out? Antibiotics and stuff, he answered, and pulled a little flat plastic case out of a pocket. It was his portable medicine chest, which he carried the way superstitious people used to carry rabbit's feet, and it was largely responsible for our calling him the quack. It was full of patent capsule remedies that he had gleaned out of his home medical book, a cut thumb, a surprise headache, or a siege of gas on the stomach would never catch the quack unprepared. Jerk, I said, and went back to Gibbons and Corelli, who were arguing a new approach to our problem. It's worth a try, Gibbons said. He turned on the two Haslops, who were bristling like a pair of strange dogs. This question is for the real Haslop. Have you ever been put through a Rorschach thematic apperception or free association test? The real Haslop hadn't, either of them. Then we'll try free association, Gibbon said, and explained what he wanted of them. Water, Gibbon said, popping it out quick and sharp. Spigot, the Haslop said together, which is exactly what any spaceman would say, since the only water important to him comes out of a ship's tank. Lake and river and spring to him are only words in books. Gibbons chewed his lip and tried again, but the result was the same every time. When he said, Payday, they both came back binge, and when he said, Man, they answered woman, with the same gleam in their eyes. I could have told you it wouldn't work, one Haslop said when Gibbons threw up his hands and quit. I've lived so long with that phony that he even knows what I'm going to say next. I was going to say the same thing, the other one growled. After twenty-two years of drinking and arguing with him, we've begun, God help me, to think alike. I tried my own hand just once. Gaffa says that they are exactly identical, so far as outside appearance goes, I said. But he may be wrong or lying. Maybe we'd better check for ourselves. The Haslops raised a howl, of course but it did them no good. Gibbons and Corelli and I'd ganged them one at a time. The quack refused to help for fear of being contaminated, and examined them carefully. It was a lively job, since both of them swore they were ticklish, and under different circumstances it could have been embarrassing. But it settled one point. Gaffa hadn't lied. They were absolutely identical, as far as we could determine. We had given it up and were resting from our labors when Gaffa came grinning out of the darkness and brought us a big crystal pitcher of something that would have passed for a first-class planet punch, except that it was nearer two-thirds alcohol than the fifty-fifty mix you get at most interplanetary gin mills. The two Haslops had a slug of it as a matter of course, being accustomed to it, and the rest of us followed suit. Only the quack refused turning green at the thought of all the alien bacteria that might be swimming around in the pitcher. A couple of drinks made us feel better. I've been thinking, Captain Corelli said, about what Gaffa said when he limited the time of the test, that we might or might not discover the reason for ourselves. Now what the hell did the grinning heathen mean by that? Is there a reason, or was he only dragging a red herring across the bogus Haslop's track? Gibbons looked thoughtful. I sat back while he pondered and watched the quack, who was swallowing another antibiotic capsule. Wait a minute, Gibbons exclaimed. Captain, you've hit on something there. He stared at the Haslops. They stared back, unimpressed. Gaffa said you two were exactly like outside. Gibbon said, and we proved it. Does that mean you're not alike inside? Sure, one of them said. But what of it? You're sure as hell not going to cut one of us open to see. You're confusing the issue, Gibbon snapped. What I'm getting at is this. If you two aren't made alike inside, then you can't possibly exist on the same sort of diet. 
one of you eats the same sort of food as ourselves the other can't but which is which one of the haslops pointed a quivering finger at the other it is him he said i watched him drink his dinner for twenty-two years he's the fake liar the other one yelled springing up corelli stepped between them and the second haslop subsided grumbling it's true enough only he's the one that drinks his meals this stuff in the pitcher is the food he lives on alcohol for energy with minerals and other stuff dissolved in it i drink it with him for kicks but that phony can't eat anything else corelli snapped his fingers so that's why they limited our time and why they brought this stuff to keep their fake haslop refueled all we've got to do to separate our men now is feed them something solid the one that eats it is the real haslop sure all we need now is some solid food i said you don't happen to have a couple of sandwiches on you do you everybody got quiet for a couple of minutes and in the silence the quack surprised us all by deciding to speak up since i'm stuck here for life he said a few germs more or less won't matter much pass me the pitcher will you he took a man-sized slug of the fiery stuff without even wiping off the pitcher's rim after that we gave it up as who wouldn't have captain corelli said the hell with it and took such a slug of the pitcher that the two haslops yelled murder and grabbed it quick themselves and from then on we just sat around and drank and talked and waited for the sunrise that would condemn us to balak for the rest of our lives thinking about our problem had reminded me of an old puzzle i'd heard somewhere about three men being placed in a room where they can see each other but not themselves they are shown three white hats and two black ones and then they are blindfolded and a hat is put on each of their heads when the blindfolds are taken off the third man knows by looking at the other two and by what they say just what color hat he is wearing himself but i always forget how it is that he knows we got so interested in the hat problem that the east was turning pink before we realized it none of us actually saw the sun rise though except the quack and the bogus haslop i was right in the middle of a sentence when all of a sudden my stomach rolled over and growled like a dying tiger and i never had such an all gone feeling in my life i looked at the others wondering if the stuff in the pitcher had poisoned us all and saw gibbons and corelli staring at each other with the same startled look in their eyes one of the haslops was hit too he had the same pinched expression around the mouth, and perspiration stood out on his forehead in drops as big as grapes. And then the four of us were on our feet and dashing for open country, leaving the quack and the remaining Haslop staring after us. The Haslop who stayed looked puzzled, I thought, but the quack only seemed interested and very much entertained. I couldn't be sure of that, though. There wasn't time to look twice. When we came back to the court later, shaken and pale and bracing ourselves for another dash at any minute, we found Gaffa and his grinning chums congratulating the quack. The bogus Haslop had dropped his impersonation act and seemed very happy. "'I've learned to like Haslop so well after twenty-two years,' he said, "'that I'm quite prejudiced in favor of his species, and I'm delighted that we are to join your realm.' balak and terra will get along famously i know since you people are so ingenious and appreciative of humor we ignored the balakians and swooped down on the quack you put something in that pitcher after you drank out of it you insult to humanity i said what was it the quack backed off with a weary look in his eye a recipe from the curiosa section of my medical book he said I whipped up some capsules for my pocket kit, just in case of emergency, and I couldn't help thinking of them when— Never mind the build-up, Captain Corelli said. What was it? 
a formula invented by ancient terran bartenders and not recommended except in extreme cases the quack said with a very odd name it's called a twin mickey we'd probably have murdered him then and there if the quack's concoction had let us later on we had to admit that the quack had actually done us a service since his identifying the real haslop saved us from being marooned for life on balak and the balakians were such an immediate sensation in the terran realm that a quack's part in their admittance made him famous overnight somebody high up in government circles got him out of solar exploitations field work and gave him a sinecure in an antibiotics laboratory where he wound up as happy as a pig in a peanut field which points up the statement i made in the beginning that one thing you never have to worry about in solar exploitations work is being bored you see what i mean end of problem on balak by roger d haycock read by lars rolander films by sam merwin this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by frank malanga real life films by sam merwin 25 years ago, Cyril Bezdek and E. Carter Dorwin would have met in a private railway car belonging to one of them. They might even have met in a private train. At any rate, they would have met in absolute privacy. But it being the present, they had to be content with a series of adjoining rooms taking up less than one half of a car on the Super Sachem, fastest coast-to-coast -coast train in the country. Their meeting in private was very important. Upon its results hinged the future of Gigantic Studios, one of Hollywood's big three production companies. Dorwin was the powerful plenipotentiary of the Consolidated Trust Company of Manhattan and backer of Gigantic's multi-million dollar productions. He was on his way west to make sure that the interests of his bank were being adequately served by the studio. Bezdek was Gigantic's supreme production boss, former office boy, writer, prop man, assistant director, director, producer, and story editor, he was the works, unless Dorwin decided otherwise during this meeting and pulled the props out from under him. He had thought Dorwin's trip sufficiently important to fly to Kansas City and get aboard the Super Sachem to be with the banker during the remainder of his trip. They had dined in the privacy of Dorwin's suite. Bezdek, as befitted his tortured duodenum, on yogurt and Melba toast. Dorwin on caviar, consomme, a thick steak with full trimmings, and a golden baked Alaska accompanied by Armagnac. How do you manage to keep thin? Bezdek asked him, honestly envious. Polo? Tennis? Golf would never do it. I haven't exercised in ten years, said the banker, biting off the end of a Havana Perfecto. He studied the little movie maker over the flame of his lighter. Outside, the flat expanse of Kansas rushed past through the night at close to a hundred miles an hour. Some people are lucky, said Bezdek, adjusting the broad knot of his hand-painted Windsor tie. He was remarshalling his thoughts and ideas. It was very important that he and Dorwin be in perfect accord before they reached Hollywood. The banker, who was new to the movie-making branch of his business, spoke first. I presume, he said finally, that you're aware of the current feeling in our New York office? The movie magnate gestured carelessly with a Saxony gun club sleeve, revealing a platinum wristwatch strap. We hear rumors now and again, he said. It's about our science fiction films. Bezdek avoided making it a question. He was far too shrewd for that. The banker, finding himself thus at a disadvantage, said amicably, It's not that the fantasy series isn't making money, understand. He paused, looking faintly distressed. It's just that, frankly, we feel they're getting too far away from reality. Trips to Mars and Venus? Strange creatures? It's not real. It's not dignified. Frankly, we question whether an institution like ours can afford to be connected with anything so 
so ephemeral. After all, he paused as sounds of a scuffle in the corridor penetrated the room, and something or somebody was banged hard against the door. Bezdek, frowning, jumped up nervously and went to the door, opened it, looked out. "'What's going on out there?' he inquired tartly. "'Ty!' "'Sorry, Mr. Bezdek,' said Ty, falter, the mogul's private secretary, bodyguard, and constant companion. He was leaning against the far wall of the corridor, mopping a cut lower lip with a bloody handkerchief. He was a tall, deceptively sleepy-looking young man who virtually never slept. At the end of the corridor, two lesser aides were half-dragging a tall figure between them. Bezdek frowned as he caught a glimpse of a nodding head and half-profile, a near-perfect profile which showed no sign of a bruise. "'How did that creep get in here?' he snapped. "'That's the same character who tried to nail me at the Casey Airport.' "'Yes, sir,' said Ty Falter apologetically. He glanced at his skinned knuckles. "'It was like hitting a brick,' he said. He shook his head, added, Sorry, Mr. Bezdek, I don't know how he got in here. Your job is to keep crackpots like that away from me, said the mogul. He turned and went back inside the compartment. Doran was still sitting as before. Eavesdroppers? the banker inquired with unruffled poise. Not likely, said Bezdek, dropping into his seat. Probably a movie-crazy kid trying to chisel a screen test. The incident had brought back his heartburn. He wanted to take a couple of his pills, but not in front of Dorwin. The banker might think he was cracking up. These damned New Yorkers had no idea of the pressure under which he labored. He sipped a glass of flat soda water. Where were we? Dorwin said quietly. Somehow to Bezdek he gave the impression of remorseless rationality. Oh yes, these fantasy movies. We're a little worried about them. I thought you might be, said Bezdek, leaning forward and using the full magnetism of his personality. Now that the issue was out in the open, his discomfort was eased. Actually, we don't think of our interplanetary cycle as fantasy, Dorwin. We think of them as forecasts of the future, as prophecy. There's still a far cry from reality, or even the usual escapism, said the banker. Confidentially, I happen to know that it will be years, perhaps decades, before we make any live contact with the other planets. Our national interests demand that we prevent atomic power from superseding older methods before investments have realized on their holdings to the fullest extent. And it is upon development of atomic power that space flight hinges at present. Certainly, I understand that. Sound business, said Bezdek with his one-sided smile. I hope they wait for many years. Dorwin looked faintly astonished. From these pictures of yours, I must confess, I had derived a totally different impression of your theories, he said slowly, flicking two inches of pale gray ash into the silver tray at his elbow. Listen to me, said the movie maker, again leaning toward his vis-a-vis. -vis. We're making these pictures now because when the first man or men come back from other planets, our science fiction cycle is finished. It will cease to be escape. We will then be faced with the reality of what they really find. And that's bound to be a great deal different from the sort of thing we're feeding them now. It's a point I hadn't considered, said the banker, reaching for the brandy. He nodded to himself as he poured it, then looked up at Bezdek and asked, But why this space opera is the colloquial term, I believe? Why not stick closer to real life? Bezdek sat back, and the slanting smile creased his features again. Minorities, he said. That's why. Crackpot minorities object loudly at being portrayed in films they don't like. We don't want to tread on anybody's toes. There's trouble enough in the world as it is. People want villains. But unless we make our villains, even minor villains, people from nowhere, we get boycotted somewhere by somebody. And that costs us money. Yes, of course, said the banker. But I fail to see. It's simple. Bezdek was in full cry now and interrupted openly. People like conflict in their movies. If it's a Western, they want their heroes to fight Indians or Mexicans or rustlers. The Indians and Mexicans object to being the villains, and they've got big sympathetic followings. Okay, so we use rustlers or renegade white men, and we still make Westerns, but not many. No plot variety. He sipped more soda water. It's the same with everything else. Unless we're in a war with a legitimate enemy to hate, we can't use villains. 
It's almost enough to make a man wish. Not with the H-bomb, Bezdek, said Dorwin frigidly. Of course not. I was only speaking figuratively, said the movie maker hastily. I'm as much against war as anyone. But that's what makes these interplanetary movies great stuff. We can run in all the villains we want, make them just as bad as we want. Audiences really like to have someone they can hate. I see, said Dorwin. He permitted himself to look faintly pleased. After all, a Martian can hardly protest what we do with him. I see your point now. You've got it, said Bezdek, beaming now. He leaned forward and added, Furthermore, we've got four new pictures in the works for the space cycle that are really going to... He broke off, interrupted by a knock at the door. He stared at the banker, seeking someone to share his annoyance, found Dorwin staring out the window, frowning. The train seems to have stopped, said the banker. Bezdek turned to the window. It was true. The night was clouded and dark, but he could make out a single tree in faint silhouette, and it was not moving. The knock on the stateroom door came again. I'd better see who it is, said Bezdek, rising. Maybe something is wrong. He opened the door quickly, all but fell back into his seat. The tall young man with the two perfect features, the one who had tried in vain to speak to him at the Kansas City airport, who had been forcibly evicted earlier from the car, stood there. The young man smiled, and it was much too cold to be ingratiating, if that was his intent. He said, looking down on both men, I think you will wish to talk to me now. The sheer effrontery of it rendered Civil Bezdek speechless for the first time in years. Looking past the intruder through the angle of the open door, he could see Ty Falter sitting on the corridor floor, leaning against the wall. His eyes were closed, his head canted at an odd angle. It was Darwin who first found words. Who are you? he inquired. What do you want? I am from Mars, said the stranger. I have come here to enter a protest against the manner in which Mr. Bezdek's motion pictures are portraying my people. The movie maker's mouth dropped open. He closed it quickly, glanced across at the banker, saw equal bewilderment on that usually poker face. On impulse, Bezdek reached for the buzzer that would summon aid and pressed it firmly several times. No one will answer, said the intruder, in a voice remarkable not for its accent, but for its lack of any. We have been forced to, to immobilize this train in order to see you. It has been very difficult to reach you, Mr. Bezdek. I am sure through no fault of your own. But the people of my planet feel very strongly about this matter, and I must get some satisfaction for them. So help me, said the mogul, his thin face purple with anger. If this is a gag, I'll see you jailed for it. And before you're jailed, you're going to have a very unpleasant... No, Mr. Bezdek, Mr. Dorwin, this is not a joke. We of Mars are proud of our culture, our civilization. We do not like being portrayed as evil and ridiculous creatures. We're not like those filthy Venerians. We Martians have a great self-respect. Ostrich feathers, Bezdek roared at the deadpanned intruder. You may not be aware of it, but there are severe penalties for holding up a train on this, in this country. You can't go around slugging people either. Look at Ty out there. Your servant will be all right, said the intruder, as will the others aboard this train. I can release them whenever you agree that my mission is to be taken seriously. All right, said Bezdek, whose mind was nothing if not acrobatic. Suppose you are from Mars. Tell me why your people object to our movies. Surely they aren't seeing them on Mars. No, but your Earthmen will reach our planet soon, and your opinion of us will be shaped in some degree by these movies they have seen. And since the relationships of the near future are of vital import to us now, we must not be represented as other than we are. Such misconceptions could breed interplanetary war. He shuddered. I think you're crazy, said Bezdek. He turned to the banker, who was again staring out the window. There's something out there. Look, said Dorwin. That is our ship, the intruder told them blandly. That is why we stopped the train here. It is the only flat area sufficiently unsettled for our landing and departure without detection. We must return at once or lose perihelion. Let me see, said Bezdek. He peered through the window. There was something out there, something black and vague and shaped like an immense turtle with jagged projections. He tried to tell himself he was seeing things and failed. 
Amazing, said E. Carter Dorwin. It's utterly amazing. Incredible is the word for it, Bezdek said wearily. He faced the intruder, said bluntly, Very well, you say you're from Mars, and I say to your face that you aren't. You seem remarkably sure, Mr. Bezdek. And why not? The movie maker was in his element now, delivering the clincher in an argument. Our scientists have proved conclusively that Earthmen cannot exist on Mars without spacesuits. You say you're a Martian, yet you look like one of us. So if you can live on Mars, how can you live in our atmosphere without a spacesuit of some sort? There's one for you to answer, he chortled. But I am wearing protection, a protective suit arranged to give the impression that I am an Earthman. A flicker of something akin to distaste passed over his singularly immobile face. I'd like to see what you do look like, said Dorwin, suddenly entering into the eerie conversation. Something like a sigh escaped the intruder. Then he said, Very well. It is important that you believe me, so... His hands went to the top of his scalp, and deliberately he peeled the lifelike mask slowly from the hidden features of his thoroughly Martian face. It was a very odd face, not at all human. It reminded Bezdek a little of an immutably sad basset hound he kept in his Hollywood kennel. It made Dorwin think of his mother-in-law. It was not a frightening face, and the single eye in the center of the forehead held them with its mournful regard. Held them? Held them? When they were thoroughly under its hypnotic spell, the Martian began to speak softly. Ty Falter was slow in waking up, but when he realized that he was lying there in the corridor, he came to with a start. If Bezdek ever found out about this, he'd be cooked as far as Hollywood went. He got to his feet, his unsteadiness helped not at all by the fact that the train chose that moment to start with a jerk. He grabbed at the wall as a meteor flashed through the dark of the Kansas night outside the window. Funny, he thought. The damn thing was going up, not down. But he forgot about the meteor as he heard the voices coming from the stateroom he was being paid to guard. He reeled over to the partly open door and listened. Bezdek was talking volubly, enthusiastically, as he did when he spoke of the actual making of a picture. So we'll only have to reshoot a few sequences, Dorwin. The cost will be nothing compared to the returns. Think of it. Our space pilot hero crashes on Venus. He has to fight horrible, slimy swamp creatures. We can make them look like crocodiles with six or eight legs to reach the mountaintop where the girl is hiding. He paused, and Dorwin said gravely, I'm glad, since these space operas seem to be necessary, that you've decided to locate them on a real planet like Venus, rather than a fictitious one like Mars. If minority pressure groups force us to use fantasy, then it is as well to stay as credible as possible. Right, Dorwin, right on the nose, cried Bezdek, and we can make real villains out of these Venerians. Real bang-up nasty heavies. The banker's voice came through the door again, he said doubtfully. But how can we be sure about the Venerians? Because I can feel it here, cried the movie maker. The thump that accompanied his final word told Ty that his boss had smote himself dramatically over the heart as he delivered the climactic line. End of Real Life Films by Sam Merwin Recording by Frank Malanga Pembroke Pines, Florida. By Algis Budras. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reading by Greg Marguerite. Raya's Foundling by Algis Budras The loft of the feed house with its stacked grain sacks was a B-72, a fort, a foxhole, any number of things, depending on Fildy's moods. Today it was a jumping-off place. Fildy slipped out of his dormitory and ran across the yard to the feed house. 
He dropped the big wooden latch behind him and climbed up the ladder to the loft, depending on the slight strength of his young arms more than on his legs, which had to be lifted to straining heights before they could negotiate the man-sized rungs. He reached the loft and stood panting, looking out over the farm through the loft door, at the light wooden fences around it and the circling antenna of the radar tower. Usually he spent at least a little time each day crouched behind the grain sacks and, being bigger and older, firing coolly and accurately into the charging companies of burly, thick-lipped U.E.S. soldiers or going over on one wing and whistling down on a flight of TT-34s that scattered like frightened ducks before the fiery sleet of his wing rockets. But today was different. Today there was something he wanted to try. He stood up on his toes and searched. He felt the touch of Miss Cowan's mind, no different from that of anyone else, flat, unsystematic. He sighed. Perhaps somewhere there was someone else like himself. For a moment the fright of loneliness invaded him, but then faded. He took a last look at the farm, then moved away from the open door, letting his mind slip into another way of thinking. His chubby features twisted into a scowl of concentration as he visualized reality. The scowl became a deeper grimace as he negated that reality, step by step, and substituted another. F is for Fildy. O is for Out. R is for Ryman. T is for Topology. H is for Heartsick Hunger. Abruptly the Ryman fold became a concrete visualization, as though printed clearly in and around the air which was simultaneously both around him and not around him, which existed, not existed, in space-time. He saw the side-slip diagram. He twisted. Spring had come to Raya's world. Spring and the thousand sounds of it. The melted snow in the mountaintops ran down in traceries of leaping water, and the spring crests raced along the creeks into the rivers. The riverbank grasses sprang into life. The plains turned green again. Raya made her way up the path across the foothills, conscious of her shame. The green plain below was dotted two by two with the figures of her people. It was spring, and time, only she was alone. There was a special significance in the fact that she was here on this path in this season. The plains on either side of the Brown River were her people's territory. During the summer the couples ranged over the grass until the dames were ready to drop their calves. Then it became the bull's duty to forage for their entire families until the youngsters were able to travel south to the winter range. Through the space of years the people had increased in numbers, the pressure of this steady growth making itself felt as the yearlings filled out on the winter range. It had become usual as the snowdrift northward was made toward the end of winter, for some of the people to split away from the main body and range beyond the gray mountains that marked the western limits of the old territories. Since these wanderers were usually the most willful and headstrong, they were regarded as quasi-outcasts by the more settled people of the old range. But, and here Raya felt the shame pierce more strongly than ever, they had their uses, occasionally. Preoccupied in her shame, she involuntarily turned her head downward, anxious that none of the people be staring derisively upward at the shaggy brown hump of fur that was she, toiling up the path. She was not the first, but that was meaningless. That other female people had been ugly or old, that the same unforgotten force that urged her up the mountain path had brought others here before her meant only that she was incapable of accepting the verdict of the years that had thinned her pelt, dimmed her eyes, and broken the smooth rhythm of her gait. In short, it meant that Raya Sire, grand dame times over, spurned by every male on the old range, was willing to cross the gray mountains and risk death from the resentful wild dames for the thin hope that there was a male among the wildings who would sire her calf. She turned her head back to the path and hurried on, cringing inward in self-reproach at her speed. 
Except for her age, Raya presented a perfect average of her people. She stood two yards high and two wide at the shoulders, a yard at the haunches, and measured three and a half yards from her muzzle to the rudimentary tail. Her legs were short and stumpy, cloven-hooved. Her massive head hung slightly lower than her shoulders, and could be lowered to within an inch or two of the ground. She was herbivorous, ruminant, and mammalian. Moreover, she had intelligence, not of a very high order, but adequate for her needs. From a terrestrial point of view, none of this was remarkable. Many years of evolution had gone into her fashioning. More years for her one species than for all the varieties of man that have ever been. Nevertheless, she did have some remarkable attributes. It was one of these attributes that now enabled her to sense what happened on the path ahead of her. She stopped still, only her long fur moving in the breeze. Filthy, five, toe-headed, round-faced, chubby, dressed in a slightly grubby corduroy oversuit, and precocious, had his attributes, too. Grubby and tousled, branded with a thread of licorice from one corner of his mouth to his chin, involved in the loss of his first milk-tooth, as he was, he nevertheless slipped onto the path on Raya's world, the highest product of terrestrial evolution. Alice followed a white rabbit down a hole. Fildy followed Ryman down into a hole that, at the same time, followed him and emerged... where? Fildy didn't know. He could have performed the calculation necessary to the task almost instantly. But he was five. It was too much trouble. He looked up and saw a gray slope of rock vaulting above him. He looked down and saw it fall away toward a plain on which were scattered pairs of foraging animals. He felt a warm breeze, smelled it, saw it blow dust along the path, and saw Raya. B is for Big Brown Beast. L is for Looming Large, Looking Lonely. B, L, Bull, no, Bison. Bison, noun, the buffalo of the North American Plains. Fildy shook his head and scowled. No, not bison either. What then? He probed. Raya took a step forward. The sight of a living organism other than a person was completely unfamiliar to her. Nevertheless, anything that small and undeniably covered, in most areas at least, with some kind of fur could not logically be anything but a strange kind of calf. But, she stopped and raised her head, if a calf, then... Where was the call? Fildy's probe swept past the laboring mind directly into her telepathic instinctual centers. Voiceless, with their environment so favorable that it had never been necessary for them to develop prehensile limbs, female people had nevertheless evolved a method of child care commensurate with their comparatively higher intelligence. Soft as tender fingers, gentle as the human hand that smooths the awry hair back from the young forehead, Raya's mental caress enfolded Fildy. Fildy recoiled. The feeling was warm, soft, sweet. Not candy in the mouth. Candy in the mouth. Familiar, good, tasty, nice. The feeling was not familiar, not good, not tasty, not nice. Why? M is for many motionless months. T is for tense temper tantrums. R is for rabid, no, rapid rolling wrench. M-T-R. Mother. Fildy's mother wanted Fildy's father. Fildy's mother wanted green grass and apple trees, tight skirts and fur jackets on Fifth Avenue, men to turn and look, a little room where nobody could see her. Fildy's mother had radiation burns. Fildy's mother was dead. He wavered physically. Maintaining his position in this world was a process that demanded constant attention from the segment of his mind devoted to it. For a moment, even that small group of brain cells almost became involved in his reaction. It was that which snapped him back into functioning logically. M.T.R. was mother. Mother was... 
tall, thin, white, biped. In heaven's name, doctor, when will this thing be over? B.L. was Raya. Raya was big brown beast, looming large, looking lonely. B.L. equals M.T.R. Equation not meaningful, not valid. Almost resolved, only a few traces of the initial conflict remained. Fildy put the tips of his right fingers to his mouth. He dug his toe into the ground, gouged a semicircular furrow, and smothered it over with his soul. Raya continued to look at him from where she was standing, two or three feet away. Haltingly, she reached out her mind again, hesitating not because of fear of another such reaction on Fildy's part, for that had been far beyond her capacity to understand, but because even the slightest rebuff on the part of a child to a gesture as instinctive as a terrestrial mother's caress was something that none of the people had ever encountered before. While her left-behind intellectual capacity still struggled to reconcile the feel of childhood with a visual image of complete unfamiliarity, the warm-minded caress went gently forth again. Fildy made up his mind. Ordinarily, he was immune to the small emotional problems that beclouded less rational intellects. He was unused to functioning in other than a cause-effect universe. Mothers were usually, though sometimes not, matronly women who spent the greater part of roughly twenty years per child in conscious preoccupation with and or subconscious or conscious rejection of their offspring. In his special case, mother was a warm place, a frantic, hysteric voice, the pressure of the spasmodically contractile musculature linked to her hyperthyroid metabolism. Mother was a thing from before birth. Raya. Raya bore a strong resemblance to an intelligent cow. In any physiological sense, she could no more be his mother than— The second caress found him not unaccustomed to it. It enfolded his consciousness, tenderly, protectingly, empathetic. Fildy gave way to instinct. The fur along the ridge of Raya's spine prickled with a well-remembered happiness as she felt the hesitant answering surge in Fildy's mind. Moving surely forward, she nuzzled his face. Fildy grinned. He ran his fingers through the thick fur at the base of her short neck. Big, warm wall of brown fur. Cool, happy nose. Happy, happy eyes. Great joy welled up in Raya. No shameful trot across the mountains faced her now. No hesitant approach to the huddled, suspicious wildings was before her. The danger of sharp female hooves to be avoided, of sulking at the edge of the herd in hope of an anxious male, was a thing no longer to be half-fearfully approached. With a nudge of her head, she directed Fildy down the path to the old range, while she herself turned around. She stood motionless for a sweeping scan of the plain below her. The couples were scattered over the grass, but couples only, the females as yet unfulfilled. This, too, was another joy to add to the greatest of all. So many things about her calf were incomprehensible. The only dimly felt overtones of projected symbology that accompanied Fildy's emotional reactions. The alien structure. So many, many things. Her mind floundered vainly through the complex data. But all that was nothing. What did it matter? The time had been, and for another season, she was a dame. Fildy walked beside her down the path, one fist wrapped in the fur of her flank, short legs windmilling. They reached the plain, and Raya struck out across it toward the greatest concentration of people, her head proudly raised. She stopped once and deliberately cropped a mouthful of grass with unconcern, but resumed her pace immediately thereafter. With the same unconcern, she nudged Vildy into the center of the group of people, and, ignoring them, began teaching her calf to feed. Eat. Picture of Vildy calf on all fours cropping the plains grass. Vildy stared at her in puzzlement. Grass was not food. He sent the data emphatically. Raya felt the tenuous discontent. 
She replied with tender understanding. Sometimes the calf was hesitant. Eat. Gently, understandingly, but firmly. Repetition of picture. She bent her head and pushed him carefully over, then held his head down with a gentle pressure of her muzzle. Eat. Fildy squirmed. He slipped out from under her nose and regained his feet. He looked at the other people who were staring in puzzlement at Raya and himself. He felt himself pushed forward again. Eat. Abruptly he realized the situation. In a culture of herbivores, what food could there be but herbage? There would be milk in time, but not for, he probed, months. In probing, too, he found the visualization of his life with her ready at the surface of Raya's mind. There was no shelter on the plain. His fur was all the shelter necessary. But I don't have any fur. In the fall they would move to the southern range. Walk? A thousand miles? He would grow big and strong. In a year he would be a sire himself. His reaction was simple and practiced. He adjusted his reality concept to Riemannian topology. Not actually, but subjectively he felt himself beginning to slip earthward. Raya stiffened in alarm. The calf was straying. The knowledge was relayed from her mother's centers to the telepathic functions. Stop! You cannot go there. You must be with your mother. You are not grown. Stop! Stay with me. I will protect you. I love you. The universe shuddered. Fildy adjusted frantically. Cutting through the delicately maintained reality concept was a scrambling, jamming frequency of thought. In terror he flung himself backward into Raya's world. Standing completely still, he probed frantically into Raya's mind, and found her mind only fumbling, beginning to intellectualize the simple formulization of what her instinctive centers had computed systematized and activated before her conscious mind had even begun to doubt that everything was well. His mind accepted the data and computed. Handless and voiceless, not so fast afoot in their bulkiness as the weakest month-old calf, the people had long ago evolved the restraints necessary for rearing their children. If the calf romped and ran, his mother ran beside him, and the calf was not permitted to run faster than she. If a calf strayed from its sleeping mother, it strayed only so far, and then the mother woke. But the calf had already long been held back by the time her intelligence awoke to the straying. The knowledge and computations were fed into Fildy's rational centers. The universe and earth were closed to him. He must remain here. Human children could not survive in this environment. He had to find a solution. Instantly. He clenched his fists, feeling his arm muscles quiver. His lower lip was pulled into his mouth, and his teeth sank in. The diagram. The pattern. Bigger. Stronger. Try. Try. This is not real. This is real. Brown earth, white clouds, blue sky. Try. Mouth full of warm salt. F is for Fildy, O is for Out, R is for Raya, T is for Topology, H is for Happiness and Home. Raya shook herself. She stood in the furrows of a plowed field, her eyes vacant with bewilderment. She stared uncomprehendingly at the walls and the radar tower, the concrete shoulders of the air raid bunkers. She saw anti-aircraft quick firers being hastily cranked around and down at her heard Fildy's shout that saved her life, and understood none of it. But none of it mattered. Her strange calf was with her, standing beside her with his fingers locked in her fur, and she could feel the warm response in his mind as she touched him with her caress again. She saw the other little calves erupting out of the low dormitory buildings, and something within her crooned. Raya nuzzled her foundling. She looked about her at the war orphan's relocation farm with her happy, happy eyes. End of Raya's Foundling by Algis Budras By Mary Leinster This 
is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reading by Greg Marguerite Sam, This Is You by Mary Leinster You are not supposed to believe this story, and if you ask Sam Yoder about it, he's apt to say that it's all a lie. But Sam is a bit sensitive about it. He does not want the question of privacy to be raised again, especially in Rosie's hearing. And there are other matters, but it's all perfectly respectable and straightforward. It could have happened to anybody. Well, almost anybody. Anybody, say, who was a telephone lineman for the Batesville and Rappenhonic Telephone Company, and who happened to be engaged to Rosie, and who had been told admiringly by Rosie that a man as smart as he was ought to make something wonderful of himself. And, of course, anybody who'd taken that seriously and had been puttering around on a device to make private conversations on a party-line telephone possible, and almost had the trick. It began about six o'clock on July 2nd, when Sam was up a telephone pole near Bridge's Run. He was hunting for the place where that party line had gone dead. He'd hooked in his lineman's phone, and he couldn't raise Central, so he was just going to start looking for the break when his phone rang back, though the line had checked dead. Startled, he put the receiver to his ear. Hello? Who's this? Sam, this is you a voice replied. Huh? said Sam. What's that? This is you, the voice on the wire repeated. You, Sam Yoder. Don't you recognize your own voice? This is you, Sam Yoder, calling from the 12th of July. Don't hang up. Sam hadn't even thought of hanging up. He was annoyed. He was up a telephone pole trying to do some work, resting in his safety belt and with his climbing iron safely fixed in the wood. Naturally, he thought somebody was trying to joke with him, and when a man is working is no time for jokes. I'm not hanging up, said Sam dourly, but you better. The voice was familiar, though he couldn't quite place it. If it talked a little more, he undoubtedly would. He knew it just about as well as he knew his own, and it was irritating not to be able to call this joker by name. The voice said, Sam. It's the 2nd of July where you are, and you're up a pole by Bridges Run. The line's dead in two places, else I couldn't talk to you. Lucky, ain't it? Whoever you are, Sam said formidably, it ain't going to be lucky for you if you ever need telephone service and you've kept wasting my time. I'm busy. But I'm you, insisted the voice persuasively. And you're me. We're both the same Sam Yoder, only where I am it's July 12th, where you are it's July 2nd. You've heard of time traveling. Well, this is time talking. You're talking to yourself. That's me. And I'm talking to myself. That's you. And it looks like we've got a mighty good chance to get rich. Then something came into Sam's memory, and every muscle in his body went taut and tight, even as he was saying it to himself can't be. But he'd remembered that if a man stands in a corner and talks to the wall, his voice will sound to him just the way it sounds to somebody else. Being in the telephone business, he'd tried it, and now he did recognize the voice. It was his, his own, talking to him, which of course was impossible. Look, said hoarsely, I don't believe this. Then listen, the voice said briskly and Sam's face grew red. It burned. His ears began to feel scorched, because the voice, his voice, was telling him strictly private matters that nobody else in the world knew. Nobody but himself and Rosie. Quit it, groaned Sam. Somebody might be listening. Tell me what you want and ring off. The voice told him what it wanted, his own voice. It sounded pleased. It told him precisely what it wanted him to do, and then, very kindly, it told him exactly where the two breaks in the line were, and then it rang off. He sweated when he looked at the first of the two places. Adjoining was bad, and he fixed that. It was where his voice had said it would be, and that was as impossible as anything else. 
When he'd fixed the second break, Sam called Central and told her he was sick and was going home, and that if there were any other phones that needed fixing today, people were probably better off without phone service anyhow. He went home and washed his face and made himself a brew of coffee and drank it, and his memory turned out to be unimpaired. Presently he heard himself muttering. So he said defiantly, there ain't any crazy people in my family, so it ain't likely I've gone out of my head. But God knows nobody but Rosie knows about me telling her sentimental that her nose is so cute. I couldn't believe she ever had to blow it. Maybe it was me talking to myself. Talking to oneself is not abnormal. Lots of people do it. Sam missed out the conclusion to be drawn from the fact that he'd answered himself back. He reasoned painfully. If somebody drove over to Rappenhonick, past Dunsville, and telephoned back that there was a brush fire at Dunsville, I wouldn't be surprised to get to Dunsville and find a brush fire there. So if somebody phones back from next Tuesday that Mr. Broadius broke his leg next Tuesday, why, I shouldn't be surprised to get to next Tuesday and find he'd done it. Going to Rappenhonick, past Dunsville, and going to next Thursday, past next Tuesday, ain't so much difference. It's only the difference between a road map and a calendar. Then he began to see implications. He blinked. Yes, sir, he said in awe. I wouldn't have thought of it if I hadn't told myself on the telephone, but there is money to be made out of this. I must be near as smart as Rosie thinks I am. I'd better get that dinkus set up. He'd more or less half-heartedly worked out an idea of how a party-line telephone conversation could be made private, and just out of instinct, you might say, he'd accumulated around his house a lot of stuff that should have been on the phone company's inventory. There were condensers and transmitters and selective ringing bells and resistances and the like. He'd meant to put some of them together some day and see what happened, but he'd been too busy courting Rosie to get at it. Now he did get started. His own voice on the telephone had told him to. It had warned him that one thing he had intended wouldn't work and something else would. But it was essentially simple, after all. He finished it and cut off his line from Central and hooked this gadget in. He rang. Half a minute later, somebody rang back. Hello? said Sam, quivering. He'd broken the line to Central, remember. In theory, he shouldn't have gotten anybody anywhere, but a very familiar voice said, Hello? back at him, and Sam swallowed and said, Hello, Sam, this is you in the 2nd of July. The voice at the other end said cordially that Sam had done pretty well, and now the two of them, Sam in the here and now and Sam in the middle of the week after next, would proceed to get rich together. But the voice from July 12th sounded less absorbed in the conversation than Sam thought quite right. It seemed even abstracted, and Sam was at once sweating from the pure unreasonableness of the situation and conscious that he rated congratulations for the highly technical device he had built. After all, not everybody could build a time-talker. He said with some irony, If you're too busy to talk, I'll tell you replied the voice from the 12th of July, gratified. I am kind of busy right now. You'll understand when you get to where I am. Don't get mad, Sam. Tell you what, you go see Rosie and tell her about this and have a nice evening. <laughs> now what, asked Sam cagily, do you mean by that ha-ha? You'll find out, said the voice. Knowing what I know, I'll even double it. <laughs> there was a click. Sam rang back, but got no answer. He may have been the first man in history to take an objective and completely justified dislike to himself. But presently he grumbled. Smart, huh? Two can play at that. I'm the one that's got to do things if we're both going to get rich. He put his gadget carefully away and combed his hair and ate some cold food around the house and drove over to see Rosie. It was night and an errand which ordinarily would have seemed purely romantic. There were fireflies floating about, and the moon shone down splendidly, and a perfumed breeze carried mosquitoes from one place to another. 
It was the sort of night on which ordinarily Sam would have thought only of Rosie, and Rosie would have optimistic ideas about how housekeeping could, after all, be done on what Sam made a week. They got settled down in the hammock on Rosie's front porch, and Sam said expansively, Rosie, I've made up my mind to get rich. You ought to have everything your little heart desires. Suppose you tell me what you want, so I'll know how rich I've got to get. Rosie drew back. She looked sharply at Sam. Do you feel all right? He beamed at her. He'd never been married, and he didn't know how crazy it sounded to Rosie to be queried on how much money would satisfy her. There simply isn't any answer to the question. Listen, said Sam tenderly. Nobody knows it, but tonight Joe Hunt and the widow Bacchus are eloping to North Carolina to get married. We'll find out about it tomorrow. And day after tomorrow, on the Fourth of July, Dunsville is going to win the baseball game with Bradensburg seven to five, all tied till the ninth inning, and then George Peavy is going to hit a homer with Fred Holmes on second base. Rosie stared at him. Sam explained complacently. The Sam Yoder in the middle of the week after next had told him what to expect in those particular cases. He would tell him other things to expect. So Sam was going to get rich. Rosie said, Sam, somebody was playing a joke on you. Yeah, Sam answered comfortably. Who else but me knows what you said to me that time you thought I was mad at you and you were crying out back of the well house? Sam! And nobody else knows about that time we were picnicking and a bug got down the back of your dress and you thought it was a hornet. Sam Yoder! wailed Rosie. You never told anybody about that? Nope, said Sam truthfully. I never did. But the me in the week after next knew. He told me. So he had to be talking to me. Couldn't have been anybody else. Rosie gasped. Sam explained all over again, in detail. When he had finished, Rosie seemed dazed. Then she said desperately, Sam, either you've told somebody else everything we ever said or did together, or else there's somebody who knows every word we ever said to each other. That's awful. Do you really and truly mean to tell me?" Sure, I mean to tell you, said Sam happily. The me in the week after next called me up and talked about things nobody knows but you and me. Can't be no doubt at all. Rosie shivered. He, he knows every word we ever said? Then he knows every word we're saying now, she gulped. Sam Yoder, you go home. Sam gaped at her. She got up and backed away from him. D -d -d Do you think, she chattered despairingly, that, that I am going to talk to you and somebody else listens to every word I say and knows everything I do? D Do you think I'm going to marry you? Then she ran away, weeping noisily, and slammed the door on Sam. Her father came out presently, looking patient, and asked Sam to go home, so Rosie could finish crying and he could read his newspaper in peace. On the way back to his house, Sam meditated darkly. By the time he got there, he was furious. The him in the week after next could have warned him about this. He rang and rang and rang on the cut-off line with his gadget hooked in to call July the 12th, but there was no answer. When morning came, he rang again, but the phone was still dead. He loaded his tool kit in the truck and went off to work, feeling about as low as a man could feel. He felt lower when he reported at the office and somebody told him excitedly that Joe Hunt and the widow Bacchus had eloped to North Carolina to get married. Nobody would have tried to stop them if they had prosaically gotten married at home, but they had eloped to make it more romantic. It wasn't romantic to Sam. It was devastating proof that there was another him ten days off knowing everything he knew and more besides, and very likely laughing his head off at the fix Sam was in. Because obviously Rosie would be still more convinced when she heard this news. She'd know Sam wasn't crazy or the victim of a practical joke. He had told the truth. It wasn't the first time a man got in trouble with a woman by telling her the truth, but it was new to Sam and it hurt. He went over to Bradensburg that day to repair some broken lines, and around noon he went into a store to get something to eat. There were some local sportsmen in the store bragging to each other about what the Bradensburg baseball team would do to the Dunsville Nine. 
Sam said peevishly, Huh! Dunsville will win that game by two runs. Have you got any money that agrees with you? A local sportsman demanded pugnaciously. If you have, put it up and let somebody cover it. Sam wanted to draw back, but he had roused the civic pride of Bradensburg. He tried to temporize, and he was jeered at. In the end, philosophically, he dragged out all the money he had with him and bet it, eleven dollars. It was covered instantly, amid raucous laughter, and on the way back to Batesville he reflected unhappily that he was going to make eleven dollars out of knowing what was going to happen in the ninth inning of that ball game, but probably at the cost of losing Rosie. He tried to call his other self that night again. There was no more answer than before. He unhooked the gadget and restored normal service to himself. He rang Rosie's house. She answered the phone. Rosie, Sam asked earnestly, are you still mad at me? I was never mad at you, said Rosie, gulping. I'm mad at whoever was talking to you on the phone and knows all our private secrets, and I'm mad at you if you told him. But I didn't have to tell him. He's me. All he has to do is just remember. I tried to call him last night, and again this morning," he added bitterly. And he don't answer. Maybe he's gone off somewheres. I'm thinking it might be a, a, a kind of illusion, maybe. You told me there'd be an elopement last night, retorted Rosie, her voice wobbling. And there was. Joe Hunt and the Widow Bacchus, just like you said. It, it could have been a coincidence, suggested Sam, not too hopefully. I'm waiting to see if Dunsville beats Bradensburg seven to five tomorrow, tied to the ninth with George Peavy hitting a homer then with Fred Holmes on second base. If, if that happens, I'll, I'll die. Why? asked Sam. Because it'll mean I can't marry you ever, because somebody else will be looking over your shoulder, and we wouldn't ever be by ourselves all our lives, day or night. She hung up, weeping, and Sam swore slowly and steadily, and with a venom, while he worked to hook up his device again, which did not make a private conversation on a party line, but allowed a man to talk to himself ten days away from where he was. And then Sam rang and rang and rang, but he got no answer. The following day, in the big Fourth of July game, Dunsville beat Bradensburg seven to five. It was tied to the ninth. Then George Peavy hit a homer with Fred Holmes on second base. Sam collected his winnings, but grimly, without joy. He stayed home that night, worrying, and every so often trying to call himself up on a device he had invented and been told by himself to modify. It was a nice gadget, but Sam did not enjoy it. It was a nice night, too. There was moonlight, but Sam did not enjoy that, either. Moonlight wouldn't do Sam any good so long as there was another him in the middle of the week after next, refusing to talk to him so he could get out of the fix he was in. Next morning, though, the phone woke him. He swore at it out of habit until he got out of bed, and then he realized that his gadget was hooked in and Central was cut off. He made it in one jump to the instrument. Hello? Don't fret, said his own voice patronizingly. Rosie's going to make up with you. How in blazes do you know what she's going to do?" raged Sam. She won't marry me with you hanging around. I've been trying to figure out a way to get rid of you. Quiet, commanded the voice on the telephone irritably. I'm busy. I've got to go collect the money you've made for us. You collect money? I get in trouble and you collect money? I have to his voice said with the impatient patience of one speaking to a small idiot child, before you can have it. Listen here. Where you are, it's Wednesday. You're going over to Dunsville today to fix some phones. You'll be in Mr. Broadius's law office about half-past ten. You look out the window and notice a fella setting in a car in front of the bank. Notice him good. I won't do it, said Sam defiantly. I ain't taking any orders from you. Maybe you're me, but I make the money and you collect it. For all I know, you spend it before I get to it. I'm quitting this business right now. It's cost me my own true love and all my life's happiness, and to hell with you." You won't do it? 
his own voice asked nastily. Wait and see. So that morning the manager told Sam when he reported for work to drive over to Dunsville and check on some lines there. Sam balked. He said there were much more important lines needing repair elsewhere. The manager explained politely to Sam that Mr. Broadius, over in Dunsville, had been taken drunk at a Fourth of July party and fallen out of a window. He'd broken his leg, so it was a Christian duty to make sure he had a telephone in working order in his office, and Sam could get over there right away, or else. On the way to Dunsville, Sam morosely remembered that he'd known about Mr. Broadius's leg. He had told himself about it on the telephone. At half-past ten he was fixing Mr. Broadius's telephone when he remembered about the man he was supposed to get a good look at sitting in a car in front of the bank. He made an angry resolution not, under any circumstances, to glance outside of the lawyer's office. He meditated savagely that, by this resolution, the schemes of his other self in the future were abolished. Naturally, he presently went to the window and looked to see what he was abolishing. There was a car before the bank with a reddish-haired man sitting in it. A haze came out of the exhaust showing that the motor was running. None of this impressed Sam as remarkable, but as he looked, two other men came running out of the bank. One of them carried a bag, and both of them had revolvers out, and they piled into the car, and the reddish-haired man gunned it, and it was abruptly a dwindling speck and a cloud of dust getting out of town. Three seconds later old Mr. Blueford, president of the bank, came out yelling, and the cashier came after him, and it was a first-rate bank robbery they were yelling about. The man in the getaway car had departed with thirty-five thousand dollars. All of it had taken place so fast that Sam hardly realized what had happened when he went out to see what it was all about, and was instantly seized upon to do some work. The bank robbers had shot out the telephone cable out of town with a shotgun so word couldn't get ahead of them. Sam was needed to re-establish communications with the outside world. He did, absorbedly reflecting on the details of the robbery as he'd heard them. He was high up on a telephone pole, and the sheriff and enthusiastic citizens were streaking past in cars to make his labors unnecessary, when the personal aspect of all this affair hit him. "'My God!' gasped Sam, shocked. "'That me in the middle of next week told me to come over here and watch a bank robbery. But he didn't let on what was going to happen so as I could stop it.' He felt an incredulous indignation come over him. "'I would have been a hero!' he said resentfully. Rosie would have admired me. That other me is a born crook. Then he realized the facts. The other him was himself, only a week and a half distant. The other him was so far sunk in dastardliness that he permitted a crime to take place, feeling no more than sardonic amusement. And there was nothing he himself could do about it. He couldn't even tell the authorities about this depraved character. They wouldn't believe him unless he could get his other self on the telephone to admit his criminality. Even then, what could they do? Sam felt what little zest had been left in living go trickling out of his climbers. He looked into the future and saw nothing desirable in it. He painstakingly finished the repair of the shot-out telephone line, but then he went down to his truck and drove over to Rosie's house. There was but one thing he could do. Rosie came suspiciously to the door. "'I come to tell you goodbye, Rosie,' said Sam. "'I just found out I'm a criminal, so I aim to go and commit my crimes far away from my home and the friends who never thought I'd turn out this way. Goodbye, Rosie.' "'Sam,' said Rosie, "'what's happening now?' He told her about the bank robbery and how his own self, in the week after next, had known it was going to happen and told Sam to go watch it without giving him information by which it could have been stopped. He knew it after it happened, said Sam bitterly, and he could have told me about it before. He didn't. So he's an accessory to the crime, and he is me, which makes me an accessory too. Goodbye, Rosie. My own true love. You'll never see me again. You set down right here, Rosie ordered firmly. You haven't done a thing yet, so it's that other you who's a criminal. You haven't got a thing to run away for. But I'm going to have. I'm doomed to be a criminal. It's that me in the week after next. There's nothing to be done. 
Says who? I'm going to do something. Like what? asked Sam. I'm going to reform you, said Rosie, before you start. She was a determined girl, that Rosie. She marched inside and put on her blue jeans, then went to her father's woodshed where he kept his tools and got a monkey wrench and stuck it in her hip pocket. When she came to the truck, Sam said, What's the idea, Rosie? I'm riding around with you, replied Rosie with a grim air. You won't do anything criminal with me on hand, and if that other you starts talking to you on the telephone, I'm going to climb that pole and tell him where he gets off. If anybody could keep me from turning criminal, acknowledged Sam. It'd be you, Rosie. But that monkey wrench, what's it for? Rosie climbed into the seat beside him. You start having criminal ideas, she told him, and you'll find out. Now, you go on about your business, and I and the monkey wrench will look after your morals. This tender exchange happened only an hour or so after the robbery, and there was plenty of excitement around. But Sam went soberly about his work as telephone lineman. Rosie simply rode with him as a, well, it wasn't a bodyguard, but a sort of M.P. escort, morals police. Where he worked on a line, he called the central office to report, and he heard about the hunt for the bank robbers and told Rosie. It was good fortune that he'd been in Dunsville when the robbery had happened, because his prompt repair of the phone wires had spoiled the robbers' getaway plans. They hadn't gone ten miles from Dunsville before somebody fired a load of buckshot at them as their car roared by Lemon's store. They were passed before they realized they'd been shot at, but the buckshot had punctured the radiator, and two miles on they were stuck. They pushed their car off the road behind some bushes and struck out on foot, and the sheriff ran right past their car without seeing it. Then rain began to fall, and the bank robbers were wet and scared and desperate. They knew there'd be roadblocks set up everywhere, and they had that bag of money, part bills, but a lot of it silver, and all of Tidewater was up in arms. Taking evasive action, they hastily stuffed their pockets with small bills. There were no big ones, but dared not take too much lest the pockets bulge. They hid the major part of their loot in a hollow tree. They separated, going to nearby towns, while rain fell heavily and covered their trails and went to bed with chest colds. They felt miserable, but the rain washed away the scent they had left, and bloodhounds couldn't do a thing. None of this was known to Sam, of course. Rosie had taken charge of him, and she kept charge. She rode with him all the afternoon of the robbery. When quitting time came, he took her home and prepared to retire from the scene. But she said grimly, Oh, no, you don't. You're staying right here. You're going to sleep in my brother's room, and my pa is going to put a padlock on the door so you don't go roaming off to call up that no-account other you and get in more trouble. I might mess things up if I don't talk to him, Sam objected. He's messed things up enough by talking to you. The idea of repeating our private affairs. He hadn't ought to know them, and I'm not sure, she said ominously, that you didn't tell him. If you did, Sam Yoder. Sam didn't argue that point, for there was no argument to make. He was practically meek until he discovered after supper that the schedule for the evening was a game of cribbage played in the living room where Rosie's mother and father were. He mentioned unhappily to Rosie that they were acting like old married people without the fun of getting that way, but he said that only once. Rosie glared at him. And when bedtime came, she shooed him into her brother's room, and her father padlocked him in. He did not sleep well. Next morning there was Rosie in her blue jeans with a monkey wrench in her pocket, ready to go riding with him. She did. And the next day. And the next. Nothing happened. The State Banking Association put up a $5,000 reward for the bank robbers, and the insurance company put up some more, but there wasn't a trace of the criminals. There wasn't a trace of criminality about Sam, either. Rosie rode with him, but they exchanged not one single hand-squeeze, nor one melting glance, nor did they even play footsie while they were eating lunch in the truck outside a filling station. Their conduct was exemplary, and it wore on Sam. Possibly it wore on Rosie, too. One day, Sam said morosely, as he chewed on a ham sandwich at lunch, Rosie. I'm crazy about you, but this feels like I've been divorced without ever getting married first. 
and Rosie snapped. If I told you how I feel, that other you in the week after next would laugh his fool head off. So shut up! Things were bad, and they got no better. For nearly a week Rosie rode everywhere with Sam in his truck. They acted in a manner which Rosie's parents would, in theory, have approved, but didn't even begin to believe in. They did nothing the world could not have watched without their being embarrassed, and they said very little that all the world would not have been bored to hear. It must have been the 11th of July when they almost snapped at each other, and Rosie said bitterly, Let me drive a while. I need to put my mind on something that it don't make me mad to think about. Go ahead, Sam invited gloomily. He stopped the truck and got out the door. I don't look for any happiness in this world any more, anyway. He went around to the other side of the truck while she slid to the driver's seat. Tomorrow's going to be the twelfth, she said. Do you realize that? I hadn't given it much thought, admitted Sam. But what's the difference? That's the day where the other you was when he called you up the first time. That's right, said Sam morbidly. It is. And so far, added Rosie, jamming her foot viciously down on the accelerator, I've kept you honest. If you change into a scoundrel between now and tomorrow— She changed to second gear. The truck jerked and bounced. Hey! cried Sam. Watch your driving! Don't you tell me how to drive! But if I get killed before tomorrow— Rosie changed gear again, but too soon. The truck buckled and she jammed down the accelerator again, and it almost leaped off the road. If you get killed before tomorrow, raged Rosie, it'll serve you right. I've been thinking and thinking and thinking, and even if I stop you from being a crook, there'll always be that other you knowing everything we say and do. She was hitting forty miles an hour and speeding up. So there'd still be no use, no hope anyway. She sobbed, partly in fury and partly in grief, and the roadway curved sharply just about there, and she swung the truck crazily around it, and there was a car standing only halfway off the road. Sam grabbed for the steering wheel, but there wasn't time. The light half-truck, still accelerating, hit the parked car with the noise of dozens of empty oil drums falling downstairs. The truck slewed around, bounced back, and then it charged forward and slammed into the parked car a second time. Then it stalled. Somebody yelled at Sam. He got out of the truck, looking at the damage and trying to figure out how it was that neither he nor Rosie had been killed, and trying worriedly to think how he was going to explain to the telephone company that he'd let Rosie drive. The voice yelled louder. Right at the edge of the woodland, there was a reddish-haired character screaming at him and tugging at his hip pocket. The words he used were not fit for Rosie's shell-like ears, even if they probably came near matching the way she felt. The reddish-haired man said more nasty words at the top of his voice. His hand came out of his hip pocket with something glittering in it. Sam was swinging when the glitter began, and he connected before the gun fired. There was a sort of squashy, smacking sound, and the reddish-haired man lay down quietly in the road. My God! said Sam blankly. This was the fella in front of the bank. He's one of those robbers. He stared. There was a loud crashing in the brushwood. The accident had happened at the edge of some woodland, and Sam did not need a high IQ to know that the friends of the red-haired man must be on the way. A second later he saw them. Rosie was just getting out of the car then. She was very pale, and there wasn't time to tell her to get started up, if possible, and away from there. One of the two running men was carrying a canvas bag with the words, Bank of Dunsville, on it. The men came at Sam, meanwhile expressing opinions of the state of things, of Sam, of the cosmos, of everything but the weather, in terms even more reprehensible than the first man had used. They saw the reddish-haired man lying on the ground. One of them, he'd come out into the road behind the truck and was running toward Sam, jerked out a pistol. He was about to use it on Sam at a range of something like six feet when there was a peculiar noise behind him. It was a sort of hollow clunk, which, even at such a time, needed to have attention paid to it. He jerked his head around to see. The clunk had been made by Rosie's monkey wrench, falling imperatively on the head of the second man to come out of the woods. 
She had carried it to use on Sam, but she used it instead on a total stranger. He fell down and lay peacefully still. Then Sam swung a second time at the second man to draw a pistol on him. Then there was only the sweet singing of birds among the trees and the whirring and other insect noises of creatures in the grass and brushwood. Presently there were other noises, but they were made by Rosie. She wept, hanging on to Sam. He unwound her arms from around his neck and thoughtfully went to the back of the truck and got out some phone wires and his pliers. He fastened the three strangers, hands together behind them, and then their feet, and he piled them in the back of the light truck along with the money they had stolen. They came to one by one, and Sam explained severely that they must watch their language in the presence of a lady. The three were so dazed, though, by what had befallen them that the warning wasn't really necessary. Rosie's parents would have been pleased at how completely proper their behavior was, while they took the three bank robbers into town and turned them over to the sheriff. That night Rosie sat out on the porch with Sam, and they discussed the particular event of the day in some detail. But Rosie was still concerned about the other Sam. So Sam decided to assert himself. About half-past nine, he said firmly, Well, Rosie, I guess I'd better be getting along home. I've got to try one more time to call myself up on the telephone and tell me to mind my own business. Says who? demanded Rosie. You're staying locked up right here tonight, and I'm riding with you tomorrow. If I kept you honest this far, I can keep it up till sundown tomorrow. Then maybe it'll stick. Sam protested, but Rosie was adamant, not only about keeping him from being a crook, but from having any fun to justify his virtue. She shooed him into her brother's room, and her father locked him in. And Sam did not sleep very well, because it looked as though virtue wasn't even its own reward. He sat up, brooding. It must have been close to dawn when the obvious hit him. Then he gazed blankly at the wall and said, My God, of course! He grinned, all by himself, practically from head to foot. And at breakfast he hummed contentedly as he stuffed himself with pancakes and syrup, and Rosie's depressed expression changed to a baffled alarm. He smiled tenderly upon her when she came doggedly out to the truck, wearing her blue jeans with her monkey wrench in her pocket. They started off the same as any other day, and he told her amiably, Rosie, the sheriff says we get five thousand dollars reward from the Bankers Association, and there's more from the insurance company, and there's odd bits of change offered for those fellows for past performances. We're going to be right well off. Rosie looked at him gloomily. There was still the matter of the other Sam in the middle of the week after next, and just then Sam, who had been watching the telephone lines beside the road as he drove, pulled off the road and put on his climbing irons. "'What's this?' asked Rosie frightenedly. "'You know—' "'You listen,' said Sam, completely serene. He climbed zestfully to the top of the pole. He hooked in the little gadget that didn't make private conversations possible on a party line, but did make it possible for a man to talk to himself ten days in the future. Or the past. "'Hello?' said Sam, up at the top of the telephone pole. "'Sam, this is you.' A voice he knew perfectly well sounded in the receiver. Huh? Who's that? This is you, said Sam. You, Sam Yoder. Don't you recognize your own voice? This is you, Sam Yoder, calling from the 12th of July. Don't hang up. He heard Rosie gasp, all the way down there in the banged-up telephone truck. Sam had seen the self-evident at last, and now, in the 12th of July, he was talking to himself on the telephone. Only, instead of talking to himself in the week after next, he was talking to himself in the week before last. He, being back there ten days before, working on this very same telephone line on this very same pole. And it was the same conversation, word for word. When he came down the pole rather expansively, Rosie grabbed him and wept. Oh, Sam, she sobbed. It was you all the time. Yeah, said Sam complacently. I figured it out last night. 
that me back there in the second of July, he's cussing me out, and he's going to tell you about it, and you're going to get all wrought up. But I can't make that dumb me back yonder do what has to be done. And you and me, Rosie, have got a lot of money coming to us. I'm going to carry on through, so he'll earn it for us. But I'm warning you, Rosie, he'll be back at my house waiting for me to talk to him tonight, and I've got to be home to tell him to go over to your house. I'm going to say, <laughs> at him. Uh, all right, said Rosie, wide-eyed. You can. But I remember that when I call me up tonight, back there ten days ago, I'm going to be right busy here and now. I'm going to make me mad, because I don't want to waste time talking to myself back yonder. Remember? Now what, asked Sam mildly, would I be doing tonight that would make me not want to waste time talking to myself ten days ago? You got any ideas, Rosie? Sam Yoder! I wouldn't! I never heard of such a thing! Sam looked at her and shook his head regretfully. Too bad. If you won't, I guess I've got to call me up in the week after next and find out what's cooking. You... you shan't! said Rosie fiercely. I'll get even with you, but you shan't talk to that... Then she wailed. Darn you, Sam! Even if I do have to marry you so you'll be wanting to talk to me instead of that dumb you ten days back, you're not going to... you're not... Sam grinned. He kissed her. He put her in the truck, and they rode off to Batesville to get married. And they did. But you're not supposed to believe all this. And if you ask Sam Yoder about it, he's apt to tell you it's all a lie. He doesn't want to talk about private party lines, either. And there are other matters. For instance, Sam's getting to be a pretty prominent citizen these days. He makes a lot of money, one way and another. Nobody around home will ever bet with him on who's going to win at sports and elections, anyhow. End of Sam, This Is You by Murray Leinster Low for me by Frank W. Coggins. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Emily Burke at the University of Southern California. Say Hello for Me by Frank W. Coggins. This was to be THE day, but of course Professor Pettibone had no way of knowing it. He arose, as he had been doing for the previous twenty years, donned the tattered remnants of his spacesuit, and went out into the open. He stood erect, bronzed, magnificent, faced distant earth, and recited, Good morning, bright sunshine, we're glad you are here. You make the world happy and bring us good cheer. It was something he had heard as a child, and, isolated here on Mars, he had remembered it, and used it to keep from losing his power of speech. The ritual finished, he walked to the end of the nearest canal, and gathered a bushel or so of dried Martian moss. He returned and began polishing the shiny exterior of the wrecked spaceship. It had to really glitter if it was to be an effective beacon in guiding the rescue ship. Professor Pettibone knew, had known for years, that a ship would come. It was just a matter of time and as the years slipped by, his face diminished not a whit. With his task half completed, he glanced up at the sun and quickened the polishing. It was a long walk to the place the berry bushes grew, and if he arrived too late, the sun would have dried out the night's crop of fragile berries, and he would wait until the morrow for nourishment. But on this day he was fated to arrive at the bush area not at all, because an alien sound from above again drew the professor's eyes from his work, and he knew that that the day had arrived. The ship was three times as large as any he had ever visualized, and its futuristic design told him, sharply, how far he had fallen behind in his dreaming. He smiled and said, quite calmly, I dare say I am about to be rescued. And he experienced a thrill as the great ship set down and two men emerged therefrom. 
a thrill tinged with a guilt sense, because emotional experiences were rare in an isolated life and seemed somehow indecent. The two men held weapons. They advanced upon Professor Pettibone, looked up into his face, reflected a certain wary hostility. That the hostility was tinged with instinctive respect, even awe, made it no less potent. One of them asked, "Fella, man came in ship, sky boat, long time ago. Him dead? Where?" Appropriate gestures accompanied the words. Professor Pettibone smiled down at the little men and bowed. "Of course, you are referring to me. I came in the ship. I am Professor Pettibone." It was nice of you to hunt me up. The eyes of the two Terran spacemen met and locked in startled inquiry. One of them voiced the reaction of both when he said, What the hell? You no doubt are curious as to the fate of the other members of the expedition. They were killed, all save Fletcher, who lasted a week. Professor Pettibone waved a hand. There, in the graveyard. But their eyes remained on the only survivor of that ill-fated first expedition. It was hard to accept him as the man they sought, but, faced with undeniable similarity between what they expected and what they had found, the two spacemen had no alternative. "'I hope your food supply is ample, and varied,' Professor Pettibone said. This seemed to bring them out of their bemusement. "'Of course, Professor. Would you care to come aboard?' The other made a try at congenial levity. You must be pretty hungry after twenty years. Really? Has it been that long? I tried to keep track at first. We can blast off any time you say. You're probably pretty anxious to get back. Indeed I am. The changes in twenty years must be breathtaking. I wonder if they'll remember me. A short time later, the professor said, It's amazing. A ship of this size handled by only two men. Then he sat down to a repast laid out by one of the odd spacemen. But after nibbling a bit of this, a forkful of that, he found that satisfaction lay in the anticipation more so than in the eating. We'll look around and see what we can find in the way of clothing for you, Professor, said one of the spacemen. Then the man's bemusement returned. His eyes traveled over the magnificent physique before him, the perfect giant of a man, the great Apollo-like head with the calm, clear eyes, the expression of complete contentment and serenity. The spaceman said, Professor, to what do you attribute the changes in your body? What is there about this planet? I really don't know, Professor Pettibone looked down at his torso with an impersonal eye. I think the greenish skin pigmentation is a result of the mineral-heavy vapors that occurred during certain seasons, the growth. As to my body, I really don't know. But the two spacemen, though they didn't refer to it, were not concerned with the body so much as the aura of completeness, the radiation of contentment, which came from somewhere within. And it was passing strange that nothing more was said about the professor returning to Earth. No great revelation suddenly arrived at that he would not go. Rather, they discussed various things that three gentlemen meeting casually would discuss. Then Professor Pettibone arose from his chair and said, It was kind of you to drop off and see me. And one of the spacemen replied, A pleasure, sir, a real pleasure indeed. Then the professor left the ship and watched it lift up on a tail of red fire and go away. He raised an arm and waved. "'Say hello for me,' he called. Then he turned away and, from force of habit, he began again to polish the hull, knowing that he would keep it shining and be proud of it for many years to come. Almost beyond reach of the planet, one of the spacemen flipped a switch and put a certain sensitive communication mechanisms to work, so sensitive they could pick up etheric vibrations far away and make them audible, but only faintly came the pleasant voice of a contented man. Good morning, bright sunshine. We're glad you are here. You make the world. End of Say Hello for Me by Frank W. Coggins By Basil Eugene Wells
This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Frank Malanga. Second Sight by Basil Eugene Wells. His fingers moved over the modest packet of bills the invisible rockhound had handed to him. He smiled through the eternal night that was his own personal hell, Dugan's Hades. Thanks, Pete, he said gratefully. Here, have a box of Conmos. His sensitized fingers found the cigars, handed over a box, and he heard the nervous scuff of the other's shoes. The 8,000 means that I can see again, for a while at least. Take them, it's little enough. Look, Dugan, I get 800 for selling you the ticket on the breakthrough time. Keep the cigars. You need the dough. Feet pounded, thumping into swift inaudibility along the tenth level's yielding walkway. His fingers caressed the crisp notes that his lucky guess on the eightieth level's tunnel juncture had won for him, plus the ten dollars that this meager business could ill afford it had cost to join the rockhound's pool. But now he was free, his own man. He was released from the calculated economies of his wife. Janeth knew to within a few dollars what his newsstand on the tenth level should make. He had never been able to save the necessary thousand-dollar deposit and ten dollars an hour that a rented super mech cost. And she would never listen to his pleas that he must see again, if only for an hour. Waste ten or twenty dollars for nothing, she would storm. We have all your hospital bills to pay. I need new clothes. Your stock in the stands is too small. What she had left unspoken was the fact that she must secretly have hated his engineering career in the deep levels under Appalachia, and that she was dedicated to preventing his possible return. After three years of blindness under his wife's firm dominance, Dugan felt only hate for her. With this sudden fortune he could be independent. He could divorce her. He could rent a super mech, even return to work in the ever-deepening levels of Appalachia City. First of all, he must see again. He closed up the news and cigar stand. With his keen, sensitive radar button pulsating beneath his fingers, he hurried along the walkway toward the nearest super mech showroom. It was less than three blocks. Be sure that all the contacts are against the skull and neck, the salesman was saying, his voice muffled by the mentrol hood covering Dugan's head and shoulders. Of course, Dugan's impatience made his voice shrill. I've used mentrals before when inspecting cave-ins and such. Very well, sir. The man's voice was relieved. Probably he hated his job as much as Dugan hated his cigars and news. Dugan tripped the switches and heard the building hum of power. An odd sort of vibration that his mind told him was purely emotional seemed to be permeating his whole body. Abruptly, the transition was complete. He was no longer lying on the padded bench beneath the mentrol hood. He was standing, erect, conscious of the retaining clamps that held him upright. He gulped a deep draft of air into the artificial lungs that did not need oxygen, and his mechanical pulse quickened. His eyes slitted open, drinking in by degrees the mirrored mentrol booth and the pallid, fat little man sitting beside his hooded body. He stepped out of the clamps, his sharpened senses aware of softness, and hardness, and scent, and color that human weakness so often blurs. This super mech that was linked directly with his brain by twin mentrols was tall, chunky, and gray of eye and hair. In a general way, it was a duplicate of his own body, but there was no facial resemblance. How do you like it, sir? The fat smile was empty, almost apologetic. We have younger, more handsome models. Well enough, Dugan started donning the clothing that he had removed. I'll want the mech for five, possibly ten hours. I'll make a slip for ten hours, sir. We'll refund any balance due you, but after ten hours... I know, you must report the mech missing. But with my body here, you can't lose. The salesman smiled enigmatically. We have, he said. Dugan shrugged. He was impatient to be outside, feasting his starved vision on the stores and parks of the various upper levels. 
He might even take a lift to the outside. It had been fifteen years ago, while their youngest son was a baby, that they had taken a weekend motor trip to the great scar that had been Manhattan. He remembered the vastness and the rawness of the uncontrolled atmosphere. It had been beautiful, but also a bit terrifying. It was a ten years delayed honeymoon. And now Merle was in the rocket corps, and Janeth and he were like strangers. Dugan zippered shut his gray check jacket and left the booth. He walked slowly, savoring every picture of the crowded passenger strips beyond the walkway, and of the fairy spans of moving walkways crossing the travel strips. The soft glow of the level ceiling, fifty feet above, illuminated the double rows of apartment and storefronts. It was good to see again. Every twelfth section of the level was a park. The greenery was fresher and brighter than he remembered. The tree boles and the branches were marvels of grace and strength. He strolled along the paths, impatient to be moving on, but aching with the emerald beauty around him. He took the lifts to the upper levels. He rode the swiftest walkways and travel strips, his eyes drinking in the long hidden sights. From an observation dome he looked out over the wooden mountain slopes of outside and saw the telltale ridging of rock and earth that marked the scores of hidden vehicular tubes linking Appalachia with its sister cities of Ondak and Smoky. His five hours stretched into seven, and then eight. Slowly determination to keep these eyes at whatever cost was building within him. Always before he had agreed when Janeth decided. He had been so dependent on her those first terrible weeks. But now, with this money from the breakthrough pool, he could rent a super mech, live as a man should live. Dugan left the employment booth on the twentieth level, a badge on his jacket and a half grin on his full super mech's lips. On the records, he was now Al Dugan, a second cousin from Montana. He knew that nothing in the world could bring Al further east than Ozarka. Just to be safe, however, he decided to drop Al a line to explain. As far as his wife was concerned, Merle Dugan was gone, dead and buried. She could get a divorce if she wanted and marry that podgy pink skull boss of hers at the advertising agency. Five hundred a month, Dugan told himself. Two fifty for the rental, fifty for insurance, maybe fifty or so for spare parts. That leaves about a hundred and fifty for me. He was starting at the bottom as a rock hog, a mucker, a clean-up man in the newly opened 80th level, and his wages were the minimum union scale. He took the lift down to the 79th level, flashed his new badge at the guards, and took the gritty freight lift to the lowest level of the sprawling metropolis. You gain short? he asked the lanky man bent over the litter desk in the rough plastic bubble that served as an office. Sharp black eyes studied him, noted the bright new olive badge, and the creased, obviously new, coveralls. You're the new rock hog. Yes, sir. Al Dugan. Any experience? Montana? Mining. Had some engineering. Worked in Ozarka on tunnels. The lank man nodded expressionless. You'll hog for a while. Later, we'll see. Any relation to the Dugan we lost a couple years back? We're cousins. Tough he couldn't see his way clear to try again. He may snap out of it yet. We could use a few more like him. I'll, I'll talk with him, promised Dugan. He fought back the words that wanted to pour out. Whether it was a strange sense of loyalty to his wife, or a stubborn sort of pride, he could not bring himself to speak ill of her. A super mech is not so bad, Dugan. Short flexed the skinny arm. I've worn this one since a rock slide crushed my back. Yes, sir, Dugan agreed. Short scribbled on a form, handed it to Dugan. Take this down to Ted Roosh. He's the short, dark fellow bossing the rock hogs. He'll see you're issued your tools. Dugan nodded and turned away. In the super mech hostel on the 79th level, Dugan shared a compartment of six sleeping and mentrol plates. All of the others were rockhounds, and three of them worked on his own cleanup gang. His immediate pusher, Ted Roosh, was a legless, dark and hairy man, much like his working super mech. Wade and Mayam, 
The first, tall and once handsome, and the latter, bony and scarred, were both paralytics. Dugan's share of the attendant's salary amounted to another fifty dollars monthly. He was not growing too wealthy. And how do you like it after three weeks, Al? Roosh demanded from where he balanced on the cushioned sleeping plate. Dugan stretched cramped limbs and turned his sightless face toward Roosh's voice. Seems good to be working again, Ted, he said. This is your last day with us, Al. Orders from short. He's transferring you. Office work, I guess. Or maybe he's making you a foreman. Roosh's voice was curious. He must have found out something about you, Al. It's funny, but you look awful familiar to me, too. And you know more about tunnels than you let on. How about leveling with a guy? Not now. Dugan was thinking of the other listening men. After we've cleaned up and eaten, see you in the park outside the hostel. Right. Dugan's thoughts were muddled. Fingerprints, probably. At every super mech hostel, all guests were printed and taped, and possibly through his similar name. Short must have been suspicious from the first. And if he had come to the hostel to see Dugan's mentral hooded face while Dugan worked, his identification must have been sure. Short knew that he was Merle Dugan, and before too long Janeth and all his friends, if he had any left now, would know he had been in hiding here. He hurried to eat and get ready for another period under the Mentrol's hooded probes. Less than half an hour later he strode out of the hostel, his super mech gleaming and clean, and his jacket and shorts newly pressed. He met Roosh in the park, and they headed for the lift to the upper level. En route to the tenth level, he explained. I thought you looked like somebody I should know, Roosh scrubbed at his pseudo-beard's coarseness. Accident left you sort of psychoed, huh? So you were scared of the levels. Had to try coming back with a false name? Dugan gulped. It was a believable sort of yarn. He hadn't taken time to concoct a story. Why not? Something like that. I guess I was badly shook, Ted. So now you go back to being engineer at a thousand or so, and I'm still a rock hog, Roosh shrugged. Less headaches, anyway. They stepped off the lift at the tenth level and took the high-speed strip toward the business section. Dugan had it in his mind to see Janeth and tell her she had failed, that he was his own man again. She would be at the office. He would tell her off and leave. And then he'd show Roosh some of the high spots of the low number levels of Appalachia. The darkness came about them swiftly. To Dugan it was like a return to the nightmare of sightlessness. Under their feet the racing strip faltered and stalled. They were thrown off their feet and sprawled on the fiber-ribbed squares of the checkerboarded way's surface. What is it? demanded Roosh. He fought back the panic. This was not true blindness. Criminals, they set off a few dozen midnight bombs and try to rob banks or stores. We get these attacks quite often. Last long? Emergency ventilation will clear it out in a couple of minutes and the squads will have them in half an hour. They never get very far. They sat close together to wait. From the walkways and stalled strips, shrieks and frightened cries sounded. The sound seemed increased from behind them. This is my first time above the twentieth level, Rouge confided. Thirty-five years, and I never saw the outside. I don't think I like it up this high. It'll be over in a little while, Ted. Probably just a group of teenagers looking for thrills. He laughed dryly. They'll end up with blank memories and new faces like those who tried before them. Listen, muttered Rouge. In the lightlessness and above the wailing of the terrified people about them, they could hear the scuff of running feet. They were coming closer at a swift pace. In a moment, the runners would collide with them. Dugan's years of blindness had given him the ability to judge and gauge distance from sound. At the proper instant he pounced, his hands clamping around the body, and a second body crashed into the leader. They went down in a tangle. He heard Roosh shouting and fists battering and the tinkle of metal or crystal on metal. He was fighting desperately, 
his super mech strength overtaxed. The unseen man's hands tore at his neck and shoulder, ripping away the synthetic flesh and bearing the complex framework beneath. Then his hand caught an arm, and he exerted the full strength of his mech power until now carefully subdued. The entire arm tore away from its shoulder. And yet the wounded man continued to attack. It was only then that he realized this must be a super mech. The criminals must have stolen one or two super mechs and were using them in this robbery. He was ruthless then. He wrenched away the other arm. He battered at the unseen torso. The feet of the desperate mech smashed at his knees and thighs, staggering him. Then he bore the armless torso of the mech backward and fell upon it. The mech went limp, its mentrols blanked by the distant criminal who controlled it. Dugan came to his feet, listening for the sound of battle between Rush and his captive. It came from his right, faintly. About ten feet distant, he judged it. And now the emergency vents were clearing the darkness from the travel strips. Twilight faded and vision replaced it. Roosh was sitting astride a prone body, and even as Dugan reached his side, the struggling criminal's arms and legs went limp. Roosh grunted and started to stand. A super mech, he said. He rubbed thoughtfully at his disarranged nose and cheeks, smoothing them again into their normal contours. What about yours? The same. Here's your loot, anyhow, Ruth said, holding up a small gray plastine bag. Drop it, Ted. We better fade out of here before the squads arrive, too. They might think we're not on your life, Al. We should get a reward. Picks on the newswires and tapes. Dugan shrugged and smoothed at his own neck and face. Four red-uniformed men, their heads hidden by ovoid gas helmets, came hissing toward them along the travel strip. They rode single-wheeled cycles, and their rapid-fire exposers were trained on them. Careful now, Ted. Let me do the talking. They like to use paralysis needles and question later. But I've lived up here. The unicycles braked to a halt. Step over here slow, ordered one of the squad men. Dugan obeyed, careful to keep his arms rigid. Of course, paralysis needles would cause this mech body no damage, but why make trouble? They had more destructive weapons. Ran into us, he said mildly. We figured something wrong. Honest men would be standing where they were. We stopped them. The four members of the squad were inspecting the damage. I guess you did, one of them said admiringly. You must be super mechs, too. That's right. I'm Dugan. Al Merrill Dugan. And this is my friend Ted Roosh. We work on the 80th level. Rockhounds. Dugan? The man's voice was suddenly strained. Maybe you're not so clear as you pretend. A woman got in the way by accident, supposedly, of their getaway from the bank. Her name was Dugan, too. Dugan started forward, remembered the ugly exploder muzzles, and backed away. Was her name Janeth? he demanded. Radio report didn't say. Contact them, Joe, he told one of the other faceless men. Couldn't be you hired these two to kill her and pretend the robbery, he inquired. Of course not. One of the squad mumbled something. Dugan's interrogator dropped his weapon's muzzle. Woman twisted her ankle trying to get out of the way and fell. Received a cut on her temple and is being taken to the hospital. Accidental, all right. But her name? Janeth. Dugan felt a strange mingling of anger and of tenderness. The anger was directed toward the criminals. Could I go to her now? Rouge can fill you in on details. It's not... Oh, all right. Regulations aren't too strict on these levels. She your sister? Wife. He turned to Rouge. See you at the lift in about an hour, he said, and headed for the advertising agency where Janeth was employed. We haven't been informed as to our whereabouts yet, Mr. Dugan. The receptionist at Duffy's offices said coldly. Dugan glared down into the carefully pretty face, the solar lamp tan and the knife-smooth wrinkles. Now see here, Blanche, he said, and sputtered impotently. See here yourself, Merle Dugan. 
the woman spat back sharply. After all, you come running back just because she's hurt? Why didn't you come back like this a year ago? I was with her a year ago. That wasn't you. You didn't have guts enough to rent a super mech and go back to your old job. The woman laughed. Janeth tried to insult the needle you into being a man again, and you just crawled. That's a lie, Dugan cried. I begged her to let me go back. She wouldn't listen. That's what you say now. You don't want to remember. I know. I was here all the time. Many a time Janeth has come to the office crying and told me how hopeless it seemed. You're, you're inventing all this, Blanche, he accused. I wish I were. Remember, Merle, think. Be honest with yourself. Blanche put her nervous, blue-veined hand on his arm. A detached part of his brain noted how bony and brittle her hand was. She's loved you all these years, Merle. The tiny hand dug into his jacket sleeve. To make you well again, she risked losing your love. And she lost. Blanche must be all of fifty, perhaps fifty-five, the analytical portion of his mind noted. Old maidish in many ways, despite her five ex-husbands, yet so sentimental. It's all part of her scheme. Pretend to be the patient, long-suffering wife, and then secretly forbid me to go back to the deep levels again. You don't know. The woman's tired eyes sparkled green. Her little fists cracked against his chest. She turned half away from him. But I do know. I sat up with you many nights while Janeth got a few hours of rest. You were like a baby, slobbering and whimpering in your sleep. The days were worse. You were drunk and shouting and weeping. To you, blindness was the end. Merle gulped. He could remember nothing of the sort. Only the accident and awakening in the hospital to darkness. But there was a strange blankness, a hiatus in his memories that ended with his hated job in the cigar stand. He could not recall his first day there. Or... Could Blanche be telling the truth? You, spiteful old hag, he shouted at her and rushed out of the offices. His feet pounded at the yielding softness of the walkway. The hospital was less than two blocks distant. No need to take a travel strip and he needed the automatic motion of walking to steady his thoughts. The forgotten months. Four months, or was it five months ago, he was in the cigar and newsstand. That was the day when an old acquaintance from the lower level sold him the chance on the 80th level's breakthrough. That night he had begged Janeth to let him rent a super mech, and she had scoffed at his wastefulness. Yet, now that he remembered it again, there had been a wistful note of hope in her voice. Could she have been trying to fan his faint desire for sight into something more powerful and consuming, so he would become again the engineering Dugan he had been? He had surrendered then, as he did many times afterward. Sullenly, yes, but he had surrendered. Perhaps she knew he was not ready for sight. When he refused to obey her, when he insisted on hiring a super mech, then perhaps she would know the cure was complete. But that was only theory. He remembered her clearly expressed hatred for the mucking, lower-level life of a rockhound. Always his hatred for her grew as she spoke of his work. She had never expressed herself in that way before the accident. She had gone with him on many exploratory trips into the caverns that the lower levels of Appalachia cut across. And she had enjoyed the experience. He was sure of that. Remember. Think back. Back before the cigars and papers. Back to the days and months after the accident. It hurt to think. His temples, here on the mentrol hooded sleeping plate, were pounding irregularly. Huddling in a bed, knees drawn up and head tucked in, trying to gain somehow the safety that an infant once knew. Janet's voice, soft and understanding, and the acid of panic that set his lips to mumbling meaningless jargon. Why had Janet not sent him to the medical centers for mental clearing and re-education, as was done with all cases of psychodabnormals? The answer was with him. 
She loved him as he was, Merle Dugan, not as a new personality in her husband's body. Artificial amnesia automatically dissolves all marriage partnerships. She had not wanted that. Instead, she had three years of hell. Striking out at emptiness, his fists contacting soft flesh, and the pained cry, swiftly suppressed, of Janeth. His voice cursing and high-pitched as he fought the straps that now were restraining his sightless body. The bite of a needle and gradual disillusion of feeling. Memory was coming reluctantly back to Dugan. This was not the self-imagined visionings of an abused, helpless man. These memories were true. He had fought against all mental therapy and turned from those who loved him. Now the hospital entrance was before him. He paused for a moment and then went inside. The automatic hush of the door shutting out the muted street sounds was all too familiar. Mrs. Janeth Dugan, he told the crisply white woman at the desk. Room 212, second floor. Thank you. He used the steps in preference to the lift. He needed more time to think. Would he ever find enough time? Undoubtedly, now, Janet's love for him was dead. His desertion of her must have finished the dissolution of their marriage. It had been cowardly. He should have faced her and declared what he was going to do and what she could do. These past weeks, working with the Rock Hogs, had been invaluable. They had restored something of his self-esteem. The second floor. Pastel bare walls and soft voices. The odors. 208 and opposite 209. A wheelchair, propelled by a timidly smiling white-haired woman. He nodded automatically. 210. What could he say to her? That he was sorry she was hurt and that he was such a fool? And then back to the super mech hostel and the five other cripples who shared the room? 212. The door ajar. A private room. He was glad of that. The headache was more violent now. There was a bitter taste in his mouth as a super mech entered the room. She was alone, looking tiny and helpless on the high bed. To him, after three years, she was more beautiful than he remembered, even though the pure whiteness of her once graying hair startled him. Janeth, he said uncertainly. She turned her head, curiosity in her expression, and then understanding came. There was no mistaking the warmth and welcome that came into her eyes. She held out her arms. Doogie, she commanded. Come here. And he knew then, without ever being told, that his revolt and flight had all been part of the therapy, and Janeth had known all the time where he had been. End of Second Sight by Basil Wells Recording by Frank Malanga, Pembroke Pines, Florida Problem by M. C. Pease This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Frank Malanga this One Problem by M. C. Pease Mark Polder, resident comptroller of Torin, strolled idly down the dusty littered path that passed for a street. In the half-light of the pint-sized moon overhead, the town looked almost romantic. One day, when civilization had at last been brought to these asteroid bases, memory would make Torin heroic. But now, with the fact before the eyes, it was merely dirty and squalid. Only the scum of the solar system called it home. Idly, Mark Polder pushed a swinging door aside and entered what passed on Torrin for a restaurant. Pushing his way through the tables until he saw his only aide, female personnel manager, Lee Trainer, he sat down. What's new? he asked. Not a thing. 
but for a certain softness of voice and curve of unmade-up lips, Lee could have passed for a boy. Her light hair was short. She wore a man's coveralls. She added, Only the usual murder, arson, and brigandage that you don't want to hear about. Don't let such trifles get you down, said Mark with a crooked half-smile. I'm fed up, the girl said shortly. I must have been still wet behind the ears when I agreed to come out here two months ago. I thought I was going to help establish a place where decent people could live and work. So far I've just watched my boss swig Venerian swamp beer with the worst elements in town, and do nothing about the lawlessness that runs riot all over the place. Look, lady, Mark answered gently, I certainly admire those lofty sentiments of yours. I admit they are maybe what ought to be, but the way I see it, they just don't fit the facts. Out here the Federation space fleet is supposed to be the big stick. Only right now it's off playing mumbly peg with the Venerians. The big wheels seem to think there'll be a shooting war in a couple of months. There's only three or four destroyers left in the whole damn asteroid belt. And without the big stick behind me, I'm not hankering to commit suicide by looking for trouble. Mark smiled again ruefully. What I can do, I try to do, he added with sudden earnestness. I figure the most important thing is to protect the asteroid development company so they can buy the nuclear ore the astrodites bring in. Without that ore, the Federation is going to be in a hell of a fix if it actually does come to war. And along with that, there's the matter of guarding the stuff the Navy's got stored here. He waved toward the Navy warehouse that could be seen outside the window. Listening to and fraternizing with the characters you call the biggest crooks in town, the Comptroller went on with a shrug, I have a chance at getting tipped off in advance to anything that might make trouble for our interests. As long as I ignore their rackets, they accept me in their midst, talk freely with me around. And it's a hell of a lot easier to stop something when you know the score beforehand. The young woman's lips parted as if she seemed about to say something. Then they closed in a thin line. Obviously she was not happy with Mark Polder's explanation. She was too young to be willing to compromise her ideals, no matter how potent the logic of necessity. She was about to leave the table when the shrill screams of a distant whistle sliced through the noise of the crowd. Voices broke off in mid-sentence and bodies froze into immobility. As the siren's piercing tones faded, the restaurant's customers looked at one another in silent terror. Then as the shock wore off, and unanswered questions were beginning to fly, a man suddenly ran in through the revolving doors. Raiders! he gasped. The listening gears picked up a signal that's not from any astrodite or destroyer. Signal Corps figures it's a pirate. There was a mad dash for the doors, and seconds later the place was empty except for Mark Polder, still sitting calmly at the table drinking his beer, and Lee Trainer, who sat watching him. "'What are you going to do?' she finally asked. "'I don't know. What can I do?' Mark said. "'Good heavens!' the girl exploded. "'Are you just going to sit there guzzling beer while pirates take over the town?' She stared at him incredulously. "'What do you suggest I do?' the comptroller asked. We haven't anything to fight with. There's no way we can get help. And as far as I can see, there's nothing we can do. Not yet, anyway. He calmly lifted his glass. You mean we're just going to sit here? The girl gaped. Sure. The others left to hide their money and valuables. I've got nothing to hide. What about that stuff the Navy has cashed in their warehouse? Lee asked. That new rocket fuel their destroyers use when they need a little extra push. Isn't that worth hiding? The hyperdegenerate thorium, you mean? I'd like to hide that somewhere, Mark conceded. But where do you hide ten tons of stuff in five minutes? Besides, it wouldn't do the raiders any good. Too hot. It'll burn out their jets. They'd go up like an A-bomb two minutes after they threw it on. They know that. Only thing they could do with it is sell it to Venus. Not that that would be bad. Shortage of HDTs may be the chief reason why there's been no war started yet. But for now, there's nothing you and I can do. Calmly, he lit a cigarette. Of course, he went on smiling, we could bum a ride out with some of the company men. 
No doubt they're all hightailing it away from here in their space buggies. I'm surprised, Lee said with a trace of sarcasm, that you're not doing just that, leaving me and the other women to the beasts. Mark eyed her unblinkingly. You know as well as I do that most of the females on this asteroid take pirates in their stride. They might even welcome a change of partners. As for you, he paused, you stick close to me and keep your pretty mouth shut. I think we'll manage somehow. In silence, they walked back to the comptroller's office. Mark, Lee said as they entered, what about the new radar? Maybe we could get a message out with it, in code or something. What? Mark turned, astonished. You want to play our only hole card on an off chance like that? There aren't more than four or five people here who even know it's been set up on the other side of the asteroid. There's hardly a chance the raiders will find out about it. And you want to blast the news at them? He looked disgusted. The girl said stubbornly, You can't just give up without a fight. And that's our only weapon. Look, Mark said grimly, that's only a second-hand destroyer radar, so it wouldn't carry far. No, I'm not going to use it on any such harebrained scheme as that. And if you breathe a word about it, I'll take you apart. He added with a faint smile. Not that that wouldn't be a pleasure. Looking at him, she knew he meant the tender joke, and the knowledge helped her. I think, Mark went on after a moment, I'd better warn the boys over on the radar project, or they might accidentally start it up while the raiders are here. He closed the door as he went into the inner office to make the call. A moment later he emerged and studied the still angry girl through her half-closed eyes. She blushed under his scrutiny and said coldly, What's the matter? Afraid I'm not attractive enough for our visitors? He grinned. You could do with the might of padding here and there. But I was thinking the other way, as a matter of fact. It's a pity you don't have a small mustache. You don't have to insult me, Lee cried bitterly. I'm glad I'm thin. I'm not insulting you, Mark said mildly. I even wish you were a bit skinnier. It's the plump girls our guests are going to be looking at first. Remember now, you stick right with me and keep your mouth shut. Do you hear? I hear, she said shortly but he could see the fear she was trying to hide, and he knew she was honestly frightened for the first time in her adult life. She said, What will they uh, be like? If it's John Manter, and I suspect it is, they'll be rough, Mark informed her. He's a tough ex-pilot who got bounced off space patrol and turned outlaw. He seems to hold a grudge against the whole human race. If it's one of the others, it may be a lot worse. I don't see why outlaws are allowed to exist at all, she said. Mark sighed and shook his head. A lot of people have felt that way over a lot of pirates, over a lot of eras, but somehow they keep turning up. A few minutes later, the space-scarred pirate ship had made a rocky landing in the middle of the small spaceport, and John Manter, pirate chief, drove up to the comptroller's office in a cloud of dust. He was tall and dirty and thin and tough. Which one of you is the comptroller? he demanded as he faced Mark Polder and Lee Trainer. I am, Mark said, not rising from behind the desk. Then you're the guy responsible for any trouble here, Manter said. So I'm going to tell you how to avoid trouble. His brutally scarred face twisted into a grin. There's a lot of loot around here. I'm not going to ask you where it is. My boys could take care of that matter. But there's also the Navy warehouse. Maybe we won't know what some of the stuff in there is for, so you're going to tell us. Manter leaned across the desk, his eyes as hard and cold as chips of duratite. And if you won't, there's going to be trouble, and you'll be it, you and your friend here. Mark sat impassively, meeting the hard-eyed gaze. The warehouse is government property, he said. So far, there's only piracy against you. But if you raid that building, you're going to be the personal problem of the Navy. If I were you, I'd leave it alone. You let me worry about that, said Manter. Besides, Mark went on, I don't see what good the stuff in that warehouse can be to you. There's little of cash value in there, and I doubt if you can use any of the parts on your ship. 
That could be, Manta replied. But on the other hand, maybe we can find a market for certain items. He smiled coldly. Watching, Lee knew he referred to Venus. She sat perfectly still, praying for him not to notice her. Manter spread his hands on the desk, a look of hatred and ferocity on his face. What I want to know is, are you or are you not going to cooperate? And I want to know fast. Don't get me wrong, Mark said softly. I'm not telling you what to do or what not to do. But that warehouse is the thing I'm here to protect. And if I agree to help you, the Navy would be after me, too. So I've got to say, to hell with you. John Mantor rocked back on his heels, hooking his thumbs in his belt. A slow smile spread over his face. Okay, he said. I think I get what you mean. So I guess we've got to work you over, and we'll do it where there aren't any outside witnesses. Mark grinned back at him. Lee was puzzled. It took her a moment to realize that the grins sealed the contract between the two men. Mark would cooperate if he were beaten up enough first to satisfy a later investigation, but not too severely for his own comfort. Lee found it difficult to hide her contempt. She stared at her hands, clenched in her lap, and waited for Manter to leave. The looting and destruction were well underway an hour later, when a couple of Manter's men joined their chief, who stood with a somewhat bruised Mark Polder and an unharmed but furious Lee Trainer. Between them they carried a small, obviously heavy box. You know what this stuff is, boss? One of the men asked. They got a hundred or a hundred and fifty boxes like this in there. He nodded at the Navy warehouse. They set the box down and Manter flung back its lid. It was filled with small gray pellets. Manter picked up a handful and stood fingering them. Looks like rocket fuel, he said. Only I've never seen any this color. And it's too heavy, also. He turned to the comptroller. You, tell me what it is. Mark shrugged. I don't know. It's a Navy secret. Manter's eyes glinted. Without warning, his fist flew out, sent the comptroller sprawling in the dust where he lay stunned. Lee's hands flew to her mouth, barely in time to suppress a cry. After a few moments, Mark rolled over slowly and pushed himself painfully to a sitting position. He looked up at Manter, who stood watching him coldly, his fist flexing. The comptroller licked his lips and looked around at the several men who stood watching, their faces impassive. Okay, he said in a non-too-steady voice. I'll tell you. You'll find out anyway from the files. Cut the alibis and give, Manter growled. Keep your shirt on, Mark's voice indicated he was regaining control of himself. It's HDT, hyperdegenerate thorium, the stuff the destroyers use to get extra push. Manter roared his glee. Pack it aboard, boys, all of it, and put it where it will be handy, just in case. This was it, Lee thought as she stood by, watching the final bitter pill. Manter had as much as told him he was working for Venus. And the HDT was all Venus needed to be ready for war. A war that might well blast civilization from the solar system. Strange that so much should depend upon one man. Tragic that the one man was a weakling. With an effort, Lee forced herself to be fair. It might have done no good to lie, she conceded. But anyone with even a normal amount of simple courage would have tried. It was about two hours later when the siren went off again like a banshee wailing to a low-hanging moon. Men came running from all directions, shouting questions at the tops of their voices. A midget auto came skidding down the pirate ship's ramp, its driver standing on the accelerator. The car knifed through the swirling crowd, barely missing several people, and skidded to a dusty stop directly in front of Manter. Radar signal, the driver yelled. The search receiver picked up a signal that sounds like a destroyer's radar. It suddenly came in strong. Probably sneaked up on us from behind that damn moon. It's coming in fast and breaking hard. There was a mad scramble as the looters raced for their ship. Heavy-handed horseplay was forgotten. They knew they were helpless against a Navy destroyer. Their only hope lay in a fast getaway. 
Seconds could easily spell the difference between safety and defeat. In less than ten minutes, the ship's locks were sealed and they fired off. As the flames roared out and the huge ship lifted swiftly, it was obvious that they were throwing on all the fuel their jets could take. Mark Polar had faded back into the crowd at the first sound of the siren. As he stood watching the blast off, Lee joined him, hands in her pockets, looking more than ever like a boy. Maybe my idea of asking for help wasn't so far-fetched, she said quietly. Maybe the patrol might have been here in time. Maybe you wouldn't have had to tell them about the HDT. Maybe, Mark answered, without turning his eyes from the dwindling point of reddish light high in the dark sky. And just by way of keeping the record straight, the girl went on in a voice that began to rasp, You know as well as I do that the files don't list any HDT. It's under a code name. Maybe, Mark replied in a noncommittal tone. The point of light in the sky suddenly turned blue. Lee was staring at it, too, now. And she knew also what the change of color meant. Manter had started to use the new fuel. Suddenly there was a blinding flash. Lee cried out and staggered back, covering her eyes. Mark, who had closed his eyes when the color change came, took hold of the girl's arm. I told you what would happen if they used the stuff, he said gently. It's too hot for their jet chambers. It melts the walls. A lot of gas piles up in the tubes. The pressure pushes the fire back. And when it gets shoved back into the recoil chamber and you lose the protective layers of cold gas there, well, then you've got to look for your ship with an ionization gauge. I told you all that long ago. The trouble is you're too idealistic, Lee. That's not the same as having ideals. I admire ideals. I might even confess to a few of my own. But you don't stop to figure out just what your ideals are, exactly what you're fighting for. You come to a crisis like this one and you forget about the big goal. All you see is this one problem. And by giving them yes or no answers, good or bad, brave or cowardly, to the problem of the moment, you may miss a simple solution to the big one. You've got to keep a cool head and never forget for even a moment exactly what it is you want to accomplish. His voice was gentle and it held no rebuke. All right, said Lee unhappily. You win. You needn't bother to rub in the salt. I was going to chase you through all the inquiry courts for this. Instead, you got a lucky break, so I can't do a thing. You ought to be tarred and feathered through every city of the Federation, but because a destroyer happened to stumble in here at the right time, you'll end up a hero. Her voice caught in a sob. Oh, the destroyer, Mark replied. Ah, yes, that was lucky, wasn't it? The only hitch is, there wasn't any destroyer. Probably not one within a million miles. He laughed as Lee turned surprised widened eyes toward him. What they thought was a destroyer was the radar system on the side of the rock, bouncing a signal off the moon. I gave the radar boys the word just before Manter dropped in on us. The crew did a damn good job of juggling the power and frequency and all. He grinned. Remind me to buy them a beer sometime. He laughed then at the girl's expression as it changed from bitter disillusion to something akin to awe, close to hero worship. And this, by the way, Polder said, is as good a time as any to tell you that I'd like to see you look like a woman for a change. How about changing into a dress before we go into town? You know, I've never seen you out of that uniform. She hesitated, unsure of herself now. That will take a little time, she said doubtfully. He put hands on her slim shoulders, gave her a gentle shove toward her quarters. We've got time he told her. Lots of it. But I've been waiting quite a while. End of This One Problem by M. C. Pease Recording by Frank Malanga, Pembroke Pines, Florida That Woodman by Dave Dreyfus
This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Frank Malanga. Tree Spare That Woodman by Dave Dreyfus. Stiff with shock, Naomi Hexer stood just inside the door to Cappy's one room cabin where she happened to be when her husband discovered the old man's body. Her nearest neighbor, old Cappy, dead. After all his wire pulling to get into the first group, and his slaving to make a farm on this alien planet, dead in bed. Naomi's mind circled frantically, contrasting her happy anticipations with this shocking actuality. She'd come to call on a friend, she reminded herself. A beloved friend, round, white hair, rosy-cheeked, lonely because he recently became a widower. To her little boy, Cappy was a combination grandpa and Santa Claus. To herself, a sort of newly met old beau. Her mouth had been set for a sip of his home brew. Her eyes had pictured the delight he'd take in and give to her little boy. She walked over with son and husband, expecting nothing more shocking than an ostentatiously stolen kiss. She'd found a corpse. And to have let Cappy die alone, in this strange world? She and Ted could at least have been with him, if they'd known. But they'd been laughing and singing in their own cabin only a mile away, celebrating Richard's fifth birthday. She'd been annoyed when Cappy failed to show up with the present he promised Richard. Annoyed, while the old man pulled a blanket over his head, turned his round face to the wall, and died. Watching compassionately, Naomi was suddenly struck by the matter-of-fact way Ted had examined the body. Ted wasn't surprised. Why did you tell Richard to stay outside just now? she demanded. How do you know what we'd find here? And why didn't you tell me so I could keep Richard at home? She saw Ted start scalded by the splash of her self-directed anger, saw him try to convert his wince into a shrug. You insisted on coming, he reminded her gently. I couldn't have kept you home without, without saying too much, worrying you, with the earthship still a year away. Besides, I didn't know for sure till we saw the tree things around the cabin. The tree things, the trees that were not, Gnarled blue trunks, half hidden by yellow leaf needles stretching twenty feet into the sky. Something like the hoary mountain hemlocks she and Ted had been forever photographing on their Sierra honeymoon, seven lifelong years ago. Three of those tree things had swayed over Cappy Spring for a far longer time than man had occupied this dreadful planet, until just now. The three of them had topped the rise that hid Cappy's farm from their own. Richard was running ahead like a happily inquisitive puppy. Suddenly he'd stopped, pointing with a finger she distinctly recalled as needing thorough soapy scrubbing. Look, Mommy, he said. Cappy's trees have moved. They're around the cabin now. He'd been interested, not surprised. In the past year, Mazda had become Richard's home. Only Earth could surprise him. But Ted, come to think of it, had seemed withdrawn his face a careful blank. And she? Very pretty, she'd said, and stuffed the tag end of fear back into the jammed, untidy mental pigeonhole she used for all unpleasant thoughts. Don't run too far ahead, dear. But now she had to know what Ted knew. Tell me, she said. These tree things. There have been other deaths. How many? Sixteen. But I didn't want to tell you. Orders were to leave women and children home when we had that last meeting, remember? What do they say at the meeting? Out with it, Ted. That, that the tree things think. But that's ridiculous. Well, unfortunately, no. Look, I'm not trying to tell you that terrestrial trees think too, nor even that they have a nervous system. They don't. But, well, on Earth, if you've ever touched a lighted match to the leaf of a sensitive plant like a mimosa, say, and I have, you've been struck by the speed with which other leaves close up and droop. 
I mean, sure, we know that the leaves droop because certain cells exude water and nearby leaves feel the heat of the match, but the others don't. Yet they droop, too. Nobody knows how it works. But that's just defensive. Sure, but that's just on Earth. All right, dear, I won't argue any more, but I still don't understand. Go on about the meeting. Well, they said these tree things both create and respond to the patterned electrical impulses of the mind. It's something like the way a doctor creates fantasies by applying a mild electric current to the right places on a patient's brain. In the year we've been here, the trees, or some of them, have learned to read from and transmit to our minds. The range, they say, is around 50 feet. But you have to be receptive. Receptive? Fearful. That's the condition. So I didn't want to tell you because you must not let yourself become afraid, Naomi. We're clearing trees from the land in certain areas, and it's their planet after all. Fear is their weapon, and fear can kill. You still... All, all you men sh should have let us women know. What do you think we are? Besides, I don't really believe you. How can fear kill? Haven't you ever heard of a savage who gets in bed with his witch doctor and is killed by magic? The savage is convinced, having seen or heard of other cases, that he can be killed. The witch doctor sees to it he's told he will be killed. And sometimes the savage actually dies. From poison, I've always thought. The poison of fear. The physical changes that accompany fear, magnified beyond belief by belief itself. But how in the world could all this have affected Cappy? He wasn't a savage, and he was elderly, Ted. A bad heart, maybe? A stroke? Anything. He passed his pre-flight physical only a year ago. And, well, he lived all alone. He was careful not to let you see it. But I know he worried about these three trees on his place. And I know he got back from the meeting in a worried state of mind. Then, obviously, the trees moved, grouped themselves around his cabin within easy range. But don't be afraid of them, Naomi. So long as you're not, they can't hurt you. They're not bothering us now. No, but where's Richard? Naomi's eyes swept past Ted, encompassing the cabin. No Richard. He'd been left outside. Glass tinkled and crashed as she flung back the cabin door. Richard! Richard! Her child was not in sight. Nor within earshot, it seemed. Richard Heckscher, where are you? Sanity returned with the conventional primness, and it brought her answer. Here I am, Mommy. Look at. He was in a tree. He was fifteen feet off the ground, high in the branches of a tree thing, swaying. For an instant dread flowed through Naomi, as if her bloodstream and something was cutting off her breath. Then, as the hands over mouth and throat withdrew, she saw they were Ted's. She let him drag her into the cabin and closed the broken door. Better not scare Richard, he said quietly, shoving her gently into a chair. He might fall. Dumbly, she caught her breath, waiting for the bawling out she'd earned. But Ted said, Richard keeps us safe. So long as we fear for him and not ourselves. That was easy to do. Outside, she heard a piping call. Look at me now, Mommy. Showing off, she gasped. In a flashing vision, Richard was half boy, half vulture, flapping to the ground with a broken wing. Here, said Ted, picking up a notebook that had been on the table. Here's Cappy's present, a homemade picture book, bait. Let me use it, she said. Richard may have seen I was scared just now. Outside again, under the tree, she called. Here's Cappy's present, Richard. He's gone away and left it for you. Would he notice how her voice had gone up half an octave, become flat and shrill? I'm coming down, Richard said. Let me down, tree. He seemed to be struggling. The branches were cage-like. He was caught. Naomi's struggle was with her voice. How did you ever get up there, she called. The tree let me up, Mommy, Richard explained solemnly. But he won't let me down, he whimpered a little. He must not become frightened. You tell that tree you've got to come right down this instant, she ordered. She leaned against the cabin for support. Ted came out and slipped his arm around her. Break off a few leaves, Richard, he suggested. That'll show your tree who's boss. 
Standing close against her husband, Naomi tried to stop shaking, but she lacked firm support, for Ted shook too. His advice to Richard was sound, though. What had been a trap became, through grudging movement of the branches, a ladder. Richard climbed down, scolding at the tree like an angry squirrel. Naomi thought she succeeded in shutting her mind. But when her little boy slid down the final bit of trunk and came for his present, Naomi broke. Like a startled animal, she thrust the book into his hands, picked them up and ran. Her mind was a jelly, red and quaking. She stopped momentarily after running fifty yards. Burn the trees, she screamed over her shoulder. Burn the cabin! Burn it all! She ran on, Ted's answering shouts beyond her comprehension. Fatigue halted her. At the top of the rise between Cappy's form and their own, pain and dizziness began flowing over her in waves. She set Richard down on the mauve soil and collapsed beside him. When she sat up, Richard squatted just out of reach, watching curiously. She made an effort at casualness. Let's see what Daddy's doing back there. He's doing just what you said to, Mommy, Richard answered indignantly. Her men were standing together, Naomi realized. She laughed. After a moment, Richard joined her. Then he looked for his book, found it a few paces away, and brought it to her. Read it to me, Mommy. At home, she said. Activity at Cappy's interested her now. Wisps of smoke were licking around the trees. A tongue of flame lapped at one while she watched. Branches writhed. The trees were too slow-moving to escape. But where was Ted? What had she exposed him to with her historical orders? She held her breath till he moved within sight, standing quietly by a pile of salvaged tools. Behind him the cabin began to smoke. Ted wasn't afraid then. He understood what he faced. And Richard wasn't afraid either, because he didn't understand. But she? Surreptitiously, Naomi pinched her hip till it felt black and blue. That was for being such a fool. She must not be afraid. Daddy seems to be staying there, she said. Let's wait for him at home, Richard. Are you going to make Daddy burn our tree? She jumped as if stung. Then, consciously womanlike, she sought relief in talk. What do you think we should do, dear? Oh, I like the tree, Mommy. It's cool under there, and the tree plays with me. How, Richard? If I'm pilot, he's navigator. Or ship, maybe. But he's so dumb, Mommy. I always have to tell him everything. Doesn't know what a fairy is, or Goldilocks, or anything. He clutched his book affectionately, rubbing his face on it. Hurry up, Mommy. It'll be bedtime before you ever read to me. She touched his head briefly. You can look at the book while I fix your supper. But to explain Cappy's pictures, crudely crayoned cartoons, really, she had to fill in the story they illustrated. She told it while Richard ate, how the intrepid spaceman gallantly used his ray gun against the villainous Martians to aid the green-haired princess. Richard spooned up the thrills with his mush, gazing fascinated at Cappy's colorful and fantastic pictures propped before him on the table. Had Ted been home, the scene might almost have been blissful. It might have been, if their own tree hadn't reminded her of Cappy's. Still, she almost managed to stuff her fear back into that mental pigeonhole before their own tree. It was unbelievable, but she'd been glancing out the window every few minutes, so she saw it start. Their own tree began to walk. Down the hill it came, right there, framed in the window behind Richard's head, moving slowly but inexorably on a root system that writhed along the surface, like some ancient sculpture of serpents supporting the tree of life, except that it brought death. Are you sick, Mommy? No, not sick. Just something the matter with her throat preventing a quick answer, leaving no way to keep Richard from turning to look out the window. I think our tree is coming to play with me, Mommy. No, no, not Richard. Remember how you used to say that about Cappy, when he was really coming to see your Daddy? But Daddy isn't home. He'll get here, dear. Now eat your supper. A lot to ask of an excited little boy. And the tree was his friend, it seemed. Cappy's tree had even followed the child's orders. Richard might intercede. No. Expose him to such danger? How could she think of it? Had enough to eat, dear? Wash your hands and face at the pump and you can stay out and play till Daddy gets home. 
I, I, I want, I may have to see your friend, the tree, by myself. But you haven't finished my story. I will when Daddy gets home. And if I'm not here, you tell Daddy to do it. Where are you going, Mommy? I might see Cappy, dear. Now go and wash, please. Sure, Mommy, don't cry. Accept his kiss, even if it is from a mouth rimmed with supper. And don't rub it off till he's gone out, you damn fool. You frightened fool. You shaking, sweating, terror-stricken fool. Who's he going to kiss when you're not here? The tree has stopped. Our little tree is having its supper. How nice. Sucking sustenance direct from soil with aid of sun and air in true plant fashion, but exhausting our mineral resources. How wise of Ted to make you go to those lectures. You wouldn't want to die in ignorance, would you? The lecture. Come on, let's go back to the lecture. Let's free our soil from every tree, or we'll not hold the joint in fee. No, not joint, the vulgarism, teacher would say. Methinks the times are out of joint. Aroint thee, tree. Now a pinch. Pinch yourself hard in the same old place so it'll hurt real bad. Then straighten your face and go stick your head out the window. Your son is talking. Your son. Your son. Can your son be eclipsed by a tree? A matter of special spatial relationships, and the space is shrinking, friend. The tree is only a few hundred feet from the house. It has finished its little supper and is now running around. Like Richard. With Richard. Congenial, what? Smile, stupid. Your son speaks. Answer him. What, dear? I see Daddy. He just came over the hill. He's running. Can I go meet him, Mommy? No, dear, it's too far. Too far. Far too far. Did you say something to me, Richard? No, I was talking to the tree. I'm the spaceman and he's the Martian. But he doesn't want to be the Martian. Richard plays. Let us play. Let us play. You're close enough to get into the game, surely. A hundred and fifty feet, maybe. Effective range, fifty feet. Rate of motion. Projected time interval. Depends on which system you observe it from. Richard has a system. He doesn't want to play, Mommy. He wants to see you. You tell that tree your Mommy never sees strangers when Daddy isn't home. I'll make him wait. Stoutly, your pot belly little protector prevents his protective mother from going to pot. If he won't play, I'll use my ray gun on him. Obviously, the tree won't play. Watch your son lift empty hands, arm himself with a weapon yet to be invented, and open fire on the advancing foe. Ah, ah, ah. So that's how a ray gun sounds. You're dead, tree. You're dead. Now you can't play with me any more. You're dead. Seeing it happen then, watching the tree accept the little boy's fantasy as fact, Naomi wondered why she'd never thought of that herself. So the tree was a treacherous medicine man, was it? A true believing witch doctor? And who could be more susceptible to the poisoning of fear than a witch doctor who has made fear work and believes it's being used against him? It was all over. She and the tree bit the dust together. But the tree was dead, and Naomi merely fainting. And Ted would soon be home. End of Tree, Spare That Woodman by Dave Dreyfus. Recording by Frank Malanga, Pembroke Pines, Florida.